Good morning. Want to call into session the October 25th, 2022 meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors. And we want to thank all who've joined us uh, this morning. I know we have a number of, of uh, speakers, both those who have signed up off agenda and also to address some of the items on the agenda. But before we get into that, we we're going to make some announcements and uh, call the roll, establish a quorum, do the Pledge of Allegiance, and Flo will read some announcements into the record, and then we'll go into our uh, morning hearing. So with that, Flo, I'll turn to you. Hey, good morning. Supervisor Cerna? Here. Kennedy? Here. Desmond? Here. Frost? Here. Natoli? Here. And you have a quorum. This meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T U-verse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and is webcast at metro14live.satcounty.gov. Today's meeting will be repeated Friday, October 28th at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. The Board of Supervisors fosters public engagement during the meeting and encourages public participation, civility, and use of courteous language. The Board does not condone the use of profanity, vulgar language, gestures, or other inappropriate behavior, including personal attacks or threats directed towards any meeting participant. In compliance with the directives of the County, State, and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the meeting will be live streamed and open to public attendance pursuant to health and safety guidelines. The practice of social distancing and wearing of face coverings, mask or shield, is recommended for the health and safety of all persons participating in person during the meeting, although it is not required. Seating is limited and available on a first-come, first-served basis. Members of the public will be given three minutes to make a comment and are limited to making one public comment per agenda item or off-agenda matter. Please be mindful of the public comment procedures to avoid being interrupted or disconnected while making your comment. To make a comment in person, please fill out a speaker request form and hand it to clerk staff. The chairperson will open public comments for each agenda item or call for off-agenda matters. When the chairperson calls your name, please come to the podium and make your comment. To make a comment by phone, dial 916-875-2500 and follow the prompts to be placed in queue for a specific agenda item or off-agenda matter. Please refer to the agenda or watch the meeting to follow along to determine when is the best time to call to be placed in queue to make your public comment. Clerk staff will transfer calls into the meeting accordingly. Each agenda item queue will remain open until the public comment period is closed for that specific item. And you may be on hold for up to an extended period of time and your patience is appreciated. You may also send written comments by email to boardclerk at sacccounty.gov. Your comment will be routed to the board and filed in the record. If you need an accommodation pursuant to the Americans with Disabilities Act or for medical or other reasons, please see clerk staff for assistance or contact the clerk's office at 916-874 5451 or by email at boardclerk at sacccounty.gov. Thank you in advance for your courtesy and understanding of the meeting procedures. Thank you, Flo. Uh, with that, uh, Supervisor Kennedy, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so we do have a number of off-agenda speakers. Uh, Flo, you want to kind of help walk through this? I know we had, had a request to, to actually do an off-agenda presentation. I think we do have some folks in chambers that have signed up, so maybe we'll take, if it's acceptable, we'll take those first, and then we'll go to the uh, presentation that was yes. made a request that's on the agenda. Okay. That sounds good. All right. Okay, so with that, I'm going to take these in the order they were handed to me, and these are off-agenda. Um, request to speak. And so first I have uh, Ryan Harris, followed by Lee uh, Carora, uh, and then Sharon Duchesse. Good morning, Ryan. Hello, good morning. I had taken some time off for my birthday, so I'm back. Oh, happy birthday. Hey, thank you. And actually, in since you said happy birthday, you know I've been here in the past, right? Yeah. I've been here because Ann Edwards uh, disciplined me for foolish things such as saying happy birthday. Um, she said that was not work related to do so and she disciplined me for saying happy birthday. And here you're doing it during county time and I was a Sacramento County employee. Um, when I brought it up to her and my coworkers that I apologize for if I did get them in trouble, uh, they said that's ridiculous because Ann Edwards 
sent them a happy birthday email and they brought it to me and showed me. And Edwards uh, then disciplined me again when I brought that up to her, asking why, and was told don't worry about it. And Anne Edwards was now promoted to this position over here, you'll see her name. Um, so it must be really serious not to tell people happy birthday during county time, because I was disciplined two times for it as a county employee. Yet you guys are up here as county employees telling me happy birthday, which I'm grateful for, don't get me wrong, because the joy that that word or two words bring to people can change their day at times. But it now hurts my day because I'm torn between enjoying that comment and being told that I shouldn't have never said that comment. And you guys are doing that to me. Nonetheless, we don't have, we have a lot of people in here. So I don't know if I can turn all the way around, but I'm gonna step over here to talk to you guys a bit. I don't have much time. My name is Ryan. I'm so glad that you guys are here. I'm glad you guys are in this community. Uh, I come here almost every meeting that they have. I did miss a couple because of my birthday, but I do come here almost every meeting that they had. I encourage you guys to continue to come because this is where a lot of decisions are made that impact our community, impact our kids, impact our future generations, such as military weapons. I don't know if you guys heard about those being approved, but the military weapons were approved to use. Now, I was here in the meeting when they first requested it, and he requested it and said, I don't know how to use them. I don't know why we use them. I don't understand how to use them. So I don't understand how you could request for a weapon and not know how to use it. Now, they did approve the weapon. The board said they don't know about them either. This is a little off agenda. I didn't plan on this, but since there are a lot of people in here, there rarely is nobody in here, which is why these things are able to get approved. But again, I'm just thinking, because they did approve it, it's been about six months. The board said that they don't know about the military weapons. Sheriff's Department said they don't know. So my question is, in six months, how did you both educate yourself enough about weapons? I could see you educating yourself to know, but then how did they also educate themselves to know and to use in that same amount of time? That just doesn't add up to me. That doesn't make sense to me at all. And uh, maybe they'll have some answers for you. I'm out of time. They're pretty strict on that. Have a good one, you guys. Thank you. Thank <laughs> okay, uh, next, uh, Lee. Is it Licardio? L A L E C A R R O R E B? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'd like to say, um, I don't know who lifted the, the math thing or the social distancing, but um, I think it should be in effect until at least 2024. And uh, out on the street is very hard for people. Um, you can see a fight go on, nobody reports it. Um, it's very bad out there, very bad. And uh, me, myself, and I, I kind of went out there just to see what's out there. It's bad. Um, black youth today, no schooling. Uh, this thing with the COVID had relaxed a lot of schooling from kindergarten on up. Um, a lot of youth, black, white, Hispanic, Chinese, all of them. They don't know how to read, write, or arithmetic. Um, it's bad. And what they don't have it's going to cost us at the cashier. It's going to cost us as a store person or owner of the store. It's going to cost us in the long run. It's also going to cost us also to what they don't have, they're going to steal. They're going to five finger discount it either from the store or somebody outside that store or from a car, parking lot, or not where, cars or guns. Now, these gentlemen that own stores, people that of walking on the streets, even people that are driving. They'll see the crime happen, but they won't report it. And when they do, it's usually too late. You just corner the office. I don't have anything I can say. It's our responsibility here, now, 
and forever. <laughs> and the future. Well, Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for being here. Thanks for coming this morning. It is our job. Okay. All right, next, Sharon, and Sharon will be followed by uh, Brenda Garner. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having us here today. I really appreciate it. My name is Sharon Duchesse. I'm an eboard member for SEIU 2015, and I'm also a home care provider since 2009. Uh, my story is pretty much similar to a lot of us. Uh, I previously, before I was a home care worker, I was a loan processor, and I was making almost $6,000 a month. Uh, at that time, I had to make the decision on whether or not I wanted to take care of my significant other or leave him and keep on with my career. I decided uh, I didn't want to do that. I did not want him to be on his own and not have anybody to help take care of him. Uh, since then, I have been taking care of him. Uh, we've been through a long process. He just had a major back surgery, so he's relearning how to walk, uh, which he would not have been able to do if I wasn't here or there wasn't someone else that was here to take care of him. Uh, I do appreciate the state, the county, and the federal government paying us to help take care of these individuals so we can keep them out of facilities and keep costs down, which is what we do. Uh, but also as a home care worker, uh, we provide uh, income to our counties. We provide a lot of income to our counties uh, because there's almost uh, 5,000, I'm sorry, 6,000? 27,000, sorry, I'm new to the count, to Sacramento <laughs> County. 27,000 members in uh, uh, home care workers in Sacramento County. Uh, we are going to be going into bargaining this December. We're asking for your support in getting uh, the increases that we need uh, and that we really need right now, especially with the way uh, inflation's affecting us. I wanted to put a couple costs out there for cost of living. Right now, we all know gas, five to six dollars a gallon. Uh, two things that are in season right now that I would love to buy that I can't afford to buy right now. Apples, two dollars each. Mandarins, six dollars for a small bag. These are things I, I can get periodically. I cannot afford to get it all the time. Toilet paper, almost twenty dollars. Uh, iceberg lettuce, just one head of lettuce, is $2.69. And these are all things I just pulled up this morning to make sure that my costs were the same. Bread, $5 a loaf. Uh, milk, $5 a gallon. Uh, with these costs increased and in what we're paid, it's really difficult to buy fresh fruits and vegetables, especially uh, for those of us that uh, live with our provider, with our recipients, because we have to be mindful of their diet. Um, my client uh, has very specific dietary needs and it's very difficult to buy fresh fruits and vegetables. I'm having to really look at alternatives, flash frozen foods, frozen foods or canned foods, which are not good for them. And I do speak to nutritionists often, at least twice a year, on alternatives that we can do. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, <laughs> next, Brenda Garner, followed by Andrea Noble, followed by Jesus uh, uh, Figueroa uh, Cocho. Cocho. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Brenda Garner, uh, VP for Region 4. I'm an executive uh, board member and also a home care provider. I come here this morning to talk about the poverty that home care providers are. Can I please pull this down? Cause yes, you can. Yes, you can. I come here this morning to... Thank you. I come here this morning to talk about the poverty for home care providers. Uh, it's time now for to take a look at the, um, the wage increase for home care providers. Uh, as, as my um, co-member said, everything is getting totally expensive and just living off of $16 is not gonna do it. Right now, I am forced to take public transportation due to the fact that my vehicle is broken down. But nevertheless, um, $20 an hour will just about lift us out of poverty. And so I come here to say, protect us, pay us, and respect us.
as home care providers. And I just want to leave a little note with each and every one of you all aboard the supervisors. As you go into the supermarket, think about us for as our vegetables, for as our personal hygiene, for as our personal uh, meats, produce. Think how we feel as home care providers. We are barely sustaining. We need $20 and a livable wage. And um, I want to say that I am a home care provider, and I'm proud to represent over 30,000 home care providers. Let me get the number straight. Over 40,000 home care providers here in Sacramento and all across California. And my voice is for them to say, respect us, protect us, and pay us. And I want to say happy holidays to each and every one of you all. We will be back. We, we will be back, and bargaining is coming up, and we want a fair contract, and we deserve it. And each and one of you all know that each time you go to the pump, think about us as home care providers. Thank you very much, and happy holiday. Thank you, Brenda. Okay, next, uh, Andrea, followed by Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. I'm Andrea Noble. I'm a, I'm an IHSS provider. I've been taking care of an elderly woman for, she's 83. I've been taking care of her for the last 14 years. Um, she has diabetes, depression, overweight, and high blood pressure. In March of this year, she fell and broke a part of a bone in her foot. She had to go to the hospital because I could not lift her. She had to be there for a week, and then after that, three weeks at the nursing home. Well, finally, she got her cast on, and then after they put her cast on, they said, oh, well, Saturday she's going to be um, at your house. I said, why? The doctor said that she was supposed to be staying there for another three weeks until the cast was off. Well, her insurance ran out, and so now we're, we're dealing with it. She's better. She's walking. We had to have people come and help her because I was trying my best. And then the next thing you know, she's getting older. Her strength's going She's uh, losing her eyesight in the last year. She's legally blind. It's harder for her because she was able to do things, get around on her scooter, dress herself, do other things. Now I'm doing all that. And uh, this is taking, and then the last couple of years of COVID and being stuck in the house has taken a toll on all of us. And we, not knowing what was going on, what was happening. Now here comes inflation. Everything's going up. Your rent, your food, definitely gas. You, you, <clears throat> You go to the store to buy something that you normally would do, and now you have to pay more. You pay a dollar, two dollars more, sometimes three. Everything's going up. This is ridiculous. And how are we supposed to take care of these elderly people and children and not survive ourselves? Plus, how is fast food workers making more money than we are when we're taking care of elderly and people? This is wrong. This is wrong for just fast food workers to make more than us, and we're keeping the state not paying for all these nursing homes where these people could be going into. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew. So, Jesus, then followed by Rachel Gonzalez, followed by Alicia Lee. So. Good morning. My name is Jesus Figueroa Acacio. Thank you very much for all the body for Sacramento County Board for giving us this opportunity here. So my name is Jesus. I'm a steward for my, I'm a nursing home worker before I used to be an IHS worker also. So I'm a, I'm a steward in my facility and I'm also an, um, I'm an e-board for Region 4. So all our, our all of us, we're here today talking about that we need more ways, okay? California, the living is just outrageous. For everybody's talking about gas, but I'm gonna touch about rent. For our income, okay? I have to work sometime, I have to take care of 30 patients a night. Do you mind taking care of 30 patients a night? That when they are on the lights, they will be falling. You know, in the middle of the pandemic, that was the most, uh, Difficult moment, but we stood there because the love for these people, because we take care of them, because we're there for them. But we want to be compensated for our work because your mind and soul and spirit is all together for the love for the patients. 
If you have, a, if you rent an apartment complex nowadays in California and Sacramento, they expect you to pay the three times the amount of your rent. So if you don't, we don't get a higher wages. So we we are mandated to go to work eight hours or 16 hours or live under the bridge because our income it cannot come with a three times the amount of rent for two bedroom apartment. I'm a mother and I'm an auntie. I'm a wife. My son is in school. I have to work 16 hours every day. And then plus I have to do a second job in order to pay for my rent and pay for my shower rent and school. Because half of the application applied for, they say no. He does not qualify for that because you, pay, you make too much money. When you put the money together, no I'm not. Half of the time I have to be borrow money to pay for my gas to get to work. I work in Auburn, living in California, Sacramento. So please, respect us, pay us. Please think about the wages, because we need to give a quality care for our patients. And thank you very much. Thank you. OK, next, uh, Rachel Gonzalez, and then Alicia Lee, and then Alvinia Scott. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Rachel Gonzalez. I am also on the e-board of SEIU Local 2015. I am an IHSS care provider, and I want to start by saying what I'm grateful for first. What I'm grateful for is the fact that California is one of three states in the union that offers me as a parent the opportunity to care for my disabled daughter. My daughter has Down syndrome. If she were born in the 50s or the 40s or the 30s, I would have been told to institutionalize her and walk away. But today, because of this program, I'm allowed to stay home and care for my daughter. She has my love. And that, to me, is a great blessing. However, the drawbacks of that are that I'm saving you all money, but you're not helping me. And I have lived my life for the last 30 years voting for people like you all who have not had my best interests at heart. I've watched our political system side with corporation over individual. And at this level of politics, I feel that you are all obligated to work for me. You represent me. You represent my community. And in my community, we have tents on the streets. In my community, we have tents on the streets. Everywhere we look, tents on the streets, because people cannot afford to pay rent. They're not not trying. We're not lazy. Productivity has grown 3.5 times that wages have increased. 3.5 times. A butcher in 1978 made $27 an hour. A butcher in 2022 makes $27 an hour. There's a problem there. Corporate profits are at an all-time high right now. They're making money off of us paying $400 to drive my daughter to and from school because she has social anxiety and can't take the school bus. So I have to drive her. $400 used to be a car payment. I paid my car off. I should catch a break. I'm still paying my car off. And we're asking for your help. We're asking for your help. We're asking for you to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Advocate for us. Fight for us. Give us a quality of life. We'll give back to you. It's been proven time and time again. The middle class is what makes this country strong, and we're decimating it. We're going to crack under that pressure, ladies and gentlemen. We've got to do something. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Alicia Lee. I'm here from SEIU. I am also a part of the electoral board on um, SEIU, and I've heard all my fellow sisters and brothers speak this morning. I just want to say that I hope you guys have an open ear and you're actually really listening, because it is very hard out here to survive. Like you say, um, you know, orange is the new black, you know, rent, gas is the new rent. And it's very, very hard. Now, I am a professional that had to quit my job to take care of my client. So I took a very big hit, just like Sharon DeGussie. We took hit, you know. And I still perform all those duties with my client that I am being underpaid for. I'm not asking for a miracle today. 
but I am asking you guys to open your hearts and understand what we are going through. Fast food workers should definitely not be getting paid more money to handle food when we are handling lives. Yes. So today I come here with a very generous heart. Just, you know, want to come before we start the bargaining and ask that you guys understand our struggle. I would really appreciate that, and so would all of my fellow brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Okay, Alvina, then she's followed by Reverend Dr. Pamela Anderson and then uh, LaJoyce La Smith. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning. My name is Alvina Scott, and today I just want to speak on behalf of my sister, who I am a home caregiver for. You need to understand when you're taking care of a client, family members, it's more than eight hours. My life is generated completely around her. She had a, a stroke, many four or five heart attacks. She's young. I'm constantly at the doctors week after week. It's not just periodically. The, I'm constantly running behind her. We need to understand we need more benefits that's been provided to us. It's more than $20 we really need. 20 is just probably going to help a little bit, but you guys understand the cost of living is ridiculous now. The cost of food, everything around us is more than what we can manage. We need to get more. We need to have retirement. We need to have better benefits, you know, regardless if it's a client or a loved one. It's a lot of work. I always say, in my case, it's mental and physical. Where is my need? Who's thinking about me? No one seems to be thinking about us, but you expect us to go out here and help take care of others. We do it out of love. Certainly I do. I do it out of love. But we need to understand what we're asking for is really very minimal. We need much more, and we need to be thought about. That's all I want to say today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good morning. Thank Good you morning. for being here and for listening. We really appreciate yeah. it. My name is Reverend Dr. Pamela Anderson, and I am with the uh, Poor People's Campaign for the state of California and for here in Sacramento. One of the things that happened with the pandemic, when we really think about it, is that it really um, lifted uh, the reality of what's going on because we would call people low-wage workers, and then we just shifted that language to essential workers. These are still low-wage uh, low workers, also in really in poverty. Um, we talk about how unemployment is up, but the question is, is it a living wage? Uh, it is $15 minimum, uh, federal minimum wage, and so $15 can go way farther in Kansas, but it cannot in the state of California. In California in 2019, really the minimum wage needed to be $30.68. That was in 2019, but it is different today, especially with gas being close to $7 a gallon. Um, and here we have $16 an hour, so let's just do the math. It's real simple. Two, that comes out to $2,560. Like seriously, can anybody live on $2,560 a month unless it's, somebody wants to correct me on my math? And so when I looked at uh, here in Sacramento, it is minimally $1,600 for a one bedroom apartment. So that means less than $1,000 to live on. So if that's just one person, imagine if you have children, family, um, as some of our colleagues have said, um, someone that might have disabilities or health issues Issues and just the price of everything going up. So I've met people in this campaign who've needed to make, um, have two to three jobs in order just to survive. That's just morally wrong. We really need to think about this. And so one of the things that we really need to, need to look at is there is no lack. There is enough. There really is enough. The question is, where it really comes down to, is that the only thing is lacking is political will. So we're asking for you to do the right thing. Thank you. Thanks, Reverend Anderson. 
Okay, so next is uh, LaJoyce, I believe, yes. right? Okay. And then I, the last one I have on, under this would be Sherry Rain. So if there are others here on SEIU that want to speak on this particular item, please uh, make sure that Lydia gets a copy of the speaker request form. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, yeah. you guys. Yeah. Um, my name is LaJoyce Smith. Um, I want to start off by saying this is my first year actually doing IHSS. But before that, um, I've been in the nursing field for some years now. Um, I've worked in facilities, home care, rehab. I have the passion in the heart. Um, it's a shame that we would even have to be here asking for a higher pay. Um, it's just common sense knowing that we put up with a lot and we do a lot for these patients. As I always say, as I was asked, why do I like doing this type of work? I love it, I enjoy it. When we come in this world, we come in this world as babies and unfortunately, that's just how we leave. Pretty soon we are all getting up there in age and we're gonna be taking care of you guys. Um, I've seen a lot even working in facilities, having these older people there where they'll have their lights on for a long time, nobody's coming to them. <clears throat> They're getting abused versus in home care you know what I'm saying? Like, we really, we can take our time with them. Um, like I said, I, I love what we do. I feel like we should get paid more, $20. Just like my fellow colleague said, with the rent, the gas, it's ridiculous. I am CNA certified. CPR certified, but I'm working in this industry because it is different from working in facilities. Again, like I said, I love what I do. Pretty soon here, I, I will see you guys, you know what I'm saying, and I will be taking care of you guys. And just, and I want you guys to think of this. You guys probably have grandmas, mothers, aunties, sisters that's in those facilities or even in home care. I know you guys will want people like us where we showing them love, nurturing, cherishing them, all that. That matters. I want you guys to really think about that. Thank you guys. Thank you, Lord Joyce. Okay, so Sherry's the last one I have signed up under the IHHS item, so if there are others that wish to address it, this would be the time to get your speaker form, and otherwise, Sherry, you'll be the closer this morning. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I didn't even know this was on topic today or um, yeah. being talked about. I just happened to be here for something else. So I actually want to speak to the other side of the issue. I have, um, my sister is an adult developmentally disabled person and um, we've used IHSS services in the past and we just couldn't find anybody to do that work. Um, I called many, many people and the bottom line was, it, their answer was it's just not worth it for the amount of work that they had to do, the type of work, um, it just wasn't worth it. They could make more money elsewhere. And so what we ended up doing is we had to put her in a facility. We had to put her in a care home, not a facility. Um, it's a beautiful home, but that wasn't our choice. We had to do that because there wasn't another option. We couldn't find people that were willing to do the work. This work is so important. Caring for our loved ones is what it's all about. It's tender work. We need compassionate, qualified people. We need to honor the work that they do. We need to honor our family members, our loved ones, and we need to pay them what they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Okay, um, thank you to certainly all of our IHHS uh, workers uh, for your comments this morning. And uh, uh, with that, we're gonna continue with our, our um, off agendas as speakers. We do have um, uh, a presentation then off agenda. And uh, again, you're welcome to stay with us. And again, thank you for your, for your work and efforts and for your messages this morning. All right, so we do have uh, on off agenda, we have a presentation that was requested. Uh, so we have, we'll, I'll get 15 minutes on the clock. Uh, is Patrick? Supervisor Kennedy, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. I just, uh, before, I, I take it this is about voting? 
Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I, it was interesting, the, the timing, that there was a story on NPR this morning uh, about the harassment that uh, uh, voting officials are facing throughout the, ca the country. Um, and <clears throat> to the point where they feel uh, completely demoralized doing what's essentially very, very important work for our dem democracy. Um, and by continuing to uh, perpetuate uh, myths and, and, and conspiracies, uh, we just continue to undermine what I think that everybody up here would agree is as good of a, of a, of a voter registrar's office staff. I put them up against anybody in the nation. Um, and, and, and we've seen it. It hasn't always been that way. Um, but but I, I just feel like uh, having a presentation like this at this time uh, is, is unfortunate. And um, I, I do have uh, another matter I need to attend to, and I will return. OK. All right. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. OK. So um, with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, Okay, please. All right, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, Deborah Caparasso uh, was the uh, party who requested the 15 minutes, uh, actually requested more than that, but 15 minutes is our board rule, so I uh, got that up on the, um, on the screen. Okay. I know you sent some, and Deborah, you did some, some information to us in advance, so we do have that, and uh, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself, and then we'll start the clock. So did, are you going to be the only presenter, or are there others that are going to present? There are other presenters, but they're off agenda. They're going to just. Oh, okay. On, on item 16, is that the way they signed up for? Right. Speakers on item 16? Or they're off agenda? They've signed up? They're, right. I, I think I'm the only one that signed up. And yeah, you to, to do the presentation. That's fine. Okay. Because right. again, I would just, I would, you know, you're able to do that if there were others. But okay. So with that, then, uh, Deborah, I'll let you introduce yourself and, uh, and uh, I'll start the clock. Okay. Here. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I appreciate the time. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Um, my name is Deborah Caparasso, and I'm here to talk to you about election integrity. So the topic agendas is going to be the Dominion hardware and software, the DMV process for voter registration, California voting laws, and California's privacy. So I want to preface this by saying this is nonpartisan. This is telling, asking you to understand that Every vote needs to count, whether they're a Republican, doesn't matter. It applies to everyone, all of your constituents. And I think everybody would agree that we want our vote to count. So over the last two years, there have been quite a lot of forensic audits throughout the US. And the Dominion system are as with any other computer system, they are very um, open to hackability. And it has been proven that it, within minutes, the Dominion system can be hacked. Not only that, that, when the machines are not connected to the local networks, they can be hacked wirelessly. And the Secretary of State and the vendors have the passwords to the Dominion system. The Dominion system also allows non-standard paper to be used. So I have actually witnessed on TV somebody taking ballots and just running them through. And then when the, that stack was done, they took the same stack and ran them through again. There's no way to stop that from happening. So USB drives are also, you can easily put a USB drive in and do whatever you want. So the bottom line on the Dominion system is, I understand that the contract is, was up in August. Is that accurate? That's what the agenda said. OK, so you're is talking that, about I, I, item 16. So we can, I think folks, have, we'll pull that off the consent calendar here in a moment, Deborah. So um, if that's what you're referring to. Yes. Yeah. So we can get to that. I'm going to you pose the question. We certainly can respond. But I think we'll go ahead and let you make your presentation. and. Okay. Yes, yeah, okay. okay. So the bottom line is we want to eliminate the fraud that is made available via the computer, which is the Dominion system computer and software, the hardware and software. So the voting process includes multiple vulnerabilities, and it doesn't just stop at the Dominion systems, the computer hackable. 
it, the DMV process for voter registration. So we, as a result of a FOIA letter to the DMV, we asked if they validate whether a person coming to the DMV and getting a driver's license or a, vote, uh, a regular ID, California ID, and they basically said there is no requirement for the department to collect birthplace information or transmit such data to the California Secretary of State, and it does not do so. So it's very clear in DMV doesn't validate whether a person is registering to vote is a US citizen. So when you go to the US, I'm sorry, when you go to the Secretary of State's website, it says eligible California residents will be able to use the website to complete and an online voter registration application, just as they can today. As part of the voter registration process, Vote Cal will take the information submitted and conduct a check to see if the applicant has a signature on file at the DMV. I, that's beyond me. How do you validate that a person can register to vote and that they're a citizen by going to the DMV to verify they have a signature on file? You know, I've been in high tech for 20 years. My job was operations, building programs. Uh, the, the process part of a successful program, and this just sent up red flags. So it really told me that there is no validation whether a person is a US citizen. So I take it to the next. So it's federal and state law that you must be a US citizen to vote, and yet we don't verify citizenship. There is no accountability, there is no validation, and it basically the Secretary of State's website says the person registering to vote is not liable, the secretary, and the Secretary of State takes no responsibility for validating whether a person is a US citizen. So I go to 2107 section two, standards of proof of residency or identity when proof is required. This section shall be liberally construed to permit voters and new registrants to cast a regular ballot. Any doubt, sorry, any doubt as to the sufficiency of proof or a document presented shall be resolved in favor of permitting the voter or a new registrant to cast a regular vote. There is no responsibility taken by the Secretary of State to validate citizenship. What this does is it dilutes our vote. It takes away what we have the right to do as a US citizen. Okay, so additional voter issues. Deceased individuals remain on the registers. People who have moved out of California still continue to get uh, ballots. Homeless people are rounded up to vote. They have no permanent address, but they're allowed to use street corners or park addresses, and no process to assure that they are a US citizen. What really set some red flags for me is when we welcomed in 6,000 Afghanistans in 2021. That's awesome. But I have no doubt that they were told or they were, they understood that in order to drive in California, you have to get a driver's license. I have no doubt that there was no process in place to validate whether they were a US citizen. Okay, so and when you take a broken process and then put a new bill or a new rules in through that broken process, you're going to get the same results. So the new bill that Governor Newsom just signed was to allow non-citizens to obtain state IDs. So that, with that being said, and the fact that no one verifies citizenship in California, that is just going to be a funnel to make it make the situation worse. 
Okay, so I want to address this privacy issue. This is kind of really sends red flags because I've worked globally, I've negotiated global contracts, I've traveled globally, and this was when the Con Connect CEO was arrested October 4th, he was identified for sending 1.8 million poll worker information to China. Sacramento County does not use Connect poll worker software, however, Sacramento County hires temporary employees to work the elections through temporary agencies. The preferred temporary agency is, uses a third party uh, provider and they obtain temporary employees information which includes their IP address, audio, video of the applicant basically going through a, an online interview process, and at the end of the privacy statement that they provide to the, the potential election worker, they state that they send the information or make your information available to the EEU, India, South Africa, UK, and also their third party vendors located in China, Hong Kong, Australia, and many other countries. If this does not send up red flags to anyone in this room or in California, it should. And we need to understand the magnitude of sending our information or making our information available. Okay, so there's one more piece to this. So I, Recently, in the last couple of weeks, I went online to obtain a copy of a birth certificate. So I go on to the government website and I find a third party company called Vital Check. So I checked into Vital Check and they are owned by LexisNexis. Lexis, so I went to LexisNexis website, I looked at their privacy policy. And it basically says, we share your personal information with our affiliates, service providers, data providers, government agencies, et cetera, et cetera. Then you look at the locations of their affiliates. They are also in Canada, South America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. So this means that all of our information is available. Doesn't that bother you? Doesn't that send up a red alert to you? Why would China or why would Europe and Africa, why do they need a copy of or have available to them our birth records or our death records? Isn't that concerning? Why would California allow a third party company to make our information? Why would they sign a contract? and allow that information to be distributed all over the world. I, I, I am dumbfounded. And what I ask of you is this is important. The Dominion systems are important. The fact that they are heavily hackable um, and easily manipulated, any computer is. So it's not just the Dominion system, it's any computer. We ask you to please represent your constituents and give them the opportunity to have their vote count. And in doing so, we want to, we want the Dominion system gone. We want the old fashioned one day voting. That will minimize any, that will minimize the opportunity for fraud. And we also ask that Everybody cast a ballot and we manually count it. Other countries do it and they do it in one day. Everybody votes the same day, the counting's done and by the next day they have an, a winner or somebody elected. We also want to ask you to um, hold the Secretary, Secretary of State accountable for citizenship verification. Again, for your constituents having illegals when it's against the law, I'm not sure how many ways you put it's illegal, 
it's against the law for people who are not U.S. citizens to vote because, again, it minimizes our votes. So we are asking you to also, I am asking you to also investigate why our personal information is, why we partnered with a third party vendor and distributes our information worldwide. So you have my information that I provided to you. I, I, I'm going to follow up with you by the end of today with my email. I'm also going to give you links to data integrity, all this, the fraud information that had gone on to make it easily accessible to you. And I'm also going to ask for your feedback to me within maybe a week or two, how long it takes to understand why our information is being sent all over the, all over the world. Okay, does that sound fair? Um, yeah, we, we really need to get a handle on this voter fraud and our privacy. It is just out of control right now. If we don't stop it now, then when are we going to? And if we don't take this seriously now, we will become the country that those illegals are fleeing from. And that is so important to understand. So thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And I will email you all. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, those are the off agenda. Uh, that's the presentation. Thank you, Deborah, uh, uh, for that. And uh, with that, then we'll go to our agenda. And anyway, we have folks signed up on some of the items that are on the consent calendar. So, um, yeah, Flo. So, uh, if we could close the off agenda, we do not have Nobody any on public phone, comments on the phone. No one on the phone. No. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. So we'll close the off agenda speakers uh, for. Uh, this morning, and then we're going to go to our consent calendar. And again, I know some of you signed up, so we'll call that item in just a moment. So, all right, we'll go to Flo, help us walk through the consent calendar. Yes, I have some notes for you guys. Um, so, for your consent matters, items 2 through 61, for item 5, you're introducing an ordinance amending chapter 21.15 of the Sacramento County Code to change the method and presentation of the capital improvement plans to be consistent with current practice and to improve the process, waive full ring and continue to November 8th for adoption. For item 13, you're also introducing an ordinance to establish Juneteenth as a county holiday by amending chapter 2.78.710 of the Sacramento County Code, authorize the department to continue negotiations with recognized employee organizations not yet having contract language addressing the Juneteenth holiday, inclusive of an increase in the holiday in lieu hours accrual from 4.3 to 4.6 and from 6.0 to 6.4 for firefighting employees assigned to a 24 hour scheduled per pay period effective January 1, 2023. Waiving reading on this and continuing to December 6th for adoption. Um, I do need a motion to drop item 20. This was the approval of the Wild Hawk North Unit 3 final map and subdivision improvement agreement. There are some uh, things that they're gonna fix on that and bring that back at a future meeting. Okay, we have a motion and a second to drop item 20. We have anybody signed to speak on that? Anybody on the phone? We do not. Okay. All right, so that's the motion. Um, nothing further, please vote. Drop N that item. Unanimous vote. Okay. And then uh, for item 39, you're introducing an ordinance of the Sacramento County Code amending sections of chapter 3.42 relating to administration fees for employment of off-duty sheriff's deputies and waiving reading, full reading and continuing to November 8th for adoption. And then we do have two uh, introductions of new uh, hires by the county executive, items nine and 10. Okay. so. Thank you for pointing those items out. Let me go to my colleagues first. So do you, we do have speakers on item 16 and on item 43. Um, so we'll go to those in a moment. But Mr. Kennedy, any items you want to put? Mr. Desmond. Okay, all right, well, we're, gonna, we're gonna call that off the consent calendar uh, in just a moment. Um, I do wanna ask a question on uh, uh, item 39, if I could. Do we have anybody here in the audience? Uh, item 39, oh, that's the ordinance that I introduced. Right. Yeah. So I guess my question that I want to pose, because, again, we've seen um, some challenges with staffing some of the uh, uh, 
uh, various efforts in this county with, with on-duty officers, and we still have off-duty provisions, and those continue to be fulfilled. I've raised this issue during budget relative to um, contract authority for this board as it relates to our homeless outreach team, but maybe some other uh, divisions within the uh, sheriff's department. And so uh, does, it, it, I guess my question is, is that we continue to allow folks to uh, fulfill uh, some of the off-duty commitments, which are contractual to neighborhoods, to business districts, and so forth, and yet we struggle to fill positions on-duty positions for things that are very important to this community that this board sp you know, speaks to on a regular basis. And I guess I'm curious, these are some administrative revisions, but I think it brings a question to mind, at least for this supervisor, as to, um, again, these are folks who, in the course of their normal duty, are able to then uh, provide overtime services, I guess, not compensated as such, but basically the, con the sheriff contracts for those services, and they're important. They're for neighborhood patrols, for business districts, for certain types of events, and yet we struggle to fill some positions. And I, I find that to be a bit contrary, I guess. And so, Ann, I, mean, I know Eric's um, right, come to the podium as well, but I, I guess I'm curious about how this comports because Again, I've raised the issue. I know council's still looking at it as it relates to it, but we, we fulfill our contracts with other agencies, with the city of Ranch Cordova, with the Folsom Dam and Bureau Reclamation, and yet we struggle to fill positions that serve the people directly, particularly in the unincorporated area, but in the unincorporated cities as well, depending upon the nature of those services, and we still allow folks to, you know, we fulfill these contracts as well. Something's lacking there. And again, we don't administer the Sheriff's Department, I, but we certainly provide for the budget and we provide for the ordinances that allow this type of work to be contracted for. And so I guess I'm curious because I, I'd like to have that conversation before this board. And I know that folks you know, were looking at it, you took it seriously when you had, this, you had the discussion during budget and, and, and some of the uh, challenges we've had over the last several months in filling positions. And yet we, we always fulfill the contracts. And so that's why I suggested we got a contract with ourselves to make sure that things that we think are important, that we both have the budgetary authority over and the position control over, those are the only two controls we have in the Sheriff's Department, and yet we know we struggle in some of those areas where we want to provide services to some of the communities that we represent. And so I guess I, I pose that as a, a question as we have this item because it just kind of brings a front and center for me. So I don't know, Eric, if you have a response, so. I do, Chair Board, Eric Jones, Deputy County Executive uh, with Public Safety and Justice. Uh, we've been working with County Council on that exact question that has come up, which as summarized by you, Chair, is can we contract with ourselves essentially? Uh, because as uh, in this item specific, number 39, it's about outside entities contracting right. with uh, uh, deputies. And when the board uh, provides funding for certain services, uh, can we hold them to the same contracts uh, language that we do in outside entity contracts? Uh, we're actually looking at that and plan to address that through possible options, uh, perhaps MOUs or other things, as we enter into the new budget cycle, as well as enter into new contracts, for example, for additional um, layers of security here within our building. So we are working with county council on what that will look like as these additional issues come up. Okay, well, I thank you for this because this, this, it sets the fee schedule too for use of county equipment in the off-duty capacity serving communities who choose to contract for those services, including vehicles and I guess other equipment and motorcycles and so forth. And so, again, I just, I, it, it really, again, kind of brings some focus to that. I know we didn't come up briefing the other day, but as I thought about this, uh, um, it, it, it seemed appropriate to, to address it. Supervisor Desmond, you wanted to weigh in. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chair, for bringing this up because I also didn't didn't think about it uh, when I was going through the through the briefing. But I'm glad you brought it up because it does highlight it again. And I and I know we were waiting for kind of a report back on the status of this. I mean, I think it's it's extremely important for this board and our constituents in the unincorporated area to be able to have the same expectation of any anyone else who's contracting with the sheriff's department for specific services. Um, and so I would just again underscore how, how what an important issue that is for me and I know Eric you, you're, you're keenly aware of the distinction between the hot officers for instance and their deployment in the unincorporated area versus the deployment of hot officers in a contract city um, in the county and and the contract city the staffing is is always there it's always full um, whereas in the unincorporated area um, those officers that this board has specifically funded are, are pulled back so 
I'm very eager to, to find out maybe what some options are uh, that we have going forward. Thank you. I guess I, maybe to just simply boil it down, I've already kind of given my comments, but if by contract they jump to the front of the line, so to speak, and those always get the first call, then I think it requires us, again, not that we wouldn't contract, those are important services to people that we represent holistically in this county and for other things that uh, supplement law enforcement activities for protection of public facilities like Folsom Dam. Uh, but I, uh, but I, I think that if, if that's the case, if those contracts always get first in line, then I think that it requires some additional scrutiny when it comes to contracting because those contracts require this board's approval. They're under the authority of the sheriff, which we do not have that authority to deploy folks within the department. But we're the ones, we the board, ultimately are approving those contracts. And if that always gives a first in place, first in line, then I think that raises a serious issue, particularly in light of the experience, and I just speak from my experience as a member of this board, uh, over many years, uh, to maybe something that is, is a bit backwards in, in, in the sense because it, it leaves us, um, you know, basically bare at the times to respond to, you know, the unincorporated area, but maybe to even other needs within the uh, context of the, you know, what's the, probably the authority of the sheriff, but also, authorities that, because we do have, again, I, I failed to mention, we have position control, we have budget authority, and we have contract authority if it's not delegated. And so those are three areas where, and I think that this, you know, this board needs to keep those in mind because I think we've seen some challenges here, uh, and they aren't just all current. We've had those in the past as well. So anyway, I don't object to the item today. I think it's updating, again, um, some of the uh, charges for the um, administrative um, aspects of off-duty sheriffs, but I th again, I appreciate that the other issue will be visited by this board at a future date, so, okay. All right, um, since we don't have any other items, um, uh, board members, then I'm gonna go ahead and um, uh, call um, item 16, which we do have uh, speakers on, on the consent calendar. We have a number of speakers that have signed up, and uh, we'll take those in order they were handed to me, and then we have a speaker on item 43 as well. So. Okay, you, okay, I'm going to read 16 yes. first. Authorize the Registrar of Voters to execute a revised and retroactive contract with the Secretary of State for Voting System Replacement in an amount up to uh, $5,571,496 with a term of August 1, 2022 through December 31, 2024. Okay, all right, and so we have a, a number of speakers. I'll take these, like I said, in the order they were given to me. So I have Rodney Seacrest, followed by Sherry Rain and uh, Mike Rogers. Good, good morning. Good morning, honorable board members and chair. My name's Rodney Seacrest and I'm here today to voice my concerns about our elections in this state. The electoral process is the cornerstone of our self-governance and the preservation of our constitutional republic. We expect elections to be fair, honest, and transparent. In a constitutional republic, a form of government guaranteed to all U.S. citizens by the Guarantee Clause of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Minority vo voices and rights are protected. All points of view are represented and heard. The results of a true election in a republic would be that every party puts forth a candidate in the general election, protecting those in the political minority and giving them equal representation on the general election ballot. In contrast, in a democracy, 51% of the people can tell the other 49% to sit down and shut up. 51% of the people can oppress, steal from, and trample all rights of the other 49%. In a democracy, minorities have no protection of their rights. Every element of California's electoral process is an honor system and does not require proof of any kind identity, citizenship, eligibility, residence, et cetera. At any stage of the process, the doors are wide open for deceased, relocated, and non-citizen individuals on either list to be impersonated with ease and their ballots be cast by anyone willing to do so. The chances of the perpetrator being caught are infinitesimally small. So many people today are asking themselves, why should I vote? Does it even matter? It brings tears to my eyes and a deep sorrow that America would be brought by circumstances to ask those questions. The founders bequeathed to all Americans the most amazing government document ever written. 
by human hand, declaring that all living under its influence would be free from the tyranny of the majority and self-determining through a de democratic process of electing governmental represent representatives. Under that system, each and every vote matters immensely. But now there's a clear reason to sub suspect the democratic process, i.e. elections, is being subverted by a myriad of methods. And true elections are being replaced by selections. One issue on the front burner of concern currently is election technology, i.e. the machines. Anyone paying attention is becoming familiar with the term algorithm a programming of the voting machines and or tabulators to create a predetermined result. Current evidence strongly suggests that the algorithms do exist in at least some places and that all the machines currently in use are at least capable of and vulnerable to electronic manipulation. It is understandable that the people would feel discouraged, defeated, angry, frustrated, hopeless, rebellious, and more. Rodney, I need you to conclude. We have a lot of speakers, so if you could kind of wrap it up, please. I don't mean to cut you shorter, but... Perfect timing. Okay. I urge you all to carefully consider what the remaining speakers have to present, and I thank you for your considerations. Thank you, Mr. Segrist. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sherry, followed by Mike Rogers, followed by Jeanette Feltz. Thank you for hearing me one more time. <laughs> Good morning, Sherry. It is your responsibility as you sit there on this Board of Supervisors to provide for fair and safe elections for us. The Dominion software offers neither. The Dominion system is vulnerable to hacking and manipulation as been shown by our speakers earlier and by what's being shared in the news and by arrest. It's not a safe system. Poll worker data has been exposed, making them vulnerable to who knows what. Who really knows what China intends to do with this information? I've heard even persons' banking information has become exposed. Who would have even thought that signing up to be a poll worker would put us in such a precarious position? This is in no way a safe environment. It is time to protect your constituents. We need a system that is transparent. This is not a partisan issue. This affects each and every one of us. The current system threatens everyone. Please, please vote no on the Dominion contract. It is time to return election integrity. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Mr. Rogers. Good morning. My name is Michael Rogers. I was born and raised here in Sacramento. And, you know, confidence is a precious thing. When you lack confidence, bad things can happen. If you, have, if you lose confidence in your money, there can be a run on the bank, and the whole system can collapse. If you lose confidence in your votes, well, then what collapses then? your government starts to collapse. The laws that are implemented by those governments start to collapse. Our entire republic, our democratic republic, is founded on the sanctity and the honor of our individual votes as citizens of this United States of America and the state of California. And while I've heard lots of evidence about these voting machines, uh, having compromised technical problems uh, that, that can be manipulated by others. And I'm no computer expert. I don't know. But I know that I'm concerned about this. Whether it's true or not, there is now a very large perception in our general population that these elections are rigged. They're not fair. They're being called. And whether that is true or not, now sort of becomes immaterial. Just like, well, if you go to the bank, is there enough money there for you to get it out? Well, no, there's not. But as long as we don't all go asking for it, the system continues to go. We're getting it to the point where this system is going to get unstable. 
and, and start to fail, people will lose confidence in you. They'll lose confidence in our government. They'll lose confidence in our laws. And this is untenable to our nation, to our state, to our people. We're sovereigns. We deserve honest, fair elections. And so I urge you all to vote no on this machines because they're opaque. We can't see in them. And because of that, our confidence is really being eroded. And with that confidence, we, we start to lose faith, faith in our nation and each other. Please vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Supervisor Frost, did you want to make a comment or, or get some clarification before taking the next I just next wanted to oh. clarify that this item 16 is not extending the Dominion contract. It's accept, accepting grant funds, additional grant funds that our county had already uh, been actually awarded part of the funds. This is uh, just increasing that award. This is not a renewal of the Dominion contract to my understanding. I want to clarify that and make sure I'm understanding it correctly. Okay. Yeah. Yes, that is absolutely correct. This is not uh, the renewal of the Dominion contract. This is a grant from the State of California Secretary, Secretary of State for the purchase of a variety of different kinds of equipment. Um, we factored this grant that we knew we were going to receive in the June budget and the equipment has been purchased. Uh, we do purchase nothing but certified equipment, um, although the staff report does acknowledge that you're allowed uh, to, to purchase conditionally certified equipment. Sacramento County does not purchase conditionally certified equipment, um, but this is not the Dominion contract. Um, should I save other comments for later? Or can I? Well, you're well, welcome to my comments at any, any time. I, we still have some number of speakers, but if you I'll want to. I'll just let, yeah. we'll go ahead and then okay. I'll ask further later. All right, thank very you. good. Okay, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to be in the queue to um, speak first when the uh, speakers are done on this item. Okay, Thanks. all right. Um, I, I would just note, I think it's important because, um, again, we've seen some of the correspondence that was obviously referenced in the um, off agenda item uh, presentation. And I guess to be clear, um, that the Dominion contract that's being referenced here is was a five-year contract, and that there was delegated authority. And would you, because I could think again, there was a reference in some of the communication I saw that this was going to come back to the board in January of 2023. And I think it I just, and it's being transparent and in, in, in full disclosure here. I believe that contract uh, with the delegated authority had a two-year. Uh, extension and from from the it had three years, but then number two years additional. Is that correct? So the original contract was for five years, and it allowed for three additional one-year okay. extensions. So the current contract does in fact expire in January of 2023, and we are are in the process right now of renewing it to extend it to January of 2024. Okay. And, and that, that authority was delegated to the department. Okay, so it doesn't require board... Um, um, it does not require coming back to the board okay. until after the, the third one-year extension. Which would be? Uh, that I'm not sure. 2026. Okay, all right. So I, I want people to, to, to know that before we leave the chambers today. So... Um, um, Anyway, important information. So, all right, let's go back to our speakers then. And uh, we have uh, Jeanette Feltz. Jeanette's followed by Rhonda De La Cruz, followed by Christine Rich. Hi. Uh, Hi. Well, Good. After the um, e explanation of what we're voting on, you are still voting to allocate more of our tax dollars into systems that we don't have confidence in. So we're not looking to put more money into the problem. We want to see those funds diverted to other areas of concern uh, that, that are of real concern to citizens. Uh, I would like the board to recognize that the continued use of Dominion machines in our elections compounds and continues the lack of voter confidence. I have spoken to many candidates and all of them facing the problem of low voter turnout and citizens who feel that their vote won't count. Voters feel disenfranchised and that is not acceptable. 
I know that the talking point right now is that right-wing extremists who are questioning the integrity of our elections, technology does have its benefits, like the magic of video. Uh, prior to 2020, there is video after video of Democrat leaders, including Hillary Clinton and Vice President Harris, openly stating in hearings that these machines are not only vulnerable, but that they're compromised. We need to move forward in a way that reassures citizens, registered voters in this county, that their vote for the people they want representing them matters, that it is valued, and that their vote will be counted and not be manipulated by software controlled by people who do not have their best interest in mind. For those that would argue that we simply cannot get the job done without the machines, that's simply not true. Not only do I believe that the public would welcome the opportunity to improve the integrity of our elections, I believe they would jump at the chance. I would like to see us move forward to a system that brings confidence back to our elections. We have a civic duty to serve on a jury when our name is randomly selected. Maybe we can move toward a similar system for our elections. What I do know is we can't continue to do what we have done and continue to ignore the issues and ignore the critical problem of voters feeling discouraged. The machines may serve in it as an added convenience, but the risk of bad intentions and actions far outweighs the benefit. I would suggest that the more than $5 million currently in question would be better spent hiring and training workers to physically count our cast ballots. You have an opportunity today to take the first step in restoring voter confidence. I would ask that you collectively vote to not renew the, the Dominion contract and instead move in a new direction, or in this case, an old direction, to restore integrity and voter confidence. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Good morning, Rhonda. Hi, my name is Rhonda Dela Cruz. And um, to the chair, I want to tell you how impressed I was this morning. So happy that I'm in your district, my friend. Um, I heard you this morning, and you gave me some confidence in just what you were talking about as far as being common sense with another issue up here. And I would hope that each and every one of you would take on the same thinking regarding the Dominion and our voting system. I agree with some of my associates out here that talk about our confidence. I am so concerned about our younger generations. I have spoken to many, many of them. I've taken that time out, and I've gone to each and every one of them, and I've said, why? Why aren't you guys wanting to vote? I'm, I'm dragging these young people to, to the voting. I'm putting everything in front of them. And, they, and every one of them has said, because it's rigged. W what good is it for us to show up? We try showing up and nothing happens. So with that, I would hope and pray that each one of you would really take this serious and to know that you are in the position to help, to help start changing things. Our generation, our, our young people are important. They are our foundation. They're coming up. They're going to be our future. And this is important for not only for them, but for our grandchildren and our future grandchildren. And I would like to just say that um, I was really offended this morning with um, District 2, Patrick Kennedy and his views, and he indicated that all of you on the board all agreed. And I would hope that you don't agree in his views. Because calling your constituents that it's all just, uh, you know, um, this is just all made up, when in fact you are being given the evidence of, of it right to you, They're being, you're being fed it is just really, really not okay. I am your constituents, and all the, uh, the uh, constituents of pa uh, District 2, if you're in here, I say don't vote for Patrick <laughs> again. And if you are watching on TV, think about who you're voting for, who is representing you. Because if he's able to talk like this out in the open, and it's okay, and if all of you in the board of all of you feel this way, please say so. 
so that that way we know which way we need to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so next we have uh, Christine Rich and then uh, Deborah Holmes and then Karen uh, Ajutan, I believe. Morning, Christine. Good morning. My name is Christine, and I'm actually in Don's okay. district. Yep. I've been a Sacramento voter since 1997. Uh, I've always enjoyed living and residing in Sacramento County until the last couple of years when it seems there's a systematic decline of our voting rights and our rights as citizens. I'd like to encourage the board to consider one citizen, one ballot, one vote period in a conversation. No machines are needed. No automation is needed. There are other countries and other cities that have millions more people than we do, and they do same-day voting, and they do hand-counted ballots, and they do paper ballots only, so that there is no question about the validity of the elections. I went ahead and went on the Secretary of State's website today, and I discovered that there's a, a new uh, California Voters' Choice Act. And in reading just some of the verbiage in the act, it looks like um, prisoners are gonna be entitled to voting, which I'm not necessarily opposed to citizens voting, but I think that our US Constitution requires felons are not permitted to vote. So if we can't even determine the validity of our registered voters, citizenship status through the Department of Voter Vehicles, how are we going to determine their felony status? How are we going to determine whose vote is actually legitimately counted so that voters can have confidence in our elections? There is a complaint form that voters can go to with the Secretary of State where you can file a complaint about your elections in the county and in the state. Um, I thought I had that up so that I could read the address to everybody so they knew how to find it. Oh, give me a second. Uh, the uh, complaint form is located on the Secretary of State's uh, website, and it's under voter fraud complaint form, https colon backslash backslash elections dot cdn dot sos dot ca dot gov slash fraud dash complaints da, uh, slash PDFs slash, I'm an English voter, so I chose English. Please, any registered voters listening to this, go to the complaint form and submit your comments to the Secretary of State. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> okay, next, uh, Deborah, Deborah Holmes. And followed by Karen Juden. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, supervisors. Uh, my name is Deborah Holmes, and I've lived in Sacramento County for 10 years. I currently reside in Supervisor District 2, and I'm requesting that Sacramento County immediately discontinue the use of Dominion, Dominion voting machines. A forensic report was published on March 22nd, 2022, links to which were provided to you in a letter dated September 28th, 2022. I wondered if you took the time to read those reports. Nobody recalls? I can send it again. These reports show that the software on the Dominion Election Management Server performed unauthorized reprocessing and recounting of over 25,000 ballots in the November 2020 election and over 8,000 ballots in the April 2021 election in Mesa County, Colorado. I'm sure you guys are aware of the election um, fraud investigations going on in Mesa County. It's been on the news. Additional data being provided to you today in a report published by Dr. Stanley Young with election integrity info highlights, significant voter data discrepancies in California. A summary of these findings shows that between 2016 and 2020, the population of California increased by less than 700,000 people, which includes children and non-citizens. Yet in the 2020 election, 
the California vote total for the Democratic candidate increased by more than 2.3 million votes. This increase does not appear to be logically explainable and potential causes of this discrepancy can be attributed to the use of the voting machines, which keep ineligible voters on the rolls indefinitely. This allows fabricated votes to be submitted. And additionally, these machines do not allow for genuine oversight of voting tabulation. They have been proven to be connected to the internet and have also been proven to be hackable and hacked. We the people rely on our elected officials to do the right thing and to uphold your oath of office to support and defend our liberties, which are protected by the US and the California constitutions. It is imperative that we restore election integrity as what we currently have is a compromised election system. This allows public officials to be selected, not elected. This must change here in Sacramento County with the November 2022 election. I would like to remind you that each of you, you have the authority, you have the civic duty, and you have an ethical responsibility to ensure for your constituents that elections in our county are safe and fair. Thank you for discontinuing the use of these corrupt machines and restoring same day, in-person only voting in our county. Thank you, Deborah. And then Karen be followed by Nikki McAnally and then Debbie Woolley. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Karen Juton. I went down to the registrars and I talked to the tech. They were doing a certification of the machine, so I went down to talk to the tech. And he was so gracious, I got to talk to him as long as I wanted. And I asked him if he'd ever seen the source code on the voting computer. Well, he had not. He'd never seen it because it's proprietary. It's owned by Dominion. So I said, well, if your voting computers are hacked, how would you know if you can't see the source code and how could you repair it? And he didn't have an answer for me. No bank would ever have counting on a computer that they can't see the source code. So saying that they're certified computers, it means nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because you can't see the source code. The registrar hasn't seen it. No techie has seen it. Nobody in the registrar's office has seen it. It could say anything. But guess what? We do have the source code. In Mesa County, Colorado, a woman named Tina Peters was elected to run the elections. And when she found out that they were going to come in and do trusted build, ordered by the Secretary of State in Colorado, she decided to get the source code, an image of it, before and after the update. Now, this information is incontrovertible. It's a captured in time and cannot be changed. That evidence is absolutely correct. And so she put it out on the internet, the source code on the Dominion voting computers in Mesa, Colorado, and programmers looked at it and they saw that there's an algorithm that creates two books. The first book lost 5,000 votes. The clerks in the office never saw that. They don't know what's going on because they can't see the source code. The second book changed 27,000 votes. Now, if you're not counting on paper and you're using an image of the ballot, that image can be manipulated by the computer. And that's what happened. And that's what's happening all over our nation. And if you think that we're going to suddenly go away and decide that they weren't shooting and we're just, you know, conspiracy theorists, you're wrong because we have a ton of evidence. We've got the source code in Mesa County. We have Antrim in a uh, county in Michigan. The Michigan judge released the report of the audit of Dominion voting systems revealing that the machines and their software were designed to create systemic fraud. We're not going away. We're going to be back, and we don't want you to renew a contract with Dominion. And we don't want to use voting computers. Thank you, Thank you Karen. OK, 
King. Next is Nikki McNally. Hi. Namaste, which means I salute the divinity in you, as it should be. Right? We should respect one another. Um, I'm Nikki McNally. I'm an independent um, voter. I represent many. We the people do not consent to child's play of ballot harvesting dominion computer and signature copy technology. And there is a computer that duplicates our signature. That's not fair. It ain't right. France got rid of dominions, counted by hand, 37 million ballots is proven effective and, and, and doing the tried and true old fashioned way we grew up with, more people will be involved. As it is, 87% of us have given up. We're apathetic. There's no hope. I've talked to many. I've been out there handing the pamphlet out for days. And I say even more than 87%. So what, how fair is that? One day, one vote, do it the right way, fill out the the um, ballot and hand it in and count it that day because we'll, we'll, there'll be volunteers to do that. As a yogi and a near-death experience, I know lifetimes and karma. Karma is real. <laughs> Thank you. So let's end our merry-go-round useless election fraud. Unify, unify and um, come together as one people under God and just be one, one party of love. Let that be our next pandemic. Love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Okay, next, uh, thank you, Nikki. Next is Debbie Woolley, followed by Donna O'Shea, followed by Blanca Matthews. Good morning, Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Hey there. Good morning. Good morning. I wanted to say hello to Patrick and acknowledge the harassment that's going on in the world around the voter integrity. Um, in um, 2016, I watched the um, elections go upside down and be stolen. I know it happens. I was furious. I, um, Hillary Clinton and uh, Bernie Sanders and everybody was upset, you know? And I'm still upset. There is a lot of harassment, but we need to stop being partisan about this. We need to realize it happened to the Republicans. And man, they're really upset now. You know, they're demoralized and all these myths and conspiracies, oh my God. Well, I want to talk about a myth and that's the U.S. citizen. In our state, nobody knows who a U.S. citizen is when it comes to voting. No one's verifying it. But as one of we the people, as my status, I claim the jurisdiction of common law, which means I'm your boss. We're your boss. You are servants. And you know, when the king, the tyrant, wouldn't listen to the colonists, we didn't need a court. We didn't need any attorneys to write the Declaration of Independence and write a new constitution. If we have no confidence in who we're voting for, Democrats and Republicans, we're going to come together. We're going to unify. We are going to unify because truth is unifying. If there's cheating going on with this software, the people that are doing it are way smarter than I am. I just use common sense. And the common sense says to read the Constitution. And the Constitution says in Article 2, Section 2, that the people have all the political power and we can change this government whenever we want. When we wake up to that, we are going to hold everyone who has been putting these strange requests back 
and saying, you know what? Why do we have 80 boxes out there spread all over the county for a whole month? Where's the accountability? I don't see it. It doesn't feel good. Vote no on the Dominion grant. $5 million, you guys can make it up somewhere else. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Okay, next Donna, and then Blanca, and then Carrie Benton. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I want to start off by asking, do you guys validate parking? <laughs> do you validate your parking? <laughs> A little joke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Desmond, do you validate? <laughs> okay. Um, what she said earlier kind of changed, well, it kind of like deflated a little bit of what was said, but um, grant money getting, that you're getting from Dominion, is that what it is? Grant money from Dominion? No, it's grant money from the state. It's, 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 it's state dollars, our dollars. For Dominion? To provide a number of services, that's what's in the item today. Okay, Donna. because yeah. um, including machines, I would say that you sh you shouldn't be taking the grant money um, coming from them. You need to immediately discontinue the use of the Dominion voting machines in Sac County. A forensic report was published on March 22, links to um, which were provided to you in a letter dated September 28. 2022 shows that the software of Dominion Election Management Service performed unauthorized repossessing repossess the recounting of over 25,000 ballots in the November 2020 election and over 8,000 ballots in the April 2021 election in Mesa, Colorado. I would like to remind you that you have the authority, the civic duty, the ethical responsibility to ensure for your constituents that the election in our counties are safe and fair. Thank you for having the backbone to discontinue these corrupt machines and restoring same day in person only voting in our county. That's what we need to go back to. That's what worked for us. That's what we trust. And there would be a lot more people here to talk to you about it, but the meetings are during working hours. So it's a few of us that are speaking for millions of people that feel exactly the same way. So thank you for your time and think about what is said. Just sit on it for a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> okay, uh, Blanca Matthews, and then Carrie Benton, and then uh, Sandra Marquez. Good morning. Hello, good morning. <clears throat> I didn't have anything prepared. I'm just going to wing it. Um, according to Mr. Kennedy, you guys all feel the same way that voter fraud. Uh, we could play it back on video, Mr. Kennedy, the comment that you said. You said, I hope the board feels the same way as I do, something like that. Um, I hope you guys don't. Um, that voter fraud is a conspiracy theory. Um, that's pretty sad to hear from a board of supervisor. Um, and the burden of proof, let's talk about that. If voter, if there is no fraud, prove it to us. It's not to us. <laughs> the people, we do not yield our sovereignty to you. You serve us. The people, by delegating authority, do not give you, public servants, the right to decide what is good for us, the people. Some of the trainings that you guys provide to your county employees, I have read some of those training um, documents. And within those documents, it says, I'm not going to quote, but it's paraphrasing. All employees and officials of the county need to remember that public office 
uh, I'm paraphrasing, okay? So, all employees and officials of the county need to remember that public office and local government exist to serve the needs of the citizens in the county. It is the duty of every employee and official to expose corruption whenever it is discovered. So if the people here is saying we don't trust this type of voting system, we don't uh, believe that it is secure, and they're trying to bring you evidence, and you shut down, and you close your ears, and you close your doors, and you don't respond to emails, and you don't read the documents they're providing to you, are you really listening to the concerns of the constituents? Probably not. And there's plenty of you that have received emails and there's no response back from various districts. So, like I said, the burden of proof is on you. If everything is secure, then somehow prove it to us and show us that there is no reason to be suspect. The DMV, I just recently changed my name. I'm kind of in the process. Sometimes I forget. I did it last week or two weeks ago my last name, and yeah, looking back, the DMV did not ask me um, if I was a citizen or not, um, birth certificate. I could have brought any different type of um, ID. They do request an ID, but it didn't necessarily have to be that I'm a citizen. Um, so anyways, that's my comment. Have a good one. Thank you, Mark. Okay, I have Carrie and then uh, Sandra. If there's anyone else that wants to speak on item 16, I don't know if we have folks on the phone or not, uh, Madam Clerk, but uh, those are the last two. I have signed up in chambers for, for this item, so. Okay, go ahead, Carrie. I also do not appreciate the gaslighting and the dismissing of the issue of lack of voter integrity by referring to us as conspiracy theorists. Um, would you say the same when Barack Obama, John McCain, Hillary Clinton, pointed out that the voting machines are problematic. And when Kamala Harris said, quote, we brought in folks who, before our eyes, hacked election machines. So it doesn't seem like uh, uh, if the, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know, you weren't paying attention to most people who are speaking, and obviously this is addressed to you. Um, but not originally. I, originally, I did not think that there was going to be someone who would gaslight us right from the start. Um, but there have been other people to testify. Clinton uh, Curtis testified at a House Judiciary Committee December 13, 2004, and said elect, that these electronic elections can be fixed and go undetected. These machines are built by private companies with proprietary secret software, as you have been told, that no one is allowed to see. If we know these machines are hackable, then why are we using them? We don't need immediate election results. We need election integrity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Sandra Marquez, and Sandra's the last one I have signed up to speak on this item, so but we have some folks on the phone. Okay. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning. Um, I am glad to be here. So. Uh, to utilize the process that our forefathers established here for us to be able to speak to our representatives. So I'm glad to be here. Um, my name is Sandra Marquez, and I'm a constituent of this beautiful state of California. And I am asking you to please do not disregard, do not dismiss these concerns and comments that my fellow uh, citizens are sharing here with you. They have brought you uh, many concerns and they have uh, brought proof of what it is that they are stating. Um, I am very concerned about these issues as well and I come before you to ask you to not dismiss them, to look into them. You, that's part of your responsibility as our representatives and we hope that you will take that responsibility seriously. Um, I just wanted to end with a quote by Edmund Burke. Uh, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator.
Okay, so I don't have anybody else signed up to speak on. Oh, Deborah? Do you mind if I make a comment? Um, you're welcome to make a comment on this item. Sure, you're up. Just fill out speaker form when you're done, Deborah. I, okay. okay. So I just want to make a comment. This is my first time here. And I have to say that these people vote you in office. These elections are not to the standards that we want them to. You represent us. And I'm sorry, Phil, are we, are we boring you? You know, it's, it's like you need to listen to us. And I, as observing, thank you, Don. I appreciate your attention. I just don't think that you guys are listening. And it's important to us, obviously. And you're in office because we're voting for you. We don't vote for you. You're not going to sit there. So I need to make sure that you guys are listening. So if we bored you, my apology, but it's obviously very important to us as a U.S. citizen, as a voter, and under the Constitution. Thank you. I appreciate, Don, yeah, everything. Thank yeah, thank you, Deborah. Okay. All right, we do have someone on the phone on this item, so we're going to have the clerk go to our, to our phone. Please Good. transfer the caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, this is Gabrielle Ingram of District 2. Um, the summary that I'm hearing from everybody is there is evidence of fraud. So regardless of one thinks, there is evidence of fraud. So the group is opposed to any contracts for additional funding. We don't care what it's for. If it's for the machines, we don't want our tax money going to that. We would like the grant rejected. Election fraud serves both sides of the aisle. That's, there's evidence of that. Biden is already setting the frame for election interference. So if 2022 tips to the Republicans, guess what you're going to hear? A bunch of Democrats in there a bunch of Democrats in here are saying the same things as we are. Clinton accused, maybe I'm on the phone, Clinton accused of Russian collusion as the only way Trump won. Both sides of the aisles have called this out. There is evidence that this has been going on for a long time. The only way to squash it is to get rid of the machines. That's it. It's the only way to do it. It is not a conspiracy. It is not a conspiracy theory, gaslighting Kennedy. It is a conspiracy against the people. Your vote doesn't matter, progressive Democrats. My vote doesn't matter as a conservative. It's rigged. Do away with the system. Stop the gaslighting. None of us benefit from this. That's all. <laughs> okay, thank you, Gabrielle. All right, any other folks on the phone? Okay, so that's our last caller. No other so. callers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we have Supervisor Cernan and Supervisor Frost, I believe, both wanted to weigh in. So, Supervisor Cernan. Great. Thank you. There's no uh, further comments or questions from uh, folks. I know Supervisor Frost wants to chime in, but I'm going to move the item. <clears throat> okay. All right. So we have the item been moved and seconded. So go ahead. Any other comments, Mr. Cernan? No. That was that's it. Good. Okay. Supervisor Frost. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, I want to say that I appreciate the citizens who have been diligently, you know, watching and uh, watching the civic process and who are willing to come out. I know it's an expense and an inconvenience and probably many more wanted to come. I also want to say that um, the Voters' Choice Act, when it was originally voted, I can't remember when it was, it was several years ago, I, I did not support it and the reason I did not, the reason I gave at the time was that I was concerned about fraud and so I share um, many of the sentiments that were expressed here today. I, what I'm hearing from you is that as voters you feel disenfranchised and that you are lacking confidence in whether or not your vote makes a difference. And I don't want that. I, and I, um, I have questions too, and I wanna get to the bottom of them, but I have not been able to uh, get my 
hands on specific evidence within my county that um, that says there's something wrong. Uh, literally, I have um, had so many conversations with the Registrar of Voters, and they're doing, I believe, if there's fraud happening, it's not caused by our county staff. They're doing everything they can to ensure that the, the process is is going, you know, is transparent and and that it's going well. The challenge I think we have could be could go beyond maybe to, to an arena that we're not aware of. In I don't know what is going on in the machines. I um, I I do know that I'm willing to I I'm interested in a couple of the comments that were that that were were thrown out today. I, I'm interested in getting to the bottom of it. I think we all want to get to the. If there's a problem, let's f look at it and find it. I mean, um, and then and then we can do something about it. And this isn't about. Uh, Supervisor Kennedy um, made some comments about the staff. This isn't really about, um, you know, against our staff. This is really we want to make sure that we have election integrity. So um, there was, I took some notes while you were talking. Debbie Holmes talked about um, the source code being proprietary to Dominion and uh, Tina Peters from Mesa County, Arizona, I believe, and I... Colorado. Colorado. Oh, Colorado. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's a way that you can connect that person with me um, directly, and maybe, I don't know if uh, Chair Natoli is willing to have a meeting with that person, just to have a conversation, so we can begin to explore and learn more about this and what's going on. Maybe our legal, our legal could be there. Would you be willing, Supervisor Natoli? I, I, I meet with just about anyone who requests a meeting, so I'm, yeah. you know, so. Other, I'm pretty, pretty open to that. I think I have a pretty good and strong reputation for meeting I, with folks, I so whether, I, whether I, they agree with me or I agree with them, I'm certainly open to hearing from folks, so. I took yeah. a guess yeah. on <laughs> you being willing to do that. Pretty it accurate. was a pretty good guess. <laughs> yeah. um, the other person that I, um, Karen Juton uh, made, or someone talk, talked about, Debbie Holmes talked about a forensic auditor, a, a forensic investigation that took place. I would like to talk to the person, the forensic auditor, for them to explain to me what they found in Arizona. Because my, I've heard this about Arizona, and I've also heard from other people who are attorneys who have stated that got all settled and it wasn't proven, something wasn't proven. So I'm, we, we need to, if we're gonna get to the bottom of it, I'm willing to look at it and, and go down that road. And I'm hoping Supervisor Natoli will be involved in that meeting also. Will you, Supervisor Natoli? Putting you on yes. the spot. Those are two yeah. meetings, I won't yeah. request yeah. any more, uh, I okay. promise. Okay, sure. um, regarding the citizenship, uh, the citizenship, I have had that conversation also with our registrar of voters and regarding the, the citizenship, the burden of, of verifying citizenship is on the Secretary of State. Um, the DMV would not be the one who would verify that, and it seemed like they admitted it in their their letter that you spoke of, Deborah. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm not sure if that's a conversation with le a legislator um, or someone like that. But again, um, I think it's important for us to. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I am willing to go down this rabbit hole and figure out, you know, what is going on. If there is something, if there's nothing wrong, I think we should find out so that we can put this to rest and be done with it. And 
And I think if we don't look into it, it's just going to continue to fester and be a growing problem. Um, and we have an election coming up. Now, I want to comment on item 16. Um, the, my understanding of item 16 is this is not renewing in any way renewing a contract, and I think legal counsel, I'm hoping legal counsel will let me know if I understand correctly, that this, this is really money that we uh, allocated in our budget. We knew there was going to be a delay in the funding because there was a delay with the Secretary of State with a grant that was already approved, and we, fu we funded some machines with general funds those machines that we accepted were certified because we have a policy. We do not accept machines that are certified. You can say that our machines conditionally are not. Conditionally certified versus certified. There's a distinction. You, see, you said certified, certified. Okay. It's, it's conditionally certified versus the certified. I didn't mean to correct you, but that. Okay, so yeah. I guess I need from legal counsel because I was understanding they were everything we bought everything we have in at the county is certified so if that's it's not that's certified answer. that's correct yes fully certified fully yes. certified not conditionally what's certified what's the difference fully certified not conditionally certified the the grant allows you to purchase certified or conditionally certified but the county of sacramento's policy is only to purchase certified oh thank you yep. okay so okay we did so if we don't accept this money, then you're, you know, either way, you taxpayers, we're paying. I hate to tell you, whether we accept this grant or not, you, you can pay it through state money that's made available to us for Voters' Choice Act, or we can pay it out of our general fund, which means we have less money to spend on other things that we need money for. That's the only really discretionary the funding that we have. So I'm inclined to support accepting the money from the state and with the commitment that I want to move forward to try to get to the bottom of the election integrity so that we know we can have confidence that we do have it. And I make that commitment to you. All Thank right. you. All right. Okay. Um, I just want, if, if I could, uh, and certainly thanks to our uh, speakers this morning. Did, did you have a question? I'm sorry. To get oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Supervisor Frost, go ahead. I think your question was whether or not this has anything to do with extending or renewing a, the actual contract for the purchase of the... Right. Um, I right. just wanted to make clear to everyone, this does not... Uh, and so... Yeah, this is, mere, this is simply um, receiving funds from the state. It has no impact on the, current, the contract to purchase anything. And the contract can be extended three one-year periods, and it's already been delegated when we initially approved the five-year contract, and therefore it won't be coming to the board in January. The, the path forward is if you, you know, you need, you need to help us, you know, help us understand what you see, and we'll be willing to look at all of it with, with an open mind on both sides, because we're not, I'm not assuming there's a problem. I can't assume there's a problem uh, until I see something that makes me feel like I need to look further. Let's take a look at it. And I feel like we do need to take a look at it. Thank you. I'm, I'm done. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much, Roger. No. Uh, Deborah, we've closed public testimony. So if, if um, but certainly as you're going to follow up with some information. So if you want to follow up with the board in writing or certainly verbally, that'd be fine. So. Um, so I want to um, just go back to what's before us today because this, this goes back to 2020 when we initially agreed to accept the funding and there was a term uh, um, <clears throat> that expired. So we're now asking to extend the term for for the purpose of receiving, we've received some two point, um, well, two, more than two million already. And this would allow us to, to claim against the remaining five million plus, is that correct? I have to pull it up, but I think we we're expecting the five million, and we're getting an additional two. Is that correct, David? Good morning, Supervisor Natoli. Yes. Um, the the original um, execution of the contract, which that's a term that the 
Secretary of State uses, it's truly a, um, a grant that we use more commonly used, was for $4.7 million was the grant. Um, we've claimed against that grant up, up until June of 2022, $2.2 million. Okay. So um, then the new grant um, has been moved up to $7.7 .7 million. Right, three, 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 three million right which 000. allows us another $5.5 million to claim against the state. Um, and this gives us an additional um, two years to claim, well, 18 months now, to claim against those. And I'm not sure if I introduced myself. I'm David Villanueva. Yeah, I'm Deputy County Executive over Administrative Services, which um, elections is part of this um, agency. Okay, so the, the, the first contract was uh, claimed back to January of 2019 and was actually approved going back uh, by board action in February 2020, is that correct? Yes, I believe so. Okay. So what I want to ask about, though, is because uh, I think there are a number of things that are bundled in here and certainly to the points being made today about um, the systems that, systems that are being utilized, but this also covers uh, additional costs, both as security of communication, um, the, the cost of uh, the vote centers and, and uh, uh, updates to the election management system, also um, equipment that's used to uh, for the ballot drop boxes, uh, the ballot sorting process equipment and so forth. And I know there were questions raised around some of those activities, but I want to be clear though, the contract says that uh, for costs associated with voting systems that have been certified or conditionally certified pursuant to the California voting system standards. Since we don't take systems and don't uh, incur, again, um, we're not either purchases or utilizing systems that are conditionally certified, why do we even have that language in there? And it, it, because if we're only going to claim for those that are certified, then I think that our contract ought to be very clear because that's what we do, that's what our intent is, whether or not the state would allow for that or not. I think that needs to be, be stricken, from the, stricken from the information or the, the language. Is that? That language was included as part of the Secretary of State's standard contract to us. Yeah. We, that's why we've highlighted it and put it in the board letter to um, draw attention to that uh, for the board. Um, I can't think of an instance where we would use um, non-certified or, or conditionally certified, um, but there are some things that aren't necessarily certified, which could be ballot boxes and some of these other yeah. things. So, well, so I, not necessarily systems that are referred to that truly get certified by the Secretary of State. Okay, no, it, it, but I think it's clear. If I look at paragraph two on page two, uh, yes. it says qualifying expenditures, which again goes to what the Secretary of State has put forward, include voting systems that have been certified or conditionally certified pursuant to the California voting system standards. It goes on to, to list a whole lot of things. Since we are only either acquiring and or utilizing and then claiming for certified voting systems, not to some of the, other, the pertinent materials that might be used or equipment, um, I think that we ought to be really clear because it, it, it's been said here uh, on, on, on the record, but that's not what the staff report says. It doesn't say we just use certified systems, if I, unless it's elsewhere here that I'm not reading that. So I want to make it clear. And again, we won't claim for that, but I think, you know, I think it needs to be a better record. So. And I think the contract is not something we can change because it's a Secretary of State contract, but we could certainly clarify yep. in a staff report what our intentions yeah, are. Yeah, I, I think so, because again, you made it very clear, Ann, right from the get-go this morning, and I just think it's important to point that out, so. Okay, um, so this is basically an extension of time, recognizing obviously what we've heard from folks this morning, but for to claim for those things that would be allowable under the Secretary of State's uh, contract with this, with this county and probably with other counties. Um, but for the record, we are only, as it relates to the voting systems, are only certified voting systems um, that we would be uh, claiming for and utilizing. I think it's more than it's claiming for is what we utilize. Okay. All right. So any other questions or comments? We do have a motion uh, and a second. And I think we've heard comments by um, several members of the board. And uh, with that, then, um, if there's nothing further, then I would ask uh, the clerk to please call, the, call for the vote. Unanimous vote. Okay. All right. Again, uh, we appreciate all of you with us this morning, those that have weighed in, and certainly the information you've shared, and uh, it sounds like we're going to be some additional follow-up on that. So, all right. 
That concludes item 16. We still have uh, the consent calendar and we do have another speaker on item uh, 43, if we could call that item, please. Item 43, the authority to amend and increase an expenditure agreement with the Regents of the University of California by $470,721 for the term ending June 30th, 2023 to add an internal medicine specialist to the sexual health clinic and clinical research coordinators for monkeypox treatment coordination. Okay, so I have Blanca Hurtado. Blanca. Hi, yes. Um, for item number 43, I it's just not clear to me why the county needs more funds related to monkeypox. I'm looking at the agenda and it's under social services. So a couple meetings ago, or maybe the last meeting ago, I know we talked about a mobile crisis unit. Um, like this money could go to a mobile crisis unit for citizens who are struggling with mental health. Um, if there's not enough people that want to work in that section, a mobile crisis unit, uh, maybe we have to reevaluate what we're offering in these jobs because I don't see the need for a monkeypox provider, a medicine specialist, but I do see a need for a mobile crisis unit. So this money, $470,000, 470, I can't even say it, but 400 plus thousand dollars. Or better yet, I mean, we had IHSS workers here talking about how they need a living wage and that could easily fall under social services. People in our community who are hurting, who are needing care, receiving care, or need the funds just to live in Sacramento County. So that's my comment for that. It's like, no, this money can go somewhere else. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Blanca. Okay, do we have any other comments on item 43? No, we don't. Okay, do we have any other uh, commenters and any other items on the consent no. calendar? I'm gonna close this one. Okay, all right, so we have no other callers. Uh, and uh, then we have the balance of the consent calendar as, as noted uh, in the clerk's. Uh, we dropped item 20, we've acted on item 16. And uh, so with that, a uh, motion would be in order. I'll move uh, approval of the remaining consent items. Okay, we have a motion. Second. Okay, it's moving second to uh, <clears throat> approve the balance of the consent calendar. Um, again, we have no speakers. Um, Flo, we have nobody on the phone, right? No. Okay, I'm sorry, good. Please vote. The unanimous vote. Uh, for items two through 61, and please note for the record that items 16 and 20 does have, they have separate votes. Very good. Okay, all right, with that then, I know we have some presentations, and again, thank folks uh, for uh, their uh, patience this morning. Um, Supervisor Natoli? Yes. Um, could I have a moment to comment on number nine and 10? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. I, That's yeah, okay. I, I, did, I was just looking to my notes, yes. Did, we made a couple of appointments and I know that Ann wanted to introduce folks uh, in the audience, so my apologies. That's all right, thank yeah. you, Supervisor <laughs> Natoli. Um, first of all, um, Madam Clerk, do we still have uh, Jennifer um, Hernandez on the phone? I know she said she might not be able to be here past 11. Ms. Hernandez, are you still on the line? I'm guessing not. Um, okay. She did indicate she would have to sign off at 11 a.m. Um, I'll just say a few words about her. Um, uh, the, I'm happy to recommend at least the city has to recommend this as well, and they're doing so today. But um, we are recommending Jennifer Hernandez um, to be the new executive director for the executive director for the Sacramento Employment and Training Agency. Um, the city and county jointly hired a recruiter uh, to select Ms. Hernandez. Uh, the pan initial panel was comprised of community members, external partner agencies, city and county executive staff, and representatives from the governing boards. Finalists referred, were referred to me and to Howard Chan, the city manager, and we are happy to jointly recommend Jennifer Hernandez. She has 20 years of executive level management experience, which includes leading both public and private organizations. She currently serves as the deputy director for the Family Engagement and Empowerment Division for the State of California Department of Social Services, overseeing CalWORKs, CalFresh, and Child and Adult Care Food Program. Prior to her current role, she served as the Associate Secretary for the state's Labor and Workforce Development Agency, Farm Worker and Immigrant Services. 
Ms. Hernandez has a master's degree in public policy as well as a bachelor's degree in international politics. Uh, we are fortunate to be able to bring her on. She will be, start in the middle of November. We offer our congratulations, certainly, uh, again, uh, we weren't able to hear from her this morning and recognizing time constraints, but uh, uh, again, I know that uh, both Supervisor and Kennedy and I serve on the set of boards, so we'll get a chance to meet her in person, uh, yes. uh, or at least um, virtually, uh, <laughs> in, in a very short amount of time, but I think it would probably be a good opportunity at some point, once she's uh, situated uh, in her position, maybe invite her to come before the board and talk yes. about the uh, um, the Sacramento Employment Training Agency, some of the initiatives, obviously they're critical in both workforce training, but certainly in the Head Start program and um, do a tremendous job uh, in a lot of respects as a partner in this in this community. So we welcome Jennifer to her new position and uh, look forward Agreed. to Agreed, and I would also yeah. like to just take a very brief moment yeah. to thank uh, Denise Lee for her um, almost year-long service um, as the interim director. She's she's done a great <clears> job. Yep, yeah. I, I, I would echo that and thank you, um, Ann, for that. Uh, Denise has been with the agency for well over 30 years, and uh, I know um, certainly uh, <clears throat> and Patrick and I, because of our <clears throat> service on the SETA board, have a chance to hear from her on a regular basis, certainly in her interim capacity during the last year, but um, her work with Head Start has just been exemplary and uh, uh, reaches a lot of folks uh, and a lot of children and families in this community, but uh, appreciate her uh, keeping, uh, you know, uh, things steady at the helm while this process was under, uh, undertaken, so. Yeah. Agreed, thank you. Thanks. Okay, moving on to item number 10, um, which is the recommendation to appoint Tim Lutz as our new health director. As you all know, uh, Siobhan Katari was uh, promoted to her current position as Deputy County Executive for Social Services, leaving that position vacant. Um, again, we have done extensive outreach and recruitment efforts to fill this position. Um, our initial panel included county executive staff as well as multiple external panel members. And then final interviews were conducted by Ms. Katari and myself. Uh, Mr. Lutz has nearly 20 years of public service experience leading social services programs, including over 12 years of executive management experience. He is currently the agency director of the Tulare County Health and Human Service Agency. He also spent time in Calaveras County as the county administrative officer, as well as director of fiscal operations for the Tulare County Health and Human Services Agency as well as the executive director of the King's Tulare Agen Area Agency on Aging. In addition to his wealth of experience, Mr. Lutz has a master's degree in business administration, as well as a bachelor's degree in psychology. And uh, both Ms. Katari and I are very, very pleased uh, to bring him on to um, our ever-growing new executive team. And I think he's gonna be a wonderful addition to the team. And Mr. Lutz, would you like to say a few words? Good morning, Tim. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, first, thank you, Anne, for the kind words. Appreciate that. Um, it's truly an honor to be here today. Um, I'm really excited um, in receiving this appointment um, and also just noting growing up in this area, um, I feel like I'm, I'm coming home. Um, and it's truly um, an honor to be serving um, this community, the residents of the county, um, and um, the, the um, board and Anne's team. Um, I would like to thank Anne and Siobhan for um, a really great interview process. I'm truly transparent. Um, I felt through that onboarding process, through that, um, I could learn a lot about the, the department, the program, some, some things coming um, up. And um, it feels really great to be coming on to a really supportive leadership team. I'm looking forward to helping to implement Anne and Siobhan's vision for um, health services. Knowing that we do have a lot of tough work, um, and I, I like tough work. Um, I know I'm going to be spending a lot of time um, getting to dig into the department in the next um, few months. I'm really um, talking to our community providers, talking to our county leadership team, and um, understanding some of our, our challenges and, and working on strategies to help um, continue the work that we've been doing. Um, lastly, I just want to um, thank my family, particularly my amazing wife, um, and two little girls who are supportive and enthusiastic about, um, you know, uprooting and relocating. Um, so they couldn't be here today, but again, um, really 
could not do this without their wonderful support. And again, Great. thank you. Well, Tim, we, we welcome you to Sacramento and certainly certainly to the uh, county team. Certainly welcome your family here as well and uh, look forward to the opportunity to, uh, as you said, to you know work with our uh, county executive and, uh, uh, and with Ms. Kuthlari and certainly others. Uh, and public health and health uh, in general is very, very key and critical to a lot of what the county uh, does every day and certainly delivery of services, programs, funding, and um, a variety of partnerships that we have. And so uh, you're a welcome addition and we uh, uh, look forward to working with you. Unfortunately, I won't get the opportunities. I'm a short timer now, but uh, um, uh, look forward to your leadership in the years to come. I know it'll be well received. So congratulations to you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Supervisor Natoli. Yes. I also um, yeah. really need to thank Sandy Damiano who stepped in to cover this really critical position in a really critical time. I've known Sandy for a very long time and she always steps up and rises to the occasion. She delayed her retirement in order to help us. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge the work that she's done over the previous months. Great. Well, we would again extend our thanks and I'm glad you highlighted that as well. So has she, is she retired now? Not yet. Oh, She's going to okay. continue to help out through yeah. the transition. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, she, but she did, in fact, yeah. delay in order okay. to help us out, and Great. we greatly appreciate Great. that. Uh, again, I work with Sandy. Certainly, I know others have, but certainly for many years, and appreciate her work in, <clears throat> in, in many different realms, but certainly in providing for important health services to our community members. So. Okay, with that, then um, we uh, congratulate <clears throat> one more time uh, Jennifer Hernandez and uh, Timothy Lutz uh, on their appointments, and uh, thank uh, both uh, Sandy and Denise uh, for their work in the interim intervening time. So, okay, and did you have anything else you wanted to, to add? Okay, all right, with that, then uh, we're going to um, keep uh, moving forward. I'm uh, going to go to our 10 o'clock item. How's that? Um, <laughs> uh, item 62, if you want to call it, Madam Clerk. Item 62 is the presentation of resolution recognizing October 2022 as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Very good, and I believe Supervisor Frost, do you have a presentation you'd like to make? Yes, so? and I would like to invite all Be Aware um, individuals who are here to join me at the podium. Great. Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to invite Courtney and Julie, who are with I'll Be Aware, an organization that is um, trying to advocate for uh, breast cancer awareness and provide, you know, mammograms and treatment for people in the underserved areas of our county. And I wanted to just say briefly, uh, breast can when I first was asked to do this, I thought, oh, I guess I'm the logical one. I'm the only woman on the board. <laughs> but uh, then I remembered that one of my mom's cousins, who was a man, had breast cancer and died from breast cancer. And so uh, I, I want to say that breast cancer touches all of us in one way or another. And your work is vital and important because we want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity and it's people don't always have the insurance to get a mammogram so that's a big deal for people and i'd like to um, just go ahead and read this proclamation before i present it and um and and really um proclaiming october 2022 as breast cancer awareness month in Sacramento County. Whereas, I'll be aware Breast Cancer Foundation is committed to supporting those who are facing breast cancer, and October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And whereas, I'll be aware a Sacramento nonprofit organization was founded in 2004 in memory of Alberta Albie Carson, who died from breast cancer, and whereas holds a mission to provide the life-saving breast cancer testing, prevention, education, advocacy, and compassionate support. 
Breast cancer is the most common form of internal cancer in women and the second most cause of cancer and death in women in the US. And while most cases of breast cancer are diagnosed in women, more than 2,000 new cases of breast cancer are diagnosed in American men each year. And whereas, according to the CDC, breast cancer remains the leading cause of cancer death among Hispanic women, black women have a higher rate of death from breast cancer than white women, and early, detec early detection offers the best chance of effective treatment. And I'll be aware is providing mammogram services and breast health information to individuals living in areas with the lowest mammogram rates in Sacramento County, meaning those that don't have the opportunity to get a, a mammogram. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors for the County of Sacramento, State of California, joins with communities and people from throughout California and the nation by proclaiming the month of October 2022 as Breast Cancer Awareness Month in Sacramento County and further expresses its thanks and appreciation to I'll Be Aware Breast Cancer Foundation for their commitment and compassionate work in helping those affected and their families in battling to overcome cancer uh, in the community, in their families, and in the community. And at this time, I, I would like to present this uh, proclamation that has been signed by all of our board members on behalf of the board, and thank you for your work. And you may want to say a couple words afterwards. And thank I don't you. know if you want to get a picture. It'd be um, wonderful. Yeah. Is there, do you have someone here that, yeah. oh, my. Perfect. Great. Yeah, man. <laughs> You want to get on? Um, yeah, yeah where, that's yeah, perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Would you like to say a couple of <clears> words? <throat> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Courtney Quinn. I'm the executive director for the Albia Aware Breast Cancer Foundation. I'm also a breast cancer survivor. Um, so thank you all for how, how, doing for this proclamation. It's very important for us um, because I'm absolutely certain in your, you, some of your constituents uh, are facing breast cancer or they're individuals who need a reminder of a mammogram. We know in the US more than 9 million individuals miss their cancer screenings um, throughout the pandemic. And so this is an important reminder for your constituents to also, you know, get their mammograms. I also want to leave with you um, some stats on what's happening in your own um, in your own districts um, related to mammograms and breast cancer. It's going to also include our information in it too. So if you have questions, we're happy to do follow up on meetings too. Um, but a couple of things I do want to make sure you're aware of is Sacramento County right now, unfortunately, has a higher death rate due to breast cancer than the state and the nation's average. So it's really important that we are addressing this issue um, directly. And then I'm also included information on your mammogram rates in your district. If you see anything at s below 78%, that means it's in the top 15 uh, zip codes that are uh, with the lowest mammogram rates in Sacramento County. So that's what we're specifically targeting by bringing um, mammograms uh, to those communities, um, also targeting awareness and additionally through breast health classes too. Um, and so as you're out in the world, if you hear of in somebody who needs uh, breast cancer support or services, needs to get a mammogram, please encourage them to contact I'll Be Aware because we can help them get you know, the support through government programs. Um, sometimes insurance doesn't cover an, um, someone's mammogram or they don't know where to start or they have a breast health question, we're here. And that's what I'll Be Aware does. Thank you very much. Anyone have any questions or want additional information? Great. Courtney, I think Supervisor Cernan wanted to weigh in, so. Yeah. yeah Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, certainly appreciative to uh, Supervisor Frost for bringing this resolution forward to um, appropriately uh, acknowledge and, and recognize um, the, uh, the month as uh, breast cancer awareness and, and specifically to uh, present that to I'll be aware. I'm very familiar with the organization. Um, in years past, I've had the honor of presenting uh, similar uh, resolutions. And I just want to reflect on the fact that as someone who lost their uh, mother 
stepmother, aunt, and grandmother in a nine-year span, all to breast cancer. Um, I can't say it strongly enough uh, in terms of uh, the, imp the import of early detection. So I'm really um, glad that you're taking the opportunity to um, remind everyone, and not just women, that uh, this is uh, a disease that is all too prevalent in our communities. And um, I think the best defense is making sure that, uh, as your um, nonprofit name uh, alludes to, that everyone is aware that there is um, a, greater, a much greater chance at survival and uh, successful treatment uh, when the diagnosis is caught early. So um, really appreciate all that you do. And as someone that pre-COVID, uh, I uh, had participated for years in the Real Men Wear Pink uh, campaign. Um, I'm glad that we're again getting back on track and making sure that we acknowledge our nonprofit partners that are doing such great work. So thank you. Thank you, and I'm sorry for your loss, and we'll make sure to get some more pink on you as well. Great, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Courtney. Any other comments? Uh, Sir, I think we all join Courtney, certainly in the proclamation, thanking Albie Aware for its work. And I think those demographics will be important, and hopefully through our own conduits, we can help get more information out about the availability and accessibility to uh, early detection. And again, uh, thank you so much for, for being here today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Supervisor Frost. Then let's go to our next item, which is item 63, Is a, and I'll have you call that item, please. Uh, item 63 is the presentation by the Delta Protection Commission on the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta National Heritage Area. Great. And as uh, uh, Bruce Blodger, Executive Director for the Commission, and uh, Blake Roberts, Dr. Roberts, are in, coming to the uh, podium, would just want to... Uh, um, acknowledge uh, certainly the effort. Uh, Bruce is uh, fairly new to his role, uh, and he'll get a chance to make some comments here, but uh, we appreciate uh, his leadership, and uh, Dr. Roberts has been with the commission for some years, and we'll have a brief overview today, but I would just uh, kind of just note that uh, we are uh, one of only, I think, three national heritage areas on the whole West Coast, and I want to get ahead of Bruce on this, but the only one in California, and uh, I think it highlights uh, the importance and relevance of what this board has been aware of for many years. I want to thank my colleagues and, and our county staff for uh, their support, certainly for the engagement of this county, uh, its representation on certainly um, not only on <clears throat> the commission, but certainly on the conservancy, but the work that we've done uh, collaboratively to, I think, uh, bring focus to the importance of uh, the very uh, significant geographic area in the county, but one that has a great history uh, and certainly uh, many uh, economic contributors to um, to this county. And so uh, with that, I'm going to turn to Bruce, let him make some opening comments, and then I know Dr. Roberts has a, a brief overview that will be shared, but I think it will highlight again some of the importance of the work that goes on at the commission, but also uh, this county has been very much a part of. So, Bruce, good morning. Perfect. Thank you so much, yeah. Chair Natoli, members of the board. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and honored to be here. I am a Sacramento County resident and I live in Elk Grove. My family used to farm here in Sacramento County in the Slough House area and also still have a ranch in Amador County. Uh, and we had ownership of a ranch or a farm out in the Delta in the Cortland area. That picture over there looks really familiar. <laughs> the pairs. So uh, that's where my mom grew up, was in Cortland. And so long history in the Delta, long history. Uh, in agriculture. I see the crop reports coming up. That's a good day yes. yeah. uh, in every county to go through the crop report. <laughs> uh, previous to this, I was the San Joaquin County Farm Bureau's executive director. So I would be at the Board of Supervisors hearing every year with the crop report and reporters would be badgering me all the way out the door. <laughs> so it was uh, always a good day to, to get those numbers and see those numbers and tell that story. And you tell a lot of stories uh, with that crop report. For us, one of those stories we told in San Joaquin County was the loss of the asparagus industry, really. Mm. Uh, we're down to just a couple hundred acres. That was something that was 50 or 60,000 acres in our county alone. And now it's a couple hundred. Mm. So you, you do get the chance to get some tremendous news, growth in wine grapes, growth in, growth in almonds, growth in certain commodities, but you also get some other stories. So, so that's a little bit of background about me. Obviously, I come from an agricultural perspective. Ironically, worked on the Delta Protection Act when it passed in 1992. Was a staff person for the County Farm Bureau, and it created the commission. And 30 years later, now I'm the executive director. So, who knew? Um, 
with that, that's enough of me talking. You're here to hear about the Heritage Area. This is tremendous, and as the chairman noted, the only one in the state of California. So we have Dr. Blake Roberts, who's gonna go through the presentation. I'm gonna have to exit at some point here to get to another meeting, but you're in good hands with Blake. Thank you, Bruce. Good morning, Mike. Or good afternoon now, so. Thanks. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Natoli, uh, members of the board. I'm really uh, excited to be here today because uh, specifically Chair Natoli had asked us to uh, come out and talk to different uh, boards of supervisors around uh, the five county Delta region just to, to let people know about the National Heritage Area, let, let uh, you know what's gonna be happening over the next uh, few years. Um, so uh, next slide, please. I think you have control. Oh, you have the oh, clicker, have you control have the clicker there. Wow. You're, you're, you're in charge, Blake. Wow. Okay, thank you. Oh, cool. that would be appreciated. <laughs> Great. Um, so the National Park Service has a very long and complicated uh, explanation of what the National Heritage Area is, but uh, I think I'll just boil it down to really the most important parts, and that is it's an area that is so important in terms of the national history, national heritage, whether it's from natural reasons, cultural reasons, or a mix of these. Uh, and so Congress actually designates uh, national heritage areas. Uh, we were lucky enough to be designated in 2019, uh, along with the two other uh, West Coast uh, national heritage areas in Washington State. Um, so as I mentioned, um, this national heritage areas uh, have traditionally been uh, kind of an East Coast, Midwestern thing. Uh, as you can see on this map, it's a little hard to see, but most of them are East in the Mississippi. But uh, over time, there's been more and more uh, coming through, uh, coming to the West. And so we're really excited that we can sort of be on the vanguard of national heritage areas uh, in the area. They're really important uh, for many regions uh, all these regions have really strong uh, organizations that, that support their national heritage areas, and it's really done on the local level. Even though we get federal support, it really is a local partnership. So here's just a, a brief explanation of the, the boundaries. They are a little complicated, uh, but what I will uh, mention, at least in Sacramento County, uh, is that it really includes an area that is uh, kind of it, I, we always kind of refer to the, the Delta as the tail in Sacramento County. Uh, and so it really uh, has most of the, the area uh, that you really think of as the Delta and pretty much from Freeport uh, down south all the way to, to Sherman Island. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a pretty long uh, area. It goes all the way to Vallejo and Hercules uh, in the west. So... In terms of the planning cycle, how does a national heritage area work and how does the, the, the system work? Initially, there's a feasibility study uh, that was completed uh, for us in 2012. That really just sort of provides the case for why we should be a national heritage area. Luckily, Congress thought that we were, we were worthwhile, and so in 2019, we were actually declared as national heritage area. Uh, so the next work that we have to do is our management plan, uh, and really that's been the focus of our work over the last few years. Uh, and then once we finish our management plan, that allows us to do uh, the types of projects that we wanna do. And then finally, at the end of the initial 15 year period, we're supposed to do sort of an evaluate, uh, evaluation of where we are. Uh, many national heritage areas are actually in the process of being uh, renewed right now. So we're really excited about uh, the possibility of that. So I'll just give you a, a brief rundown of what's in the management plan. It really, speaks to the diverse, the diversity of the area. Uh, and so I don't think I have to tell you about how diverse uh, the area is just in terms of uh, race and culture and uh, income. Uh, there's so many parts of the, the Delta that we wanna celebrate. Uh, and I think that diversity is important a part for us. We also consider uh, government plans and treaty rights. That's uh, really, 
the National Heritage Area does not have any regulatory role at all, um, but we want to make sure that we recognize the importance of general plans uh, and other uh, other things that uh, the county has put together. Uh, for example, uh, the Sa work of SACOG has done on active transportation. These are all important to us. In terms of the actual components, one of the things we do is we do an inf inventory of all the important resources in the area. And then we develop recommendations for what we want to do going forward. We have an interpretive plan, which really is the stories. What are the stories of the area and how we're going to tell those stories? Uh, obviously, funding and implementation are really important because we want to be an organization that does something, and that's really important to us. Blake, if I could just real quick sure. on the funding. So once the management plan is, is completed, submitted to the Department of Interior, and assuming that it's approved, then we are eligible to compete for funding on the national level uh, for um, funding that's been set aside for national heritage areas. Is that correct? Correct. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there are currently, we currently receive about $150,000 from the federal government, uh, and we have to match that one to one. Uh, so we've typically been doing that with our agency funds right now. Um, but once we have our management plan completed, we expect that to in at least increase to 300,000, uh, although I know one of the things that um, many of the National Heritage areas have been shooting for is at least a, a sort of a basement of 500,000 mm. for National Heritage areas. Great. Uh, so what kind of activities uh, might we do? Uh, there's historic preservation uh, work. Uh, we've been uh, working in some of our communities, um, including uh, one a pr project in Isleton uh, that is sort of focused on historic preservation, cultural conservation as well. So uh, the you know this uh, this particular picture shows uh, Dancer and Lock. Um, the culture of that area is obviously in really important to the the Delta as a whole and to Sacramento County. Uh, education and interpretation, uh, telling the stories to um, people all of all ages. Uh, development of recreational assets. Most people know the Delta because of recreation, and so obviously we want to support that. Uh, nature conservation. Uh, don't have to tell you uh, what a what a rich treasure that the, the Delta is in terms of, of nature. Uh, it's right along the Pacific Flyway and plays an important role in, uh, in birds and fish. Uh, tourism and economic development are obviously things that are important to uh, Sacramento County and uh, to the Delta as a whole. Oh, sorry, I went backwards. Uh, so in terms of what we've done out, uh, to date, uh, we created an advisory committee uh, back, uh, I guess it's been almost two years that we've had our advisory committee, and then we've also had, uh, underneath that, we've had task groups that have sort of served as uh, subcommittees uh, to the advisory committee. And we've been, that's really where we've been doing a, a lot of our activity is working with them, trying to sort out what exactly will be our priorities. Uh, we've done tribal consultation, uh, and we've done public workshops. Uh, actually, we did uh, two last year, uh, sort of when we were in a window where there was, uh, we were allowed to do uh, uh, an in-person workshop, and, and thankfully we were able to do that in Benicia and in Walnut Grove. Uh, we also have a Delta Heritage Forum conference, which we do annually. Uh, this year's, I'll just put in a plug, this year's is going to be on November 3rd. Uh, and then we've done online surveys and interviews as well. There's really no, I mean, I, I list potential partners here, but really there's no limit to uh, which partners might be involved in the National Heritage Area. Um, really, we consider this, a National Heritage Area is really our, uh, a local partnership. Uh, that's what their focus is. Uh, that's the reason why we're called, in, the, in our legislation, a local coordinating entity. Our role is to really coordinate with a number of different organizations and to do work that we want to all want to do. And so that is really, I think, the secret sauce of, of National Heritage Areas is that we are able to work with a wide variety and to get things done. So I just want to give you a brief rundown of what we're doing with the management plan. Uh, right now, we're sort of in the, hopefully in the final stretches of, of finishing up a draft of the management plan. That will go to uh, the commission uh, that Supervisor Natoli is on, although 
unfortunately, it might get to him and, you know, a little too late. Um, but it won't, uh, won't get to me, was what yeah, you're saying. So exactly. I'll be gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, and one of the things that we are uh, doing right now is that we're reaching out to different partners, such as Sacramento County, in order to uh, get uh, sort of get letters of support and really provide um, some basis to tell the National Park Service that, you know, we're we're in this for the long haul and that we have a lot of partners to work with. So we will be coming back uh, to the board uh, to, to seek those sort of letters of support. Uh, and then we will uh, finish the draft plan uh, and then we will do a public review um, probably in uh, late winter, spring. Uh, once the commission has uh, signed off on that, then it will go to the National Park Service and the Secretary of Interior for a formal approval. So hopefully, um, about a year from now, hopefully we will have a, a final management plan. And uh, I think one of the things that we're already trying to do is work on projects that, uh, that will move the Delta forward and let people know what a wonderful place it is. So with that, um, if you have any questions. Great, thanks Blake. Let me go to my colleagues, any questions or comments? Uh, Supervisor Frost. I have a question regarding your potential partners, are those partners in that specific area of the Delta where you're located? We don't, um, prim primarily in the Delta, but uh, we recognize that the story of the area is, uh, covers a lot of ground, uh, even those areas that are specifically outside of the boundaries. So for example, okay. downtown Sacramento and the city of Sacramento is unfortunately not in the boundaries, but we still want to be able to partner with organizations in Sacramento just to be able to tell uh, those important stories. Um, you know, the gold rush uh, is a perfect example of, uh, of a story that involved many different cities and many different regions of the state. Yeah, um, and then the last question is on, on the potential partners you listed land trusts, is that like a federal land trust or a personal land trust or what does that mean? We just use that as an example. Uh, I know that Marin County has a very active land trust. So we're just, I, I know that there's a possibility. So that's that's part of the reason why we put that in there. Is that a public land trust or? Uh, yeah, sometimes public, sometimes they, they come in different forms. Oh, okay. Yeah. Utilizing that as a form of um, security for their land, basically. Right, right, okay, right. got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? Um, if not, uh, Blake, I would just thank you for again for your work. I know you've been steeped in this for uh, uh, several years. Obviously, you have very capable colleagues that assist, and uh, I think the outreach to the community has been um, outstanding. And I think you know working at the level with you know five <laughs> five counties, certainly the areas covered by the National Heritage Area, which goes much beyond. Uh, you know, just the uh, the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. It includes obviously the Sisian Marsh and uh, uh, you know some of the portions of the Bay as well. And I, I again, I think it's a, a net positive. And, and I know, as you mentioned, getting letters of support. Uh, you know, <clears throat> whether I'm still here uh, on the board or not, I do think uh, you know, I have great confidence. I don't think I have great confidence in this county. We'll continue to be supportive of the efforts and, you know, certainly working through my colleagues, through the county executive, uh, and uh, whoever succeeds me to uh, assure that you've got that ongoing support. And so I think the communication on, on this is, is, is really important because I think it bodes well for, for the Delta and for a lot of the things that uh, are uh, real treasures as a part of a very treasured place. But also, I think, you know, Bruce alluded to in his comments as things evolve in the agriculture or <coughs> recreation, certainly uh, in the environmental stewardship. Uh, all those things are really important. I want to thank my colleague, Supervisor Kennedy, too, for his. He's been uh, uh, the, the a backup to me on all the commissions. I think he's attended, I, I know he attended one at Oakley years ago <laughs> when I, was, I wasn't able to make it, but uh, has uh, been very engaged in the Delta County's coalition and uh, certainly uh, has served as my alternate on the Conservancy as well as the commission. And uh, obviously that'll turn over first of the year, but uh, I think you can be, remain confident because I know this board in its entirety uh, in the present uh, <clears throat> makeup, but certainly in the past, has been uh, very supportive of doing things that enhance the Delta, I think highlight the way of life, but also uh, you know, position us well for the future. So I, again, thank you for your efforts. Uh, Supervisor Kennedy. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to actually echo what uh, Supervisor Cerna said some uh, meetings back, and, and that's that uh, 
um, should I continue to be involved at the will of the board on this issue, uh, you can expect phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I always take your call, Mr. Kennedy. So, and uh, something on the Delta, I always take calls from folks. So, thank you very much, though. Well, Blake, again, uh, keep us apprised. I think uh, you know regular communications obviously are important. Uh, you know, Ann certainly and, and her uh, lead staff at the administrative level have taken real interest, and we've dedicated resources to stay engaged in all matters Delta. But uh, this is this is an important effort and one that took many years. In fact, I think you know it was talked about in the. Uh, Delta Reform Act uh, in uh, uh, 2009, and uh, certainly Senator Feinstein and Congressman Garamendi, who were leads on this, uh, kept it in the you know <clears throat> in the hopper, and uh, then it obviously uh, you know when the time was right, it was approved by Congress and signed by the President, and, and, and here we are. So with the good work that goes on, so congratulations, and uh, look forward to the uh, final product, and to uh, you know I think uh, uh, continue to focus and highlight very positive aspects of, uh, you know, of the Delta and all that it means to, to the people of this county and people of the state of California. So. Thank you. Thanks. You bet. Thanks, Blake. Okay. Nothing further? Yeah. There we go. All right. <laughs> very good. Okay. Um, we'll go to our, we have any callers or any co public comment? Okay. No callers. All right. I know we had next we were going to actually have the, the crop and livestock report, but I guess that's going to get put over till November the 8th. Is that correct? Yeah, we're going to continue that. But we do November have our 8th. partners from UC Davis and from our cooperative extension that are going to do a presentation. Yeah, they'll yeah. do the next item. Right. Uh, right. Can I get a motion to continue this? So moved. Good. Second. Okay, moving second. This is item 64, uh, the crop and livestock report. It'll be, I think it's going to be put over to the 8th? Yeah, to November 8th. Okay, very That's the motion. Then. Please vote. And unanimous vote. Okay. All and right. Item one. 65 is the University of California Cooperative Extension Multi-County Partnership presentation. Great. And we have our folks here from the university and uh, you see some familiar faces and some new faces as well. So but we've had a very long presence in this community going back to 1911, if I'm not mistaken. So it, uh, you know, over 100 years of, of cooperation uh, with uh, the uh, Cooperative Extension in different formats. But and I'll turn to our presenter. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, actually. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, Chairman Natoli, members of the board and the public, um, thanks a lot for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Susan Ellsworth. I am the county director for UC Cooperative Extension in Sacramento, Solano, and Yolo counties. Um, before I dive in, I want to quickly uh, recognize and thank um, my staff back here who have hung in there uh, through a very interesting morning um, <laughs> and whom I'll refer to throughout this presentation. You, 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 now you know what supervisors uh, have their hands in in lots of different ways. So, <laughs> sure yeah, do. Yeah. Um, since it's been a little while um, since our last presentation before you, I wanted to take a moment to recall our mission as the University of California Cooperative Extension. So we, uh, Cooperative Extension, there we go. Cooperative Extension was um, created in 1915 through the Smith-Lever Act with the goal essentially of taking the university to the public. It uh, intended and still functions um, as a partnership between federal, state, county, and local governments. Um, and it really works to leverage resources from all of these uh, partners to bring the UC's land grant mission um, and resources to the public, and critically, to bring the needs of the public back to the university. Cooperative Extension has been operating in Sacramento County since 1917. I went too far back. I said 1911, but uh, still it's 100, 100 years plus, so. Long yeah, time. Long time. Thanks. Sue. So um, for about eight decades um, since our inception, uh, Cooperative Extension in Sacramento really thrived, uh, extending research-based programming and ser serving community needs. However, budget cuts, uh, which many of us experienced over the course of the last 20 years, had the effect of um, diminishing staffing and capacity. In 2014, 
leadership within County Cooperative Extension made the strategic decision to combine administratively across Yolo, Solano, and Sacramento to form what we refer to as the Capital Corridor Multi-County Partnership, or MCP. The idea here was that pooling funds would enable us to more efficiently leverage resources across our three counties, which in fact it has done. Um, the MCP is supported by, supported and guided by an advisory committee, which includes a member of the Board of Supervisors from each county, um, which here is uh, Supervisor Natoli, um, as well as a representative from the County Executive's Office um, and the Ag Commissioner. Um, so this committee meets twice annually uh, to kind of talk about programming as well as to think about budget needs, um, which are then agreed upon and negotiated through each county's individual budget process. So what you see here is a snapshot of our 2020-21 budget by source. Um, and I apologize, these are a little, a little old. Um, we are about to get our, our new numbers, which I'm happy to share with the board when we have them. But um, this, is, this is relatively representative of what the, the breakdown looks like um, with county contributions consisting of somewhere between 20 and 25%. So as I just noted, Cooperative Extension is just emerging from a relatively long period of diminished resources. Um, very happily for us, um, 2021 saw a major increase in state support, which effectively brought us back to pre-COVID funding levels. Um, it included a 5% increase, essentially for, for cost of living, as well as a, um, an ongoing augmentation of 32 million. So in addition to um, enabling significant hiring and um, program expansion statewide, uh, we are thrilled that this funding is going to enable us to um, bring on four new advisors uh, serving Sacramento, which essentially means four new program areas. A little close here. Um, so this funding additionally will mean resources to support some of our core volunteer um, and youth education programs, mostly in the form of administrative and management support. Oops. So getting into what we actually do, um, a couple programs that many of you are probably familiar with. Um, for over 100 years, uh, Sacramento County 4-H has delivered hands-on learning where youth and adults work together to uh, really affect community change. Um, we offer a, a number of outstanding after-school programs, which include youth experiences in science, 4-H on the wild side, which is an environmental education program, 4-H water wizards, and cooking academy. Um, we provide a resident camp day camps, and what many of us are most familiar with, which is our community club program. Um, despite uh, COVID and its toll on programs like this, we still had a remarkable 581 club members in 21-22 and served over 1,200 youth and after-school programs. Another um, exciting and growing program area for us is our community nutrition and health program, which is really focused on engaging underserved communities in the areas of healthy eating and an active lifestyle. And this program has historically been primarily funded through our expanded food and nutrition education program, or FNEP. However, um, now includes some really substantial funding from CalFresh Healthy Living, um, which is in the process of launching a program this year. So you'll hear more from us about that. But combined, um, these programs leveraged over $700,000 in federal funding to support this kind of work um, in Sacramento last year, last fiscal year. Um, in addition to our wonderful 4-H um, nutrition, 4-H staff and nutrition staff, some of whom are here today, um, we are fortunate to have advisors supporting both of these programs. So Marcel Horowitz serves as our um, team lead for nutrition and Mary Ann Bird for 4-H. 
You want to raise your hand so everybody knows? I know some yeah, of you. Yeah, please that. do. Please do. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so another couple programs that you're probably pretty familiar with are Master Gardeners work to extend research-based home gardening information to the public. Um, like many community programs, um, our master gardeners and master food preservers did a really fantastic job of pivoting to virtual programming over the last two years, um, however, are very happily getting back to in-person. Uh, last year, 216 master gardeners... Hard to tend to garden virtually, though, right? Very true. <laughs> I'm kidding you. But probably if anyone could, they could. <laughs> um, last year, 216 certified volunteers provided over 1,200 hours of service to the Sacramento community, including the upkeep of the gorgeous Fair Oaks Horticultural Center. They also produced uh, 42 educational videos, which you can still find online, and worked to continually staff the Master Gardener helpline and, um, and help desk. The Master Food Preservers um, are another volunteer-driven program with the goal of teaching research-based best practices um, for safe home food preservation. As of this year, the Master Food Preservers had 38 certified volunteers who provided more than almost 1,500 hours of training and technical assistance to the public, as well as 25 classes related to home food preservation. Can I just ask, because I know that COVID certainly had an impact on it, but uh, one of the things that I would note from some of the, certainly the country fairs and festivals throughout the county, uh, you know, <clears throat> that uh, oftentimes uh, uh, the food preservers were there, sometimes the master gardeners, but um, yeah, just a really important resource and a way to, I think, broaden the understanding. So is that integrated into the program? Again, it's, you're still relying on volunteers, but I think it's a really important way to, uh, particularly in communities that where you have, you know, a presence of 4-H, but also I think master gardeners countywide, whether you're in the cities or in the county, and I think the master food preservers likewise, uh, that um, if, if that's not, I think it should always be included, again, depending on people's availability on a Saturday or a Sunday, but uh, uh, the, the, that's an exposure that I think has dividends beyond just, you know, putting something on a website or word of mouth. And again, we have tremendous programs, uh, certainly in this county that I'm aware of, and I think obviously other board members are, board members are as well. Uh, but I just think that, <clears throat> again, requires volunteers showing up at on, on a Saturday or Sunday oftentimes. But is that, because it wasn't mentioned here, it just says volunteer service. So our, is, is that part of what's in the volunteer service or is it more? For Absolutely, the yes. And I would say um, yeah, this is I, a, a growing program area for us yeah. um, led by Wendy Weston and they are all over the place. And yeah. uh, Wendy's yeah. recently increased her um, her FTE for us and is, um, is is at all the events constantly. So I appreciate <laughs> the, uh, the encouragement. Yeah, well, I think it ties into certainly what you're doing in nutrition certainly working with the you know production agricultural community but um, I think just the you know the interest in organic uh, fruits and vegetables but people you know making their budget stretch further eating healthy again I, I can't tell you how many times over the years that I've you know encountered folks and you know I always learn something just from you know engaging with people uh, who are involved in these programs whether they be volunteers people have an expertise certainly the leadership that comes through the the program itself but uh, there's tremendous value and I think oftentimes it uh, maybe a little underappreciated just because you're there, you're doing it. In some cases, like before H, you've been there for 100 years. Um, but it's an uh, uh, important aspect, and I think it really contributes to uh, many benefits in people's lives, you know, whatever their age, whatever their walk in life, whatever the community they hail from. So. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Really good way to stretch yeah. the dollar right now. Um, so uh, in addition to our volunteer programs, we also have nine um, advisors um, who operate within the areas of agriculture and pest management. Much of the emphasis of these programs is really centered around climate change adaptation, sustainable use of inputs and natural resources, and um, better reaching underserved agricultural producers. So I'm gonna go through some of those folks real quick in their program areas. Uh, I'm going to start with our Livestock and Natural Resources Program, which is led by Morgan Doran, who many of you are familiar with as our most recent county director. Uh, Morgan conducts research and education related to livestock production and natural resource management. Conrad Mathesius runs our agronomy program. 
um, and focuses on field crop management um, and specifically soil health sustainability strategies to um, reduce nitrogen inputs. Margaret Lloyd, who is with us today, um, runs our small farm program, which focuses um, on smaller scale and often um, organic producers um, and includes a particular focus um, on supporting Hmong, Mien, and Spanish-speaking producers. Catherine Jarvis Sheehan serves as our orchard systems advisor and focuses her research um, on sustainable production strategies um, in orchard systems and in particular on um, methods for mitigating some of the impacts of warming winters. Some other folks, um, Rachel Long serves as a longtime pest management advisor um, she covers forage crops and dry beans um, with a particular focus on water quality and integrated pest management in those systems. Carrie Winbill Rojas serves as our urban integrated pest management advisor um, in a part-time capacity um, and specifically supports and evaluates IPM programs for pests around homes, landscapes, and structures. We have a, a couple of advisors who are not based in our counties but serve Sacramento, um, and those are Michelle Leinfelder Miles, who focus specific, focuses specifically on crops grown in the Delta, um, including alfalfa forage, small grains, and rice, <clears throat> and um, Whitney Brim DeForest, who focuses on rice um, with a particular interest in weed issues and herbicide resistance. And I um, would be remiss um, in failing to mention um, Jean Miao, who is an emeritus professor, um, but continues to play a um, very essential role providing technical assistance to vegetable crop growers despite being retired. So um, I just covered a lot of programs, um, and I want to just return to this funding augmentation that I mentioned, um, because it has really set the table for some significant program expansion, which is um, actually already underway. So we have just hired a regional food systems advisor, Olivia Henry, um, and hope to be, um, and, and um, also just brought on an environmental horticulture advisor, Joanna Solins, who just started earlier this month. Okay. Um, we are in the process of hiring a vegetable crops advisor to, um, to give Jean some relief and um, hope to be accepting applications for a full-time urban integrated pest management advisor um, probably around the start of the new year. And um, as you may know, all of these folks typically start their work with a um, very kind of robust needs assessment and um, stakeholder outreach. So that, that informs their work going forward and do not be surprised if you see them out in the community. So um, to close, we are you know, very excited um, and energized about this period of growth and what it will mean for Sacramento County citizens and um, are looking forward to updating everybody about this um, in years to come. Thanks, Susan. Did you introduce everybody here with you? I think I saw a couple of folks that maybe not gotten introduced. No. Yeah. Would f folks want to quickly um, say their name and their um, programmatic affiliation? Bertle Johnson, the after school program for H. Bertle Johnson, after school program for H. Jen Hankins, the after school program for H. Bertle Johnson, the after school program for H. Jen Hankins, uh, Sacramento for H. And I also cover Solano and Yolo in a newly expanded position as the regional supervisor. Oh, And this is um, Michelle's very first day of work. We're very excited to have her. Very good. <laughs> welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Feel welcome. Uh, Wendy Weston, yeah. I'm the Sacramento County Volunteer Coordinator for Master Food Preservers. And we have a lot of fun. <laughs> but we grow things. That's true. I'm Judy Winkler. I coordinate the Master Gardener Volunteers here in Sacramento County. How many years, Judy? <laughs> <laughs> a long time. She's been here through the battles. But thank you for your leadership, Judy. Yeah. I'm very proud to serve the Master Guard. Great. Thanks, you. Yes, thanks, you. I think you introduced the rest of the yeah, folks. Yeah, okay, thank Good. you. Well, welcome to the first, uh, first day, but also those that are long time, many years in, you know, serving this community and the, certainly the, our, our fellow county and all the various things you do. Again, it's, I, I would just say I think sometimes it's kind of invisible to folks, uh, but it's there and you're doing good work, uh, certainly 
helping both production agriculture, but folks that are backyard gardeners, but I think uh, nutrition, helping the next generation uh, to understand animal husbandry and horticulture, environment, all the things that are really important to day-to-day -day life and to a good quality of life. So thanks, Susan, for being here. Uh, my colleague is Sue Frost. Do you have a comment? Oh, I, yeah. I really enjoyed your presentation. I was wondering your um, cooperative extension, do you have regular meetings and do you have a membership and where do people go to find more information about getting involved? Great question. Um, we have boatloads of regular meetings, but um, they typically are sort of by program area. And our website is, is pretty good in terms of providing information about all the various program areas that we have. Um, so probably um, that would be a good way to start or just sort of reaching out to me if you had a particular interest. But um, lots of different ways to plug in. And what's your web, web UC? Our uh, website UCCE. is um, oh, UCC, what is it? Um, basically, if you were to just Google, Google UC Cooperative Extension Capital okay, Corridor, got it. it'll take you right there. All right. Yeah. Okay. That I'm, and I really am interested in the preser food preservation uh, and the vegetable gardening. And I'm wondering why my vegetable garden. <laughs> yeah. You know, this year I, I know so many people. Their vegetable garden did not do well this year, and mine was one of those. And so I want to talk to you guys. <laughs> did yours do well? I, I know everyone I talk to. I don't know what's yeah, going on. It was that virtual irrigation. You got to. Mine get never started. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Any other uh, comments? Uh, again, I know the Horticulture Center uh, in Fair Oaks has been long standing, but that's you know I you know visited different uh, uh, program uh, facilities and so forth. But I mean that really is a tremendous. Um, you know, a resource for the community. It, you know, has to be located in Fair Oaks, but I know you have people come from even other counties outside of the ones that are in the Capital Corridor group that to see and to uh, get demonstrations. I know I've had a chance to be out there on a couple of different occasions over the years, and uh, what a treasure. But just, I mean, the, the, the resource that you, all of you bring, and then I think the volunteer component is. And I would just say counties have stepped up, uh, even though through lean times we, you know, we, we looked at a lot of different... Uh, uh, you know, program areas for reductions and so forth. But, you know, there's been a long-standing commitment because that financial match, and I know I've been spent some time with Morgan after the reorganization, and, and obviously more recently, Susan, that uh, that's key. And again, I just say that the exec's office and certainly our county uh, ag commissioner have been involved. Who's the designee now, Ann, for, because uh, then it was Bruce prior to... I think Bruce. it's Dave Devonti. Oh, Dave Devonti. Yeah. So you're our ag, ag, ag lead? <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So you're in charge of making sure the budget request gets... <laughs> run through the process. <laughs> anyway, but again, that's been, that's key, but I think just a cooperation and, and the good work. So, yeah. okay, well, I know we've gone long. Thank you for all being here. Congratulations to some of the newer uh, additions to the team, but uh, we certainly look forward to a long standing relationship with this community and continue to build on good work over the past 100 years. So, thank you. And to. a very warm, um, word of gratitude for all that, all the time and energy and attention um, that you have provided to uh, UC Cooperative Extension in Sacramento. So we'll, we will miss you and look forward to talking about what comes next. Okay, so, thanks Susan, thank I you. appreciate it. You're right. Thank you very much, okay. Um, um, do we have any callers on this? If not, we got a lot of exposure. Channel 14, we have a lot of, <laughs> lot of followers, so hopefully some folks will pick up on that website and uh, follow through. Um, we're going to take one more item uh, from the morning agenda, that's item 66. We're going to hold 67 uh, through 69 th um, until the afternoon because we do have a closed session. So we'll go ahead and, and uh, call item 66 and then we'll go take a, a noontime afternoon break and um, we'll be back for the remaining items this afternoon. So go ahead, Paul. Uh, item 66 is county service area number one, zone number one, public hearing on the benefit category change and levy of increased service charges for the Sings Estates subdivision. <clears throat> okay, Cheyenne, go ahead. I think Wendy, Wendy had something for the clerk. Good. Thanks, Good afternoon, Wendy. Chairman and Tully members of the board. I am Cheyenne Raymond, a civil engineer with the County Engineering Division. The Sings Estates project is in the North Vineyard Station specific plan area and is located on Gerber Road, approximately 2,000 feet east of Waterman Road. The project proposes to create 30 single family residential parcels. During the entitlement process, the project was conditioned to provide full funding for street and safety light maintenance. County service area number one provides these services throughout the unincorporated county. 
The project proponent submitted an application to initiate the benefit category change process. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the, the project proponent submitted an application to initiate the benefit category change process for county service area number one to satisfy this condition. And on September 9th, a ballot and notice were mailed to the property owners. Currently, the project site consists of two parcels that are in the street light only benefit category and have an annual assessment of $2.56. The proposed changes to the decorative street and safety light benefit category for the 30 single family parcels and two additional parcels. The current rate for this benefit category is $76.52, and the total annual charge for the entire project will be $2,448.64. If your board has no questions, staff recommends that you open the public hearing to consider all written and oral testimony, close the public hearing, to direct the clerk of the board to tabulate the ballot, and if there is no majority protest, consider adopting the attached resolution that concludes my presentation. There are members of DOT in the audience and as myself to answer any questions you may have. Great, okay, welcome Kamal. Um, is there any questions for Cheyenne? Um, seeing none, then I'm gonna go ahead and open the public hearing. Public hearing is open. Uh, do we have any, I have no signed, speaker signed up. Do we have anybody on the phone that wishes to? I, and I have no callers. Okay, since we have no one wishing to address the board, I'm going to close the public hearing and then uh, return to our clerk to um, open the ballots and uh, We'll do the tabulation. All right, I'm gonna open the one ballot that I received. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so we have a, uh, an official protest ballot from the legal owner NorCal S Builders Incorporated, parcel number 066-0080008. 000 and 0660080009000. Site address is 9437 Gerber Road uh, for the annual service charge of $76.52 per single family resident parcel, and they are in favor. Okay, very good. That's the only ballot received. So, with that, then I'll <clears throat> turn back to Cheyenne to go to our resolution to fill in the blanks, and then we'll bring it forward for board action. Section 2. At the close of the hearing, the board had received zero written protest. Section three, at the close of the tabulation, the board had received one protest ballot totaling 100% of the total service charges to be levied, of which 100% was in favor of the change of benefit category and 0% was in opposition. Okay, <clears throat> very good. <clears throat> Thank you for reading that into the record then. So uh, if there's no further questions or comments, uh, I would, uh, uh, move the resolution uh, with the uh, additions as noted, and uh, uh, that's my motion. We have a second. second. Okay. <laughs> been, been moved and seconded then to approve the resolution, and staff recommendation is <coughs> outlined. Please vote. Unanimous vote. Very good. Thank you, Shine. Thank you, Kamal. All right, with that then, we're going to uh, break uh, for lunch. We do have closed session with a number of items, and so we'll um, <clears throat> hold over the items, the remaining morning items, pick those up when we come back into uh, open session. So we'll uh, recess into closed session and return some, I don't know if we can be up by two o'clock. Close, okay, all right, thanks. Good afternoon. I want to call back into session the <clears throat> October 25th, 2022 meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors and uh, thank those who uh, uh, carried over from, from this morning and we have some business from this morning to complete and then we'll get into the afternoon session. So we appreciate um, your patience. And uh, with that, I'll turn to our clerk to uh, call the roll, establish a quorum and uh, get underway. All right. Good afternoon. Supervisor Cerna. Here. Kennedy? Here. Desmond? Here. Frost? Here. Natoli? Here. And you have a quorum. Thank you. And I'll go ahead and call item 67 into the record. Approve and authorize submission to the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development of the 2023 one-year action plan for the Community Development Block Grant Home Investment Partnerships Program known as Home, Home American Rescue Plan Program and Emergency <coughs> Solutions Grant for Projects and Programs, Amendment of Prior Year's Action Plans, Amendment to the Sacramento Housing and 
Redevelopment Agency budget, authorization to enter into an agreement with municipalities for regional affirmatively furthering fair housing rescue, uh, excuse me, fair housing contract and to solicit, award, and execute contract and home American rescue plan. Great. <clears throat> All right, with that, uh, Celia, you're going to kick it off? Good afternoon. Uh, Celia Iniguez, Program Manager here at SHRA. Hi, Celia. Um, I have a few changes, so I'm just going to go, uh, if it's all right with Madam Clerk, to use the overhead, so some minor changes. Uh, I know we've uh, had a long day, so I'm going to try and s speed through um, the presentation uh, without missing any important pieces. So today is the um, approval of the 2023 action plan uh, for various funding sources from the... Um, from HUD, from the Housing and Urban Development Department. So um, just as an overview, uh, every year, every five years, you prepare an analysis of impediments to fair housing. And the request today is funding um, and authorization to proceed with that um, uh, release of um, an RFP to get those proposals. That will be done in 2023. Uh, and then in, um, in 2024, we'll do a consolidated plan. We're required by HUD to prepare that consolidated plan, which is your essentially your guiding principles based on your analysis of impediments to fair housing. And then every year, we come before you to prepare uh, to approve an action plan, funding, uh, activities, and programs for the coming year. Uh, just quickly, a couple of three accomplishments in the county, uh, including um, the reconstruction or a new uh, outdoor fitness center at the Ed Smith um, uh, Community Center, or um, sorry, Community Park, uh, a new uh, roof at Gene Harvey down in the Delta, and improvements to two buildings at Mather Community Campus that were in dire need of um, uh, a new boiler and a roof. Uh, and then this is just a high-level overview of the activities um, uh, for public services. Um, you know, of course, we do Meals on Wheels. We provide funding for emergency shelter and home repair throughout the county. Uh, and, um, of course, the uh, operations at Mather. Um, going on to the future projects. Uh, so we have um, these, including um, improvements around uh, in the south area uh, in Oak Park, Fruit Ridge Pocket area, some ADA and side sidewalk improvements. Uh, the South Sacramento uh, Affordable Housing Pedestrian Improvements. So this is going to support the recent um, uh, project that just got under construction, court, um, sorry, Cornerstone. courtyard, court. Cornerstone. Cornerstone, sorry, too many, too many C projects, which is a great thing to have. So <laughs> Cornerstone, which is both multifamily and affordable housing. It is just down the street from Lickilis Park. Uh, and so these improvements will improve that connection between the two and the connection up to um, 47th. Uh, also uh, proposed is William Pond uh, ADA um, fishing pier improvements, uh, construction funding for the real lights, real Linda street lights, uh, and then we have one minor one, one change to the program, which is re um, the Rosemont street lights phase three design funding, uh, replacing the Mather Community Campus building improvements. Uh, no additional funding; it's the same amount at 325. Uh, this is just another way to look at it with the funding amounts. We'll continue to provide funding for a variety of housing programs using CDBG, ESG, and HOME. Uh, no, no changes to the program. There is one one-time addition of funding, which is the under HOME, HOME uh, American Rescue Plan. Uh, the county received uh, 11.9 million in these funds to address and prevention of homelessness and during the pandemic. Uh, in 20, these funds were awarded in April of 2021. Uh, in September of 2021, had issued uh, guidelines uh, that required a plan, and so that plan is attached in uh, in the staff report uh, and is attached to the resolution for approval. So those funds will be used uh, to, as uh, for future permanent supportive housing pro projects uh, in the coming years, and it's a great match for the state's home key program. Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Sir. Um, so yeah, is that $11 million in addition to the $301 million that the county received from... Uh, Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll also continue to do the fair housing activities and, of course, um, seniors, the programs for the seniors, including Meals on Wheels, um, and as well as programs for homelessness. 
So this is a is um, the, would be the revised attachment uh, page in the attachment to reflect those changes. We will need to um, make sure that that is. Uh, whatever action is approved, that this change, if, uh, if approved by the board, is read into the record. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Okay, I'm going to turn to my colleagues. I know I had a, a couple of questions and comments, but let me see if any others first here. Um, Celia, if I could, uh, and again, I know I had a chance to talk with uh, Lachelle earlier today and Siobhan on this. And uh, <clears throat> as it relates to the uh, Rosemont street lighting, and again, I apologize for any confusion with my colleague, uh, District 3, and I think uh, that's all been ironed out in your recommendation relative to the um, accessibility on the uh, William Pond fishing access. But I guess one of the things that I wanted to, to ask about here, uh, you bring this as a recommendation, and I know that the capital reserve is fairly low, but uh, uh, what, what I would like to have a conversation around is to because uh, my understanding was earlier in the summer, before some of the staff work went on, that there actually was a plug number somewhere closer to 600,000 at the community campus. We had some discussion about that. We're going to, you know, there are other ways to accomplish that. And so by the time, and again, I did not have the benefit, as I explained to my colleague and to uh, Lachelle and Siobhan, when I was talking on the phone, on, and you were on the call as well, Friday, I didn't have the staff report in front of me, so we're talking. Uh, you know, from from your base of knowledge, but I didn't, again, fortunately didn't have that in front of me. But um, what I wanted to ask about was uh, the possibility, I guess for board consideration, but that uh, I'd like, if at all possible, to get to two-thirds of the estimated amount for the street lights, which would be $400,000, without cutting anything in particular. That's not the <clears throat> desired action here, but is to maybe take fit the 58000 and some change from... Um, the capital reserve and apply that uh, to, and I'm going to offer, it's 58983 And then I guess I'd ask the question of Lachelle because in looking in the budget, obviously you have to administer these programs and there's $772,648 in administration. If I was looking to get to 400000 the possibility of taking $16,031 uh, from the um, uh, administration portion of this and apply that to the uh, uh, street lighting project. So to get, but even $400,000. Now, if that's going to have a, a, a negative effect, obviously you budget it around, you know, anticipated expenses and so forth. But I wanted to, have, to ask that of you and Celia of the show. So uh, as I understand it, you're um, recommending that around 16000 or so come from the CDBG planning and admin yes, right. line item? I was asking about that. That's what I was suggesting. But again, I would, if there's going to be programmatic impacts, I guess I need to, to know that. So No, I think that that okay. um, line item could support because there is planning work in there. So we could look to see exactly what portion of the streetlights project okay. that could be actually charged against the planning. Okay, okay. And then I would just suggest that, again, I know it might not be your um, <clears throat> recommendation. It's a fairly modest capital reserve anyway, but this is a capital project. And I know that uh, if you run short, that you, you're pretty good at juggling that, waiting until the, the following year. But I do think in order to advance the work on that project, that 400000 of the, I think it's about 620000 was the estimated cost of the, of the uh, phase three of the street lighting. I recognize that four hundred thousand dollars doesn't accomplish it, but I'd like to get that uh, underway. So, again, it, unless you have major heartburn with, with that, Celia or or Lachelle, I would offer those as suggestions, and certainly makes the rest of the uh, recommendation whole from the perspective of what you're bringing forward. So, yeah, I, that's definitely doable. Okay. All right, Lachelle. Okay? okay. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. All right. Those were my questions. And Supervisor Frost. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you once again for the street lights in Rio Linda. I know that they're going to be very excited. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> let's go to, I don't have anybody signed up to speak. Do we have anybody on the phone, Madam Clerk? We do not have any callers. Okay. Anybody here in the audience wish to address the item 67? <clears throat> All right. Seeing none, then I'll bring it back to the board. So um, we have a recommend action. Thank you for your report, Celia. Um, and I know you had a whole team here this morning, so <laughs> thank you for being with us this morning. All right, I, I guess I would just offer then for a motion, um, certainly to move the staff recommendation, but 
to modify, I guess, the chart, and you would, you would make those modifications that um, we would put in for the Rosemont Streetlights, $400,000, uh, and that, that would be made up from a production in the, or, or you could just, you would keep the line item the same, uh, Lachelle, or would you move the money to that from the planning administration? I think we need to go ahead and move that okay. so that we can just up update the chart. Okay. So it would be 16000 and seventeen dollars I think. Excuse me, $16,013 from, from that category. So I'd leave you with $756,631. And then also would then <clears throat> modify the uh, reserve for capital reserve from 258,983 to just 200,000 and move the 58,983 to the uh, Rosemont Street Lighting Project. Okay, that'd be our motion. That'd be Mr. Sure? Chair, no, yes. I, I'll move approval of the staff recommendation with those, uh, those amendments that uh, you just uh, memorialized. Okay. Second. All right, so it's been moved and seconded. Nothing further then, uh, please vote. Unanimous vote. And I'd like to get a copy of the amendment, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Michelle, to you and your staff and uh, for uh, all the work that goes on. And starting to our county staff, to Siobhan and Dave, who uh, are tasked with this as well. So, great. Okay. Let's okay. For um, item 68, authorize the director of airports to increase public parking rates at Sacramento International Airport up to a maximum of 5% per year over the next five years. Okay, all right, we have our airport staff to introduce us. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. Sherry Thompson, Deputy Director of Operations and Maintenance, Department of Airports. I have uh, eight quick slides that I'll go over, but as you are aware, earlier this year, the Board of Supervisors, this board, approved the airport master plan, which is really the roadmap for propelling SMF forward and was the first step in getting it going. Um, I have the brief presentation today um, to explain why the airport is asking to increase public parking rates at the airport. So SMF Forward is comprised of five distinct projects. Three of them are on the land side or the public side and are depicted on this drawing. And if you look at the drawing, north is to your left. All of the three projects that I will sp speak about will have impacts but will ultimately approve air improve airport parking. So letters A and B on the map are the new consolidated ground transportation center and all of the associated, associated roadway changes. And this ground transportation center will be the central location to consolidate buses, shuttles, taxis, and other alternative modes of transportation, including the area where future planning and right of way for the RT Green Line would be. The purple box at the bottom is the new, uh, the second parking garage. And then items D, F, and G are the new consolidated rental car facility. So these current and upcoming par parking projects, along with a fairly long list of enabling projects, is going to cost about $370 million, which is the first reason for our need to increase the parking rates. Sacramento International Airport has about 18,000 revenue-producing parking spots. 2019 was our busiest year on record for passenger traffic at just over 13 million passengers. And now coming out of COVID, we are looking at meeting or exceeding those numbers this year, which is a great problem to have, but not without its challenges. So that's why we are switching now. We have switched from recovery to growth. So here on this slide, you'll see um, those parking and enabling projects that I just spoke about that total $370 million. It, this list does not include the rental car facility, which my colleague Chris Wimsat will discuss um, in the following presentation. With SMF Forward comes the need for new parking and ground transportation amenities which will mitigate and or enhance overall passenger experience. The chart shows estimated costs and estimated completion dates, and we will move forward and implement these as quickly as possible given the environmental and other constraints. 
This graph is one of many that we use, and it's simply a supply and demand model that we, uh, we can refer to when making decisions about parking projects and whether or not we can afford to close or lose any parking at a given time. And it also, it also shows us when our demands may exceed capacity. So what we look at at the airport are load factors, and that essentially is how many seats are coming in on what size aircraft and how many passengers are in those seats. And then the red line um, here on this chart indic indicates um, the parking spaces available at any given time. We monitor our passenger emplanements and airline load factors and future projected load factors very closely. And these are actual numbers that we put into a host of models and can track on a daily basis. But we also look at trends in passenger behaviors such as their parking preference, their length of stay, and mode of transportation. And what we found is these behaviors have shifted through COVID. Prior to COVID, our, our economy lots, the ones that are further out closest to I-5, those are the ones that filled and closed first. And then we would have to force our passengers into the, the parking garage and the closer in parking lots. COVID changed that, um, and now our, par our close in parking is filling up first and only leaving the far out parking lots uh, available to our customers. The length of stay has also increased from 3.03 days to 3.74 days. And while this doesn't seem like a lot, it makes a, diff a big difference in how our lots turn over and reopen um, and then for the next peak time fill up again. So just this last month alone, we've had to open and operate one of our two overflow lots as all of our paid parking lots have filled and closed. Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, in addition to this information that's uh, presented graphically, what, what about um, any uh, you know, communication from our um, um, flying public, um, people that we serve out at the airport, uh, in terms of their experience when and if they have missed flights because of the inability to find parking or they, um, uh, you know, have otherwise encountered um, unexpected difficulty in, you know, whether it's economy or, or not. I know myself and others in this room have experienced um, some challenges uh, parking out there. and. Um, you know, I happen to live very close to the airport, so if, if I go there and can't find parking, I actually have enough time to go back home and then take a cab or, or, a, uh, or an Uber. But um, I've also heard a number of other horror stories about uh, folks, you know, either missing flights or making it just in time uh, to board. So do we, keep, do we keep track of that as kind of a data a data point? The airlines do, and I don't have that information with me today, but the airlines do. Um, but we too have heard from the customers. And again, um, typically they've, what's filling up first now is the, the closer in garages. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't have to wait on the buses or they don't have to um, make long walks. So it, we, we do hear them and we are getting that same feedback. Thank you. So given what we are seeing, we are concerned um, that we may come very close to running out of parking this calendar year. And because of that, we've constructed and developed temporary and contingency parking plans, which is the second reason for our increase. As I mentioned previously, we have about 18,000 revenue producing spots, but our temporary and contingency parking lots do not have revenue control system in there. So it's critical that we move as quickly as possible um, to build permanent parking enhancements. And you can see, um, given that we have $370 million in, in these parking projects that we need to pay for over the next few years, we took a, um, an in-depth look at, at our rates compared to our peer airports in other and other local downtown lots and garages. And you can see um, on this slide that what we found is that across all categories, uh, Sacramento International Airport is significantly below the average rates, 19 to 40% below. And it's important to note that we have not increased rates across the board since 2012 other than a $1 increase in our garage back in 2017. So you can see that information on this slide um, with our peer airports. And when, we've, when we received this information early summer, 
these airports were also in the process of determining whether or not they were going to raise their rates at some point. And again, this is the downtown and nearby parking garages and lots and how we compare uh, well below those local, local lots. So our proposed rates as shown in this bottom slide here for the next um, five years, we would like to increase um, 5% per year for the next five years. And even with those increases, the proposed rates maintain competitive pricing against local and nearby airport parking competition. And then the pie chart on the right is a snapshot in time of who is parking in our lots. And the info is based on geofences that we had around that we have around our, our parking lots. And our consultants are able to track cell phone data uh, in those areas, which is linked back to billing addresses. So the roughly 40-60 split that you see on that pie chart is the number of people it's a people who have billing addresses inside and outside of the county. 40% of the parkers in and 60% of the parkers outside. And our catchment area is, it's a large catchment area that spans from the Oregon border down to the Central Valley and from Solano County, Nampa County, all the way to uh, Lake Tahoe. So in closing, the proposed rate chains will increase our annual parking revenues from about 65 million to 95 million and will finance the proposed improvements that I spoke about today for the parking at Sacramento International Airport. Okay. Thank you, Sherry. We have some board member comments. Supervisor Sir. Thank you, and thank you, Sherry, for the um, presentation. Is that, um, so on that last point, in terms of the financing, is that financing gonna take the form of revenue bonds? Our goal is to pay for that all the, the majority of it with the cash from the revit from parking revenue okay but it, yeah but that's what i mean you're going to secure the revenue bonds with the yeah. additional revenue okay great thank you okay any other board member questions or comments uh, i know we did get some written comments uh, <clears throat> one earlier this morning and uh, one just delivered to our desk here so um, i don't have anybody signed up to speak in chambers on this uh, madam clerk do we have anybody on phone we do not have any calls. Okay. All right. So I'll bring it back to the board. Mr. Sir. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for the presentation and the information. Um, as I noted in my earlier comments, uh, it's no surprise, I think, to most of us that, that use SMF to travel frequently that uh, um, parking is becoming more and more scarce. And um, I think it makes a lot of sense to uh, not just plan for um, the future uh, in terms of the uh, the branding SMF forward, um, uh, but to uh, do so, you know, with um, uh, an eye towards making sure that we don't um, overcharge uh, folks for uh, using the, the airport and parking their vehicles. And I think the, the, char the charts that really resonated with me in your presentation, I think really speak to some of the correspondence that we received um, uh, late about the, uh, uh, concern over um, parking rates uh, going up really does prove the point that um, we are actually lower um, than our competing um, regional airports as well as uh, with other uh, revenue um, parking spaces uh, in and around um, Sacramento, especially downtown Sacramento. So uh, with that, you know, I don't uh, always cherish the idea of r raising uh, rates or taxes, but I think in this instance, this makes a lot of sense to make sure that we do have the resources necessary uh, to make uh, the traveling experience at SMF uh, one that we can be proud of and that our patrons can um, use without uh, feeling like they might have to turn around and go take a taxi to get back to the airport. So with that, I'll move the item, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's been moved and seconded then to approve the staff recommendations outline as it relates to parking rates at Sacramento International. If there's nothing further, please vote. A unanimous vote. <clears throat> okay, great, thanks, Sherry. Okay. Next item, please. Item 69 is to authorize the implementation and collection of an $8 per transaction day customer facility charge from airport rental car companies for purposes of designing, financing, and constructing a consolidated rental car facility at Sacramento International Airport. Mr. Wimsat. Great. Thank you, Chair Natoli, members of the board. Uh, my name is Chris Wimsat. I'm the Deputy Director 
for finance and administration for the Department of Airports. So I wanted to give a little bit, just a little bit of background on, on the customer facility charge. Um, the customer facility charge is a, a charge level, uh, levied by rental car companies um, to people that rent cars at Sacramento International Airport. It's remitted to the airports on a monthly basis. It's governed by California state law. And as you uh, will probably recall, um, the Department of Airports came to the Board of Supervisors in early 2019 to request the implementation of a $10 per transaction customer facility charge, with the ultimate goal being to use that $10 per transaction CFC to uh, move forward on conce conceptual design for a new consolidated rental car facility at SMF. Uh, we, uh, the intention at that point was to then transition to an alternate customer facility charge once we'd reached a point of conceptual design where we were ready to move forward. Um, and so that's why I'm here today, is to talk about the implementation of that alternate CFC. So um, Sherry covered the uh, Landsight SMF Ford projects pretty well. Uh, just, just as a reminder, the consolidated rental car facility um, as envisioned is, is in boxes D, F, and G on the map uh, here right now. And this project will replace the current uh, consolidated rental car facility at, uh, at SMF. So as you're probably aware, the current facility is, um, it's dated, it's inconvenient, it's really insufficient for the, for the traffic and for the passengers that go through Sacramento International Airport today. It was one of the first rental car facilities built in the country in 1967, and the last major update was completed in 1993, or nearly 30 years ago. Uh, most of the customer complaints that we receive at Sacramento International Airport actually relate to the shuttles that take passengers to and from the terminals and to the consolidated rental car facility. So our goal in building a new consolidated rental car facility is to mitigate these issues that we uh, frequently receive negative feedback about. Uh, and build a new facility that can serve passenger needs for the next several decades and to uh, also eliminate the need for busing and promote uh, a uh, more walkable campus. So the estimated cost of the facility um, right now is about $390 million. And the proposed source of funding is the alternate customer facility charge um, that, we're, that we're here to talk about today. The new consolidated rental car facility would be located south of the Terminal A parking garage uh, would again promote a walkable campus by reducing or eliminating the need for busing associated with rental cars um, and would enhance the overall uh, customer experience. So these renderings, um, these, are, these are renderings that are um, associated with rental car facilities that are similar uh, to the facility that we're uh, envisioning building. Uh, it's also uh, worth, worth noting that current rental car companies are in favor of this facility, they're in favor of this proposal, and they have included letters of support that um, are in the, the board uh, documents today. So where do uh, SMF rental, car renters live? Um, Overall, um, based on data that we received from rental car companies using uh, zip code data for, uh, the, for the transactions that have been completed at Sacramento International, um, about 2.3% of car renters live inside Sacramento County with the remainder coming from outside Sacramento County. And that makes sense when we look at our uh, map here of nonstop destinations um, to and from Sacramento International. The, the, the lion's share of people who rent cars are, are coming from these um, destinations from across the country and, and across North America. So um, this next slide, uh, the chart on the left kind of shows that you know, several other California airports have implemented a per transaction day customer facility charge, uh, specifically over the last decade to finance uh, consolidated rental car facilities. And we'll see that within that last decade, San Jose, San Diego, Palm Springs and LAX have all gone to the state maximum of $9 per transaction day for up to five days. What we're uh, requesting and proposing is an $8 per transaction day charge for up to five days at SMF. But it's not just in California. And as we can see in the chart on the right, uh, so these are, this is a chart of similar sized airports who have implemented a per transaction day customer facility charge across the country for purposes of, of designing, financing, and constructing a consolidated rental car facility. So um, again, the proposed source of funding for the facility as the customer facility charge 
Uh, per state law, instituting an alternate customer facility charge in the state of California requires an independent audit to be conducted that justifies the rate that we're, that's being requested, in this case, the $8 per day. Um, and that audit is um, also included in the board materials. And then um, uh, also a, a public hearing, which is um, part of the purpose of, uh, of uh, my presentation today. And uh, overall, annual CFC revenues related to this change in charge would uh, increase from about $6 million to $18 million under the proposed plan. And so um, kind of as a, a final slide here, this, this chart shows on the x-axis along the bottom shows the number of rental days uh, since uh, the beginning of 2019 when the original customer facility charge went into effect. Uh, this shows the number of rental days that the um, e each percent that the uh, that are allocated for each percentage of uh, people that rent cars. So the uh, uh, y-axis along the right shows the percentage of people who rent for that number of days. Uh, along the left side shows the customer facility charge that would be associated with that number of rental days. So as we can see on the gray line, the current CFC is ten dollars, no matter how long you uh, no, lo no matter how long somebody rents a car for. Under the proposal, the minimum would be $8. So for somebody who rents a car for one day, their charge would go down from $10 to $8, but the maximum would increase from $8 uh, to $40. The average rental car days at SMF are about four, so the average CFC would go from $10 to about $32. So the recommended action today uh, is to um, open a public hearing on the proposed implementation and collection. Um, receive public testimony, and then um, uh, after consideration, um, consider the uh, resolution to adopt the alternate customer facility charge. All right, thank you for your presentation. We have, do you have a question, Mr. Starr? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, received uh, some correspondence um, from a constituent who pointed out that, um, this, I guess this is based on their experience, that um, when car rental locations other than SMF are closed, and that might be days, of the, certain days of the weeks, weekends, for instance, um, that the only place to rent a vehicle is at SMF, um, even if you're local? Is that, is that the case? Is that your understanding? Um, I, I, that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure. I would imagine if there were no other places to rent, then uh, SMF, we, uh, as an airport, we, we are open uh, during when the traveling public is coming uh, and, and going. Then the, my follow-up question was going to be, uh, or is, um, if that is the case, do we know the, uh, the rental behavior of local car renters versus travelers? So, for instance, would... Uh, do we know if local car renters uh, are more likely to rent for a single day versus multiple days, and therefore do we know whether or not local renters might enjoy a $2 discount? I don't have that information right now. Okay. Interesting question, though. Um, all right, so there's no one in chambers that can answer the question about uh, the, or maybe there's, maybe my colleagues know, but um, I don't oftentimes rent cars in my own city, so, or my own county. Um, but I would be surprised if, um, if there are car other car rental outlets don't um, uh, offer their, you know, the ability to rent uh, all days of the week. I don't, I, I don't know if um, that's the case. Looks like Mr. Kennedy might have the answer. Patrick. Well, strictly because you've seen my car, so <laughs> I actually do rent regularly. <laughs> and, and I can tell you I've never had a problem um, at any time of the week. You know, okay. So. All right. Very good. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions by board members or anybody else? Do we have anybody? No one's time to speak. Anyone on the phone? Uh, no, we have no callers. <clears throat> okay. All right. So we've opened a public hearing, um, and uh, we have no one coming forward. So I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing, uh, noting the audit. Um, and is this maybe uh, if you come just for a second, Chris? The um, the audit that was included here, um, is this the one of the auditors that the uh, county normally does business with? Obviously, I, I recognize the name, but I just wanted to be clear about that. So. Yes, yes. This is uh, MGO who uh, does the uh, much of the financial auditing work. Again, not really relevant to today's discussion, but the audit covered a lot of things, and it noted that um, due to the change in the 
magnetic field of the Earth that they actually had to renumber the runways uh, because there was a three-foot shift. Is that a, is that a natural occurrence? And, uh, Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Runways are labeled based on their orientation to magnetic yeah. poles. So as the magnetic pole shifts every now and then, a uh, runway will need to be so renewed. Re What's that cost us when <laughs> Earth decides to change the magnetic field, all the restriping and everything? That's a great question. I'm not sure I can, <laughs> I can find out. Of course, we don't control it. So and I, again, I just found it fascinating reading through the audit. There was a number of other things, certain that related to, obviously, the matter at hand here. But OK, thanks. All right, uh, go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. So yeah. if there are no further questions or comments, uh, I'll go ahead and move the item. Okay. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded uh, to approve staff recommendation as outlined. Uh, please vote. Unanimous vote. Okay. Thank you. That's to our airport staff. Okay. We'll move now to the afternoon items. So again, thanks, folks, for your patience. Okay. So now we are at the report on COVID-19 response. All righty, Dr. Kassiri. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the board. I have a very brief um, update. Uh, we did uh, send you the, uh, the some information, and I just wanted to highlight a few things. One is, um, I, th I believe the last time you did ask us about when the state of emergency was ending, and it sounds like we heard you <laughs> and sent us an update. So the state will end the state of emergency on February the 28th, 2023, and the federal government um, is scheduled to end it on January 11th, 2023, unless they change it. Um, part of the reason for not doing it right away, because one of the questions we've been asked is, well, the levels are low right now, so why isn't it ending, is that both the federal and the state emergencies actually came with multiple waivers. Some of those waivers were for um, uh, eligibility for Medi-Cal, so they made it easier for people to actually be able to get onto Medi-Cal. There are also waivers for testing and vaccination and waivers for liability. And also for licensing, there are a lot of additional licensed groups that were allowed to be able to provide vaccination in order to increase the number of places where people could get vaccinated. So all of those, um, right now what the state is doing is going through all the waivers and finding out which ones they would like to be able to continue and find ways of being to, able to continue that. So this additional time allows them to do that. The other main reason also is uh, we are going into a flu season. And I think you're all very aware that the last uh, couple of years, the flu season has been mild. And partly because either we've had restrictions with lockdowns or we've had masking. So this is the first year where we are not going to have um, those uh, restrictions in place. And so, of course, there is some concern about what the numbers are going to look like with the flu. And then there's also a virus called the res respiratory syncytial virus, which can uh, cause very severe disease in children. And then, of course, we also still have COVID and Omicron is still uh, producing subvariants, so of course there's a question about what that's going to look like, and you've probably heard in the news talking about a triple uh, endemic or something to that effect, and that's what they're talking about is a concern that um, we're going to have all of these three uh, viruses circulating. And so one of the questions that um, a lot of our partners have asked is what can they do to protect themselves? And so just wanted to quickly remind people that um, some of the ways to avoid getting sick and avoid getting any of these, and all of them are respiratory viruses, is one, uh, we do have vaccine for COVID and we have vaccine for the flu. So make sure that you, if you've been vaccinated before, you're up to date with your booster. We now have a bivalent booster that uh, can protect against the Omicron. Uh, the other is uh, on also the flu vaccine is out now, so uh, please make sure that you're up to date on those two. Um, of course, uh, especially for people that have conditions that put them at risk, 
uh, making a risk assessment when going into places where there is an increased risk, for example, closed spaces, crowded place, uh, places, or close contact. We've been hearing a lot about the airport. It's going to be very busy with holidays coming up. And so uh, people do need to think about that if they are going to fly. If they do have to fly or if they have to be in a crowded place, masking is uh, still a very good option. It is voluntary, but highly recommended, especially for people that have conditions that put them at risk. And for people that do have uh, uh, symptoms, to stay home and um, if they do have severe symptoms to seek uh, medical care. So, uh, of course, we're watching to see what's going to happen over this uh, flu season. We're hoping it will stay mild, but definitely we'll be um, on the ready if we need to ramp up with more vaccinations. And if everything remains the same, then the expectation is that the uh, We'll ha have the um, emergencies ending at the beginning of the next year. And uh, we've had a discussion with uh, OES partners, and we plan to also end the county um, state of emergency for COVID at the same time that the state ends theirs. So that's the end of my comments. So uh, I don't know if you have any questions for me. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kasiri. So go to board members, see if there's any. Yes, uh, Supervisor Frost. Thank you, Chair. I, um, I am uh, in the last couple of weeks. There are some events that have taken place. Our legislature has approved a law that basically um, does not allow medical doctors to speak out against COVID, or they risk fines, or they risk. Uh, losing their license. I think that's concerning when our medical community is no longer able to practice medicine. I'm also extremely concerned that the FDA and CDC have a, ha, are, are mandating, that we're mandating um, or heading toward mandating a childhood vaccine in order for our children to be in schools. And I feel like I can't not say something about that because children do not get COVID. So why do they need to have an experimental mRNA shot uh, in order to go to school when they don't get COVID? I think it's concerning. Um, there's a catastrophic report of all kinds of adverse reactions in VAERS to this shot. And um, everything from heart attacks, arrhythmias, strokes, um, reproductive problems, loss of pregnancy. Um, there are people that are in their 80s who are bleeding, re reproductive bleeding. Uh, it's just uh, neurologic uh, reactions. It's, we don't know how this will play out. And COVID is gone, and we've had all these other, uh, I guess what we're calling viruses, we don't really know what's causing it. I, I don't feel like I, in good conscience, can just not say anything about this. And so I'm just here to go on record that I think, I believe in freedom of choice. You know, I, I believe if people want to get the shot, that's fine. But to, to give a shot to our children who do not get COVID and die from COVID, to give an experimental shot to them just is not uh, right, and I cannot condone it, and I do not support it personally. So I feel compelled to go on record, and I think even though we, even if we do end the COVID uh, pandemic, are we going to end the vaccine, or are we going to continue being in the vaccine sales business? Um, the CDC and the FDA are not medical doctors. So now our medical doctors can no longer have an opinion, but a government agency that's not elected can instruct our, our whole medical, Western medical allopathic system. So it's a statement. It's not a question. I, uh, I'm, uh, I just wanted to go on record as making that statement that this we should wake up and try to um, see that there's something wrong here. 
Thank you. May I respond, please? Sure. Uh, sure. Can I, can I um, ask a question first? Because it might help the doctor respond. Sure. Um, so Supervisor Frost felt compelled to say what she just said. So I feel very compelled to say or ask the questions I'm going to ask of um, Dr. Kasiri because I'm compelled to make sure that um, we don't spread misinformation. Um, the first statement she said is, children don't get COVID. So Dr. Kasiri, is that true? Children do get COVID and some of them do get a very severe disease. We have had a few deaths as well. Okay, so the answer is another one of my questions, which is, do children die from COVID? Yes, they can. Uh, one of her statements is, COVID is gone. Is COVID gone? We have low levels of COVID, but the virus is still circulating, and we're still getting cases reported daily. Okay, and then uh, how about the, CD, the CDC aren't medical doctors. Are there medical doctors that uh, advise or work with the, the Center for Disease Control? The CDC and FDA have multiple doctors. Many of them um, are very highly regarded, um, and uh, they're the ones who are providing the guidance um, that we are following. And then lastly, I've asked this question of you many times. I'll ask it again because it's warranted here. Are you a medical doctor? Yes, I am. So the answers to the questions I just uh, asked to clarify uh, what I took as uh, great misinformation is coming from a medical doctor's perspective. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to make that point. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cerna. Um, before I go back to Supervisor Frost, did you want to weigh No, in? I, I don't have anything <laughs> further. I was going to clarify a few things. Um, okay. One, actually, I do have one thing to clarify, yeah, apart from what uh, Supervisor Cerna said, and uh, that is that the... COVID vaccine was not added to the number of uh, vaccines that are required for children to go to school. I know that, that there was a proposal um, from the um, governor um, when the vaccine first came out, but they decided to wait on that. So it is not added. It is voluntary right now for children to get vaccinated. We do advise and uh, definitely um, encourage parents to consider it. And many of them have uh, gotten the vaccine, but it is not one of the required vaccines. Okay, thanks Dr. Kasiri. Supervisor Frost. I'd just like to say that statistically 0 0.0027 of children are statistically listed as having died from COVID. That's almost, that's essentially a zero, statistical zero. And I'd also like to add that early on, and I think it was in March or April of 2020, the CDC handed down a directive that hospitals could determine someone had COVID if they had the respiratory symptoms without getting a test or proving that they had COVID. So the statistics that we have collected that the CDC seems to be handing out are difficult to really understand because if doctors are just using you know, in their opinion, someone has, you know, a respiratory distress, so therefore they have COVID and that hospital can receive added, you know, money for COVID patients through through the government. It, it kind of skews the statistics. And so it's difficult to really understand what the real statistics are. But if you just want to go to statistics, if you just look at year over year, um, all cause deaths, the all-cause deaths increased drastically by 40% after the vaccine campaign started. So I think it's important to be aware and to um, just, I, I just, I don't feel, um, I don't understand why all of a sudden the only treatment for everything is a vaccine. I'm... Um, I'm not anti-vaccine. I had all my vaccines. My last vaccine was in the summer of 2020. But, you know, children don't die from COVID. That Very few have died from COVID. So giving them an experimental shot, mRNA shot, that we don't know what's in it. We don't have the literature. 
They're telling us Comirnaty is approved, but Comirnaty is not distributed in the United States and we do not have the literature. We're still getting the emergency use authorization, which falls under a different liability shield. And there is no liability for the va vaccine companies. So when parents line their kids up to get a shot, they may um, find that they wish they had some recourse and they may not have it. So I, you know, I know you think it's misinformation. I, I'm glad we no, still have. No, I know have it's a, misinformation. I think, I'm glad we still have a country where we can have an opinion and respectfully um, disagree. Um, and I thank you for that. Okay. All right. Any other member of the board? Okay, Dr. Kasari, anything else? I'd just like to say again that to the doctors that are working on COVID are doing this because they care for the people. Uh, none of us is in this for the money. And um, I know a lot of the doctors who've worked long hours, not even getting paid for the work that they were doing. And I just want to acknowledge the work that they have done in uh, making sure that people are safe. And um, COVID is real. It has killed a lot of people, including a lot of people that we know ourselves. And um, so we're continuing to do the job that we need to do. And as far as statistics, I have provided statistics here. We have very uh, good uh, epidemiologists that are working on this, that are uh, keeping up the dashboard. And um, if you would like, I can, again, present the information uh, to you uh, of the, what the numbers look like as far as COVID, as far as uh, the deaths. Uh, this is all information I have presented before. And I thank you again for uh, giving me the time to give you this update. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kassari, and thank you for your regular reporting to this board. And certainly um, uh, many, many times you've appeared uh, over the course of nearly three years now on uh, this and certainly related matters on, on, on numerous occasions. So appreciate that. Certainly the efforts of uh, public health staff and uh, folks that have worked um, uh, very uh, diligently to, um, as you said, to hopefully uh, keep the community safe, but to be responsive to um, a, a variety of changes that have occurred along the way. And obviously uh, uh, we continue to be under emergency orders, but uh, I think uh, as you noted, uh, come early part of next year, uh, hopefully we'll be beyond it, not just with the emergency order, but also with um, you know having this all in the rearview mirror. So again, thank you for your, your work. Do we have any callers on, on this? I have no one in the chambers. Um, and so unless there's any other board comments, that's a receive and file. And again, we thank uh, uh, Dr. Kasseri and her staff for being here today. Okay, with that then, let's continue to move into our afternoon agenda. Next okay. Item. For um, item 71, this is the North Vineyard Greens Unit 3, Lot 5, a time extension for a vesting tentative subdivision map to divide 1.9 acres into 10 single-family residential lots in the RD5 zone for a property located east of Waterman Road and north of the intersection of Gerber Road and Waterman Road in the Vineyard community. And the environmental document is a prior supplemental environmental impact report. Okay, very good. Mr. Pahuli, Chris. All right. Excuse me. <coughs> What's water? Can we get, we'll get your glass. There, there's some water right next to you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Unexpected. Get you all choked up. Does project right? have sen <clears throat> sentimental value for you, Chris, or something? <laughs> yeah, it's a special project. <laughs> okay, I do have a brief PowerPoint presentation for you um, on this item and the next one. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Natoli, board members, Chris Pahuli, principal planner with the Planning and Environmental Review Division. Uh, I do have the staff presentation for the next two items, both of which are vesting tentative subdivision maps, both with the same applicant teams. Uh, and both are also located in the North Vineyard Station specific plan area. Chris, if, if I could just, and yes. if anyone intends to, as from an uh, applicant perspective, uh, address the items or address the board, oath is required to minister an oath, is that correct? No, I had uh, sent updated notes to you oh, that so there, that's the old there are note? no oaths that's on the these notes. items. Yeah. Okay, so you're off the hook. You don't need to swear at us. All right, go ahead. Chris. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, the first of these requests is for the North Vineyard uh, Greens Unit 3 tentative map. 
the request for the tentative map extension <coughs> is related to lot five of the uh, North Vineyard Greens Unit 3 tentative map, which is highlighted in red crosshatch on this slide and is located east of Waterman Road and north of Gerber Road. Uh, the graphic on this slide contains the current zoning map and illustrates that the subject site is zoned RD5 and adjacent land uses include an RD20 residential subdivision and open space, open space corridor to the north. That would be the Vineyard Creek subdivision on that RD20 um, site. And RD5 subdivisions to the east, south, and west. It's also important to note that the vacant lot to the south of this site is related to the North Vineyard Greens Unit 11 tentative map, which is the next item for your consideration. Uh, in 2006, the board approved the North Vineyard Greens Unit 3 large lot and small lot vesting tentative subdivision maps for a three-year period, originally expiring on April 11th, uh, 2009. The large lot tentative map was recorded, allowing the subdivision to be developed in phases. Since approval, all portions of the small lot tentative map have been recorded with the exception of this lot five. Uh, the Unit 3 subdivision was eligible for statutory extensions and extensions associated with the filing of those phased final maps. Therefore, the current expiration date for Lot 5 is uh, or was April 11th, 2022. The applicant filed a timely extension application prior to the map's e expiration date. Therefore, the application is eligible for the requested six-year time extension. I should also note that the applicant has submitted a final map application with the engineering division for lot five, and approval of the time extension would allow for the applicant to complete the filing and recording process. The applicant is requesting a time extension of six years, which is the maximum number of years available under the Subdivision Map Act and Sacramento County Code. The exhibit on this slide highlights the entirety of the North Vineyard Greens Unit 3 tentative map, which divided a roughly 50 acre parcel into 141 single family lots, uh, one multifamily residential lot and 16 public and quasi-public parcels. Much of this uh, area has been developed. The red call-out uh, area and subdivision outlined in gold is Lot 5. Lot 5 includes the division of roughly two acres into 10 single-family homes. Uh, both the Vineyard CPAC and the Planning Commission reviewed the requested time extension and are recommending approval. Uh, during the Vineyard CPAC meeting, a member did object to the street section widths for this subdivision. Staff noted that the proposed streets are consistent with the specific plan and that no changes to the approved tentative map are proposed as part of the time extension request. Uh, this member voted against the time extension and that's why there was a four to one vote in support of the requested extension. Uh, planning staff supports the requested time extension as the tentative map remains consistent with the general plan specific plan and is compatible with the surrounding neighborhood context, including several uh, partially constructed subdivisions to the north, east, and west. Planning staff recommends the board take the following actions to extend the expiration date of the tentative map so that the final map can be filed. Uh, those actions include determining that the previously certified supplemental EIR and MMRP with the CEQA addendum prepared for the request are adequate and complete and approve the six-year time extension resulting in a new expiration date of April 11th, 2028. That concludes my presentation. Happy to answer questions. Thank you, Chris. I don't see any board members in the queue. Um, I noted this in my briefing yesterday, so I'll just... We'll reference both uh, item 71, 72, but also more broadly, um, just uh, a growing, I think, uh, anxiousness, uh, my description, amongst a uh, number of residents and, and uh, certainly homeowners, but also uh, folks uh, uh, in the um, area, um, certainly proximate, both of these uh, subdivisions touch Waterman Road, and that is the... Um, extension of Waterman Road over the Central California Traction Line. And I know Department of Transportation staff has been working on this, uh, but I certainly in my briefing, I want to highlight it because uh, as we continue to see uh, units constructed um, and uh, other amenities, parks and the schools to uh, follow on, uh, there's growing, I said, I said anxiousness, I won't 
go as far as maybe the frustration, but it's it's building uh, amongst folks as this county continues to, according to plans that have you know gone through the whole general plan, specific plan, community plan processes, um, and where Waterman Road is a major uh, collector uh, street uh, that serves and will serve. Uh, in fact, you know, we'll extend all the way to the city of Elk Grove, and someday I think it's contemplated it might even go as far as Jackson Highway, depending upon development patterns over a course of decades. But for this area between Florin and Gerber, um, it's, it's, it's a key link, uh, and now that portions are, that, uh, that are proximate to where the railroad, certainly where the right-of-way is, but the tracks aren't fully uh, contiguous or uh, continuous uh, through that area, where folks can see where they want to get to, but can't drive there, uh, certainly can't you know take a trail there because those segments are not completed. And I know this county took that on as a project. I know Matt's Darrow's here from the DOT. So I don't have any specific questions. I just want to put it out there that I think it's going to be incumbent upon this board, certainly our, our um, uh, staff, uh, not just DOT, but I ho others as well, uh, I think throughout the administrative staff, to keep this as a priority, one funding um, is going to be on the county's backs because of the way we modified the infrastructure financing plan. And if it's not constructed at grade, I think there'll be tremendous concern uh, by folks who now are homeowners and residents of the area. But it's a, it's a vital link from public safety standpoint, from a public convenience standpoint, from walkability, and we're gonna hear this afternoon a whole active transportation plan. That link is key, um, certainly it's not going to get resolved, uh, you know, anytime in the next few, in the next couple of months. But I guess I would encourage planning staff, Department of Transportation staff. I've gone over this in my briefing with uh, uh, Ms. Edwards and and, and, and others. I, it, it needs to be a priority. And if it's not, I can uh, I can almost be assured as I'm sitting here today that those of you that will be here long after I'm gone, you will get. A more of an outcry from residents in the area and the CPAC will begin to, I think, take into consideration impacts and what happened in the planning process that broke down that that road didn't get completed. And again, it's, it's so it's not totally within our uh, within our hands. We're collecting fees though and the whole program and, and having been here when we heard these projects uh, long before subdivision maps came behind, that was always contemplated as a major linkage uh, for the newly developing uh, community areas in, in, in that part of the world. And so uh, I would just say that um, it needs to be a priority, it is, it needs to be a high priority. And in the event we're not successful in getting that road completed, because it's on the county now, it's not on Lennar, it's not on the developers and the owners of these, they're gonna pay a fee and it falls to us. And if we don't find a way to get that road done, you'll have these chambers at some point in time, I would predict they're gonna be filled with people saying, don't build one more house, don't build one more development until you get that road completed because they're going out of the way direction travel. Miles, and in, in if you look at you know congestion on Gerber and Florin and Bradshaw and South Watt, over time, not having that internal street will only contribute to that and it's gonna be a, a growing frustration. So uh, I know our staff knows that, but I just, I, I wanted to put that out there for the record because you know, we're not dealing with that directly today. But when Waterman Road comes up, it needs to be a priority, and we need to figure out how we're going to get that crossing completed across those, uh, you know, that railroad um, uh, right away there. And if we don't, um, shame on us. So, thanks. Anyway, that's all I had. Any other board members? If not, then I'll, Chris, uh, the applicant representatives, did you want to address the board? I didn't have anybody sign up to speak, so if you'd like to come forward, you're welcome to. So. Mr. Chair and other yeah. members of the board, thank you for your time um, today in consideration for our extension. Um, I think really what I wanted to, to come up here and speak towards was the fact that um, Emma Patent had kept us in the loop and has done a wonderful job and our whole department. Um, it's a tedious process that we didn't really know. There's you know six stops along the way. Um, it's been an eight month um, ordeal. Um, and we're looking forward to your final decision today so we can go ahead and move towards um, our next step. Okay, great. Thank you for those comments. Kudos to our staff. All right. I have no one time to speak. we have anyone on the phone, Madam Clerk? We do not have any callers. Okay. So with that, I'll bring back to the board. Unless there's any other questions, I would uh, move the staff recommendation as outlined in Mr. Pahuli's report. Second. Okay. Move a second. Please vote. Unanimous vote.
Thanks, Chris. Okay, next item. All right. All. Item 72 is the North Vineyard Greens Unit 11 project. This is a one-time year extent, one-time year time extension for a vesting tentative subdivision map to divide approximately 20 acres into 85 single family residential lots and four landscape lots into RD5 zone for a property located north of Gerber Road at the intersection of Gerber Road and Waterman Road in the vineyard community in the environmental document is a prior mitigated negative declaration. Okay. Okay, I also have a brief presentation for this <clears throat> item, which is also a vesting tentative subdivision map for unit 11. Uh, the subject site is comprised of two vacant parcels located north of Gerber Road at the intersection of Gerber Road and Waterman Road. Uh, the property is zoned RD5. Surrounding land uses are the same um, roughly as the ones that I had mentioned for the um, previous presentation. The, uh, in 2006, the board approved the North Vineyard Greens Unit 11 uh, vesting tentative subdivision map for a three-year period, originally expiring April 26, tw uh, 2009. The Unit 11 tentative map was eligible for statutory time extensions and a previous discretionary time extension approved by the board in March 2017. Mm -hmm. The current expiration date for unit the Unit 11 subdivision is October 26, uh, 2022. However, with the board's action last year to amend Sacramento County code related to time extensions, this map is eligible for the requested one-year time extension. Should also note that um, similar to the last presentation, uh, this uh, tentative map, the applicant has also submitted for the final map with the engineering division um, and approval of this extension will allow them time to complete that process. Uh, the applicant is requesting a time extension of one year, uh, which is the maximum amount of time available um, for this tentative map. The exhibit on this slide details the approved tentative subdivision map, which divides 20 acres into 85 single family lots and four landscape lots. Importantly, this tentative map also ties in seamlessly with the unit three subdivision to the east and north, providing necessary street and pedestrian connections. Uh, I mentioned the um, advisory recommendations during the previous presentation. These two uh, map extensions were packaged together for review at the, at the Vineyard CPAC, so the uh, same uh, comments that were received were received for this one with the same vote as well. Uh, as with the previous item, planning staff is supportive of the requested time extension. Uh, and uh, the recommenda recommended actions are, are listed on the uh, slide here for your consideration. That concludes my presentation. Happy to answer questions. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. I won't repeat what I said a moment ago, but it goes for every project that comes forward in the future. So, okay, uh, in this area. All right, I don't have anyone signed to speak, uh, so I'll invite the applicant if you'd like to come forward again. If there's any... <coughs> okay, I, I'll take that as... Uh, um, uh, kudos to our staff for their work. And uh, um, do we have any? We do not have any callers. Okay. All right. No callers. Uh, no questions by board members. And then uh, with that, I would uh, move the staff recommendation. Second. Okay. Please vote. Unanimous vote. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to our staff. Thank you, applicants. Um, Chris, or I'm sorry, Todd, do you want me to read both 73 and 74 into the record at the same time, or would you like me to do um, both? You can start with 73. Okay. Item 73 is the Sacramento County Active Transportation Plan, a general plan amendment to modify the text of the air quality element, circulation element, and environmental justice element to remove reference of the bicycle and pedestrian master plans to be replaced by the proposed Sacramento County Active Transportation Plan and a zoning ordinance amendment to amend the old Florentown special planning area to be consistent with the active transportation plan. Okay, thank you, Flo. Mr. Smith. Good afternoon, uh, Board of Supervisors. Todd Smith, your planning director here. Uh, I am not giving this presentation, but uh, Mickey McDaniel with SAC DOT will be. I just wanted to begin these next two items with a reminder for the board that these items, 73 and 74, constitute our third round of general plan amendments for this year. 
Uh, and so uh, as we get into the staff recommendations as part of both of these items, particularly this first one, we're gonna ask that the board hold off on uh, any action regarding the general plan uh, resolution and subsequent actions until uh, both hearings are conducted uh, for these items. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mickey. Thank you. Hi, Mickey. Hello, I'm Mickey McDaniel. I'm a senior planner at the Department of Transportation. It is my pleasure to present the final active transportation plan today. I am joined by Ron Vicari, our director of transportation who is on the line. We have Matt Darrow, chief of planning at the Department of Transportation and Christy Grabo, associate planner at Planning and Environmental Review. Our consultant team was led by Alta Planning Civic Thread, headed up public engagement, DKS Associates performed analysis. Our Sacramento County Bicycle Advisory Committee helped to develop this plan over the last two years, and our neighboring jurisdictions gave comment, which helped us to maintain connectivity across borders. I was here in February to discuss the draft plan as a workshop item with this board. I'm back today to refresh your memory on the plan and to update you on the planning actions and environmental document, as well as to seek your final approval of the plan. In the interest of time, I'm going to just skip the, the goals of the plan. In spring of 2020, we kicked off the first phase of engagement where we went out to the community to learn about the challenges people face when they are walking, biking, and rolling. We took this comment and in the second phase, we made a, a series of infrastructure recommendations based on that comment and also based on the analysis performed by Alta and DKS. We went back out to the community with a second set of virtual workshops, a series of pop-up activities, 20 in all, and a public web map, which received over 2,600 comments or likes. We took all of this comment and rolled it into a draft plan. We held a three week period where people commented on the plan and that ended in November of last year. We held workshops with this board and planning commission on the draft plan and took that comment as well. We posted an accessible version of the plan, meaning accessible to people using screen readers because they have visual impairments and we received another spate of comments from our Disability Advisory Commission, which we were happy to incorporate. We heard from this board in the workshop, in the workshop item back in Febu February that there is a concern about the prioritization of rural roads. In the plan, we added an acknowledgement that uh, rural roads are challenged in project scoring due to low crash frequencies, but that we have other other criteria, criteria um, in the scoring that are considered, such as connectivity and access. We also state a commitment to seeking bike funding, bike and ped funding for rural roads. We stand on the shoulders of other related plans, such as the ADA transition plan, which was adopted in 2019. <clears throat> that plan involved a lot of field, a, a lot of field work in order to determine the ADA compliance of public facilities, including sidewalks. This produced a mountain of geographic information systems data, which we used in order to focus where and how to make improvements in the ATP. This is one of the focus maps that shows, that shows the priority gaps where we would like to fill in sidewalks, as well as priority intersections. We have over 192 miles of sidewalks to fill in in unincorporated county, and we have identified 194 intersections where adding a crosswalk or a leading pedestrian interval, some sort of enhancement, could make these intersections safer to cross. Here we're looking at a focus map for bicycle projects. The full tables and maps are in the appendices. We are recommending over 1,200 miles of bikeways. 
We didn't stop at infrastructure. We also made programming recommendations in four categories, education programs, encouragement programs, safe routes to school, as well as infrastructure support programs. We recommended support such as classes for bicycle maintenance and repair. The county through the 50 corridor TMA has free pop-up bicycle repair events that are available now in Vineyard and Rosemont. Since, since we last spoke, Planning and Environmental Review has released the environmental document and I will talk a little more about that later. Planning Commission recommended approval of this plan to the board on August 22nd. Now we are here at number six at the end of a two year long planning process where we are seeking your approval. The active transportation plan is replacing the pedestrian master plan and bicycle master plan in the general plan. And thus it requires a general plan amendment in order to update the references to those older plans with the ATP. The ATP is consistent with the policies listed here on the slide within the air quality, circulation and environmental justice elements. Based on, based on uh, staff's, staff's work, uh, we, uh, the board can find the ATP consistent with the general plan. We are also taking this opportunity to update the old Florentown special plan area. Let's see. The, the bike path at the Anton Power Inn multifamily entitlement moved from the south and eastern edges of, that, of the project to west to be along Power Inn Road. So the ATP now includes this alignment and the old Florentown special plan area land use plan has been modified to reflect this request and an ordinance amending the spa is included in your package. An initial study negative declaration was prepared pursuant to CEQA for this project and release on May 13th, 2022. No public comments were received. A revised initial study negative declaration was posted on August 1st, 2022. No public comments were received. This revised ISND included an amended project description reflecting the general plan text amendments, spa amendment, and ATP mo map modifications for Old Florentown Spa. Staff recommends that the board determine that the environmental analysis prepared pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act is adequate and complete and adopt the negative declaration. As as Todd mentioned, we are going to hold on the rest of re the recommendations until after item 74. As children, we grow up on the sidewalk. Still now, it's where we stop and say hello to our neighbors. Part of each and every day, we are all walking and rolling. Some of us are also biking. Today, we plan for a Sacramento County where everyone can cross the street and ride their bike safely, easily, and more comfortably. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. So let's go to board members, uh, Supervisor Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. I <clears throat> don't have any questions. I just wanna really commend staff. I think this is a great report. Uh, it's also made better because of the really robust outreach that was done, that was clear. Um, and uh, I mean, particularly, you know, the connectivity of the trail uh, network, uh, right, where right now is so disjointed throughout the county and throughout the surrounding counties, because we look at this as a six region area. Um, SACOG has been talking about the connectivity of the trail networks uh, for quite some time. And, and I think that's reflected here. Um, so, uh, and, and also uh, for the accommodation of St. Anton, which is 194 units of, uh, of affordable housing, uh, that will be vitally important as we, you know, look at the, the housing crisis that we have. It's, it's, a, it's a big piece of South, South Sacramento. So um, just to staff, uh, thank you and job well done. Thanks, Patty. Supervisor Cerna. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I too uh, would like to thank staff for a great report, um, and um, and certainly doing um, uh, the amount of outreach that they did. Uh, one question I have 
as it relates to one of the environmental justice communities or part of, I guess, the broader environmental justice community that's on the map um, on slide four, which includes the Fruit Ridge pocket um, area north of Fruit Ridge. Um, we actually had a prior um, item um, that re, uh, that related to um, uh, community development block grant funding allocations. And for the first district, uh, the intention is to um, use those, uh, those funds to um, improve ADA access, including um, as it relates to um, sidewalks that are perhaps uh, more in disrepair than they are missing. But um, is there, has there been any discussion with SHRA in terms of some of the capital facilities that um, would be funded with community development block, grant, community development block grants that they're administered, uh, which are administered by SHRA? I believe, well, okay. Is, is the amount of money around 100K? It is, is it, exactly okay, 100K. So I, I have been asked about this project. I haven't had any communication with, with SHRA, but that's not to say that um, the principal civil engineer over my section, Refugio Rosso, may have. The only reason I bring it up is just to make sure that um, we don't have two different agencies uh, focused on the same thing called by different names gotcha. um, in terms of active transportation versus ADA uh, improvements. Um, so if there hasn't been any kind of um, uh, uh, cooperation or, or common understanding between uh, DOT and SHRA, at least as it relates to that particular uh, community and those particular um, improvements, I would encourage you to to do that. I believe that there may have been conversations already because I was asked to pull out the projects that are in that area for the purposes of SHRA to decide like okay. what kind of projects um, are already there. Good. So I think that communication is happening, but I'm not, it not directly with me. Great. Okay. Thank you. Great. Mr. Vice Desmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I too just want to underscore uh, Supervisor Kennedy's comments and thank staff for all your work. Obviously, it took a, a lot of different county departments were part of this process. And I know this started certainly before my tenure. But it is, it is remarkable just to see you know, the evolution of these unincorporated communities and went from kind of semi-rural, and this is all just even in my lifetime, semi-rural areas to uh, infrastructure that was completely uh, automobile-centric to now, you know, a growing desire to have these these better options for for cycling and and pedestrians and other other modes of transportation. So, I think it's, it's overwhelming how big the need is for the infrastructure improvements in, the, in these unincorporated areas. Uh, that really strikes me. Um, but I also want to. I just. I'm really. I, I applaud this effort being so focus, focused on the environmental justice communities and with a lens, an equity lens, which, you know, of course, dovetails with a lot of the work of SACOG. And it, it's something that, uh, you know, I've mentioned many times, and I know several of us have, you look at some of these older unincorporated communities where um, there has not been an equal investment in infrastructure or uh, some of these innovations. So I'm very glad that, uh, or very happy to support this today and thank you for the work and then look forward to the even harder work to come as you implement this plan. Thank you. Thank you. First, I wanna thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, it was so professional the way you delivered it. And thank um, all of you for the hard work on it. I, I want to say I was in a community meeting last night in North Highlands, and they were talking about the problem of people just crossing the road anywhere because there's no crosswalks in some of those areas. And so I know this um, creating walkability, and it, it's all about also creating a safer community and, um, and a more enriched living for everyone. So thanks for all your hard work, and I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I would just echo comments relative to you know, our staff and to the, the work that went into this. And again, I know that <clears throat> I kind of took you to task last February when we were talking about this as related to the rural areas. Um, so if you could maybe 
highlight once again what you just said because I know that I used an example. It wasn't directly responded to, not that you necessarily had to, but where we had a safe routes to school proposal 15 years ago that never got followed up on. Uh, and CW Diller has been rebuilt, rural setting. Um, uh, school is largely drive to, some bus, very little walking, but the connectivity between where the firehouse and the uh, the, one of the stores, service stations, the service area out there, and now what's the community center and the school. And I guess that was an example for me as to if it wasn't walking, it was certainly bicycling, and anybody would bicycle Diller Road taking their, taking their chances, I'll just say that, from Highway 99 all the way through. So I, I guess I'm curious um, to the language, and I, I <clears throat> heard what you said, but um, it, we're still challenged in those areas. And again, I get it. You have suburban areas with higher speeds, higher, well, higher traffic volumes, we'll say that, probably more um, interface with the, the, the multiple modes. But what is, so what do you say you're going to pursue funding? Well, you know, I, I, we just don't compete well in the rural areas. I'm just going to say that very frankly. Don't compete well for repayment monies, for some of these improvements. Can't even get stop signs in when we've got accidents happening out there unless you meet some engineering warrants, which is a big frustration that I've expressed to other members of your <clears throat> of your team. So how is it that, that what you just said is gonna help make us any more competitive, I guess? That's why I'm, what I need to understand. So my thoughts on seeking rural funding for bicycle and pedestrian facilities mm -hmm. have to do with uh, how they how those programs are currently scoring. So when we talk about bike ped funding, usually what comes to mind is the active transportation program, which is the largest source of funding within our state. Mm -hmm. uh, this round in cycle six, they had their biggest round ever. So maybe this isn't, um, it's not representative of other rounds, but in this last round, they had uh, they funded 170 million for just the small urban and rural set aside, which only is 10 percent of the whole pot. So it was really big this year. Of uh, there were 26 projects in that in that category, 100 percent were in disadvantaged communities. So it's not just that. So even if we work within the rural areas where we know the crash frequencies will be similar, we will still need to look for where we have um, either low income or high free and reduced price meal eligibility. So two uh, schools that come to mind are uh, Walnut Grove Elementary mm -hmm. and Dry Creek Elementary. Uh, those two schools would our, our schools that we're looking at right now to see what we can do around those schools as a possible safe routes to school project. And I say this, um, we, had, we have been talking about this, and then when I looked at the statistics from this last round, it seems that that is what they're funding. So it's 100% um, disadvantaged within the rural category, and also 19 of 26 projects were safe routes to school. So it looks like we may have some uh, traction there if we focus in that way. Another, um, another thought is that we can use alternative data uh, to crashes. So the active transportation program uh, uses, uh, allows you to use Street Story. So that is a website where you can record near misses. I have to say, though, that uh, a strategy like that will only work if there's significant outreach to be done because people don't just record right. near misses on their own. Thank goodness they're near misses, but you're right. They don't record those on their own. Right, so. but we can use this alternative safety data. And then my one more thought is uh, there are programs now that are starting to recognize that uh, in or taking the data... For, from crashes and making that a big part of the scoring criteria means that those programs are very reactive. Like, why? Why do we need to wait until something bad happens? So there is a program uh, under USDOT called Stray Safe Streets for All, which we did apply for in the first round of funding. And that is, uh, it's $1 billion for the nation. Um, it's a $150 million cap for the state of California. And that program, you can focus on speed reduction, and you do not necessarily have to have a record of crashes, but you have to show what the recorded speeds are and what the road hierarchy is, and you can make a case uh, for a safety-based case without 
crash without recorded crashes. So those are some of the things that we're looking at. Did, did we compete in that last one you just mentioned? We did. We, we submitted Elkhorn Boulevard, Columbia Streets. So the, because again, Walla Grove Elementary, yes, I would say you would, all of the Delta is within, you know, uh, <clears throat> certainly census tracts that are low mod or disadvantaged or severely disadvantaged. We've done this with sewer and water projects. Uh, and I think about the town of Hood, um, town of Franklin, and certainly Cortland, which has an elementary, Bates Elementary School. Uh, but I also would suggest that you take a look at, in particular, uh, the areas north and west of the city of Galt, where you have the you know urban suburban interface, but you have rural roads leading to schools, um, Greer, Greer element entry uh, on the uh, west side of Galt there, um, or excuse me, Greer Middle School, um, and there's a couple of elementary schools as well, and I know that those under our ARPA review uh, were. Uh, you know, qualifying census tracts. Some are actually within the city, some are in the unincorporated area of the county. And it would seem to me if that's some of the criteria that, you know, in addition to uh, other things that may be more static, is what moving projects up the ladder, then I would suggest we ought to take a look at those um, geographical areas. And I appreciate you looking at Walnut Grove Elementary, uh, but I do think that there are some other areas, uh, uh, certainly in the southern part of the county. Um, <clears throat> that would come to mind. I don't know that certainly Wilton might not be a qualifying census track. Um, and again, I mentioned that as a project with, with Dillard Road. I would also say take a look at um, uh, the Herald community with Arcoe Elementary and the middle school they have there. Um, and they have a small commercial area, but there's a park, county facilities. Um, and again, not a lot of walk to, but I think bicycling, uh, certainly if we want to encourage that, but again, I, I, I can imagine there's very few parents of any that would encourage your, <clears throat> some of their youngsters to ride on those roads with no shoulders to speak of, and some of the traffic speeds we find, and again, the inability to really enforce speeds uh, uh, in those areas because we just don't have the coverage. There's, you know, it's, it, CHP's busy responding to all the calls for service and accidents, and, you know, even though they've been, been responsive in the past to try to we have a particular issue. And so I guess I would just encourage us as a staff, because again, you've had a lot, a big county, a lot of areas that have you know, uh, sidewalk gaps, continuity, um, um, you know, lack of continuity for sidewalks and bike lanes and so forth. But if you're really going to encourage, you know, this networking, then I think certainly around where you have schools and small population centers in some of the rural areas of the county, not unlike Elkhorn Boulevard, obviously, with Real and Alberta and, and uh, some of the interface there with both the city and county uh, developments. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure it's a strong candidate. I'm familiar with the area. But I do think, as you're looking in the South County, Walla Grove being one, but you might want to look at some of those other suggestions that I've offered there. And whoever succeeds me, obviously, will want to sit down and get a briefing on the active transportation plan and how they might get input into you know some of the processes that are being looked at. Lastly, I would say to Supervisor Cerna's point that those census tracts also are block grant eligible. Um, and uh, I know there are ARPA eligible under our revenue replacement that we moved to. We're looking at those census tracts. So I think if you're looking at projects, either pavement rehabilitation or shoulders or intersections um, in years to come, the same staff that reached out to you regarding Fruit Ridge Pocket area, um, that uh, <clears throat> would, would be the same staff. It would no familiarity with the Delta and those uh, census tracts in and around the city of Galt. Okay. Thank you very much great. for your suggestions. Okay, great. And, and thank you for your work on this. Okay. All right. I don't have any time to speak. Anybody on the phone? We do not. <clears throat> we do not have any callers. So you're three for three with no public comments. You're two environmental documents and this one as well. So, okay. All right. With that, then we're just going to take one action and then keep the balance for the, uh, the general plan portion. So the action you're asking us to take right now is to improve the environmental document. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, that is correct. Okay. All right. So we'll need a motion to that effect. Okay, <clears throat> moved and seconded then to approve the environmental document and we'll hold the balance until the general plan round. Please vote. Okay, that's a unanimous vote. All right, very good. Item 74. All right, let me read that one into the record really quick. 
Item 74 is the Lund Construction Company Headquarters Rezone Project. This is a general plan amendment, community plan amendment, and rezone for a property located on the south side of Antelope Road, approximately 550 feet west of Roseville Road in the North Highlands community. And the environmental document is a mitigated negative declaration. Okay, Kimber Gutierrez, good to see you again. Good to see you yeah. again, too. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. Kimber Gutierrez, Senior Planner with Planning and Environmental Review, and I will be presenting the Lung Construction Company project to you all today. No problem. There, there you go, at the bottom right hand. You're right there, the bottom right hand, down at the bottom of the right hand corner of that presentation. If you click on that little icon there, it'll... All right. All right. Okay. Um, so the subject project area consists of two parcels that total um, approximately 11.58 gross acres in size and are located on the south side of Antelope Road, approximately 550 feet west of Roseville Road in the North Highlands community. The subject parcels are zoned M1 and MP. Um, M1 stands for light industrial and MP is industrial office park. The subject parcels are bound by Antelope Road to the north and the Union Pacific Railroad to the west. Um, across Antelope Road, there is a Walmart grocery store and across the railroad, there is single family residential development. Um, uses to the east and the south consist of warehouses and other industrial uses. Um, the subject parcels are only accessible via a shared private drive um, located off of Stationers Way, which is approximately one mile southwest of the intersection of Antelope Road and Roseville Road. Um, the applicant and property owner, Lund Construction Company, has um, recently outgrown their current headquarters location, um, and they are planning to relocate to the subject property as it provides uh, the appropriate acreage for expansion opportunities in the future. Um, so prior to submitting the proposed, uh, proposed entitlement application, they did um, undergo a design review as well as a boundary line adjustment. Um, the design review was improved of, in May of 2021, um, which involved a new um, service yard and workshop, an incidental office area, as well as vehicle wash stations, um, maintenance shops, and a company fuel station on the M1 zoned portion of the property. Um, the boundary line adjustment was recorded in June of 2021, resulting in the current lot configuration, which also matches the existing zoning district boundaries. Um, so the entitlement request is a general plan amendment, community plan amendment, and rezone. Um, this is to... Um, so upon approval, the subject par parcels, which total 11.58 gross acres, would have an intensive industrial general planned land use designation and an M1 community plan land use designation and zoning designation. So currently, um, the property does hold a transit-oriented development general plan land use designation and then industrial office park um, community plan designation and zoning district. This is an image showing the existing land use designations. Um, so you can see by the arrows that the 
part, the portion of the project closest to Antelope Road contains that transit-oriented development um, general plan designation as well as industrial office park community plan designation. And then parcel B um, just holds that zoning district um, of industrial office park. So here we have the proposed land use designations and as stated, it would all be um, intensive industrial as well as um, light industrial. The um, environmental document prepared for this project was an initial study and mitigated negative declaration. It was released for public review on June 22nd of 2022. And it did conclude that the project would result in a less than significant impact with the implementation of mitigation measures. The project was heard by the North Highland CPAC on December 2nd of 2021. And they recommend that the board approve the requested entitlements. Um, since the project is only a um, rezone general plan amendment and community plan amendment and does not involve specific development um, proposal that is not subject to design review. And then the planning commission met on August 22nd of this year and um, approved a resolution recommending that the board approve the general plan amendment and further recommended that the board approve the entitlement package. Um, I wanted to briefly go over um, Senate Bill 330 and its relation to the proposed project. Um, so under Senate Bill 330, parcels of land where housing is an allowable use may not be downzoned, and general or specific plan land use designations may not be changed to a less intensive use as compared to what was allowed in January of 2018. Um, this provision includes you know, any reductions in heights or densities and floor area ratios and other types of increased requirements. Um, so as discussed, the parcels do currently contain the transit-oriented development designation, which would allow for residential land uses. Um, none of the parcels are identified as being on the housing elements low income housing inventory, so um, they are not subject to a, a no net loss analysis. Um, additionally, the um, the MP and the um, M1 zoning districts do not allow for residential uses. So even though they have that transit-oriented development um, general plan land use designation, the zoning districts that are currently in place do not allow for residential development. Um, so therefore, the proposed entitlement package does not have an impact on the intensity of residential uses on the property, um, nor does it result in a downzoning of the parcel of land. Yes. Oh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Th thanks, Kimber. Just a question about this on the, 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 I had a discussion with staff yesterday about this um, property being designated as a transit or, you know, transit oriented development. Um, and that certainly never occurred. I think there's some, it's important to kind of flesh that out a little bit about why um, we think it's um, um, appropriate to uh, uh, make this zoning change and that this really n is no longer uh, a focus for a TOD. So Chris, could you maybe talk about that a little bit based on our discussion we had the other day? Sure, um, th this property as well as properties to the north of it um, were considered as part of a um, future Antelope Road um, uh, light rail station and associated development um, within a um, specific plan context or within a community plan co planning context, uh, that transit station is is no longer part of the plan, and so um, efforts to um, look at at um, rethinking those ultimate land uses uh, is necessary. And uh, this property, especially given the surrounding context of other properties um, being industrial type uses, it, it seems very appropriate that this uh, continue to be an, an industrial use. Great, I, I appreciate it. I, I think that background is, is important and the fact that we're, we're willing to reevaluate maybe some of these decisions that were, that were made in the past that just don't really seem to fit um, today. So thank you. Could, could I just ask a question though, when it comes to residential, because we're going to, an item is going to follow on to this, but I thought that M1 did allow for shelters. That was a zoning code amendment that was made a number of years ago. Is that not accurate? I, I do believe that shelters. Shelters, are yeah, not allowed, residential. Not so residential single family, but it does allow for shelters, which is people. 
living That's correct. there. Okay, right. so I just wanted to be clear because I know we've got another item coming up in a few minutes. So, okay, yeah. all right, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so um, based on staff's analysis, the proposed request can be found consistent with the general plan, community plan, and zoning code as conditioned. The subject parcels are not on the housing elements low income housing inventory. The project does not conflict with the provisions outlined in Senate Bill 330. The project is compatible with surrounding zoning and land uses. There are no significant environmental concerns, and the proposed request would allow Lund Construction Company to relocate their headquarter operations to a more appropriate site um, still within the North Highlands community. Um, this is a compatible with the existing land uses in the surrounding area and would um, allow for continued growth of an industrial business. Um, the project was also supported by the North Highland CPAC as well as the Planning Commission. So with that, staff is recommending approval of the entitlement package. Um, we do have um, the environmental document gets approved first and then the general plan. Okay. So right now, staff is recommending that the board take the following actions. Determine that the mitigated negative declaration prepared pursuant to CEQA is adequate and complete and adopt the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. And that concludes my presentation. Okay, thanks, Kimber. Any other questions of Kimber? All right, seeing none, then uh, I'll go to the applicant uh, or the representative, Mr. Huber. Good afternoon, Good Chair afternoon. Natoli, members of the board. Ryan Hooper with Thatch and Hooper here this afternoon to represent uh, Lund Construction Company. And I want to start just by saying thank you to staff for all of your diligent work and thank you for the excellent portrayal of the project. I think you did a great job saying most everything. And I'll just conclude by saying that we're very pleased that our client has the problem of outgrowing its current facility and that they're looking to, to grow. They have deep roots in Sacramento. Kevin Lund behind me, uh, third generation. Uh, with Lund Construction with over 200 employees. So they're very proud and very happy to look forward to moving into their new home. With that, I would say we're here for any questions you have. Thank you very much. Great, Ryan. Any questions, Mr. Hooper? All right, seeing Thank none. You. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, anyone else? I didn't have anybody else sign up to speak. Uh, do we have anyone on the phone, Madam Clerk? Excuse me, we do not. Okay, no so we have no, no one on the phone. Okay. All right, so I'll bring it back to the board. Uh, oh, okay, uh, Supervisor Desmond. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, changed very quickly. There was well, he, I, I just realized it's okay. in his district. Okay, so. okay. Yeah, you, you don't have all of North Highlands. I know. Right? I just got. I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> no, but thank you. And I, and I, I, I too. I just want to. I'm, I'm very happy that uh, Lund Construction is is investing in uh, unincorporated Sacramento County and and and. Um, uh, moving into this new space or want to move into this new space. And uh, with that, I, I will move approval of the environmental um, document and the and adopt the uh, mitigation monitoring. So I guess those are the two elements we need to include in a motion. Is that right, June, right now? Actually, since this is the last item on this general plan round, you can go ahead and approve everything. Great. And then we'll go back later to item 73 and approve the general plan amendment for that. Perfect. So I'll amend my motion to approve the staff recommendation in its entirety. Second. Second. Okay. Okay. Second and twice. All right. If there's nothing further, please vote. Unanimous vote. And I heard Kennedy first and then yeah, Ms. Frost, yeah, so I'll did, put yeah, Kennedy yeah, down yeah, if that, was, that's okay. Yeah. And then we'll go back to item 73. Okay, call 73 once again, please. Those are the uh, items two through four. Okay, so we have item 73, we have items two through four and 73. Um, do we have a motion on that? Move staff recommendation. Okay. Second. It's moving second then to approve going back to item 73. Now it adopts the resolution regarding the transportation plan and the ordinance as well as the general plan amendment. So that's all included in that. Nothing further, please vote. Okay. And unanimous vote. Okay. Very good. Thank you to our staff. All right. Item 75. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, now we have item 
75. This is to authorize the execution of a sales and purchase agreement with Exeter 4837 Watt LLC, a Delaware limited liability company for the acquisition of real property at 4837 Watt Avenue. Uh, this is to approve funding from phase two of the American Rescue Plan Act for the Department of General Services to consummate the acquisition with a purchase price of $22,800,000 and estimated closing cost of $25,679 and to approve an appropriation adjustment request in the amount of $22,825,679 for the Department of General Services. And the environmental document is a categorical exemption. Let me read the property uh, APN is Two four zero zero five five zero zero five nine. Thank you, Flo. If you could pull up the PowerPoint, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, members of the board. Emily Halkin, Director of Homeless Initiatives. I'm here today with Jeff Gasway, Director of General Services. We're very excited to be here today with what will be the first of probably multiple conversations around this site located um, and on Watt Avenue. Um, as you know, we've been talking about um, increasing in shelter capacity and rehousing capacity for quite t some time. The board has committed significant funding um, to support this. And one of the things we've been lifting up is a development of what we're calling safe stay communities. Um, and the concept behind safe stay communities is t um, threefold. First, to expand shelter capacity. We have many people who are unable to access shelter on any given night should they wish to. Um, certainly also to create some new options for those who are living unsheltered in our community. We, um, we know that many people can't or won't access traditional shelter. So safe stays have really provided us an opportunity to meet people where they're at, providing non-congregate shelter with wraparound services and as low barrier as possible to entry. And just as importantly, as we're talking about locations for safe stay, including this one, is ensuring that we are orienting these into the communities in which they are at so they provide relief to communities where currently there are unsanctioned encampments. Um, as part of this effort, in addition to embracing the concept, providing funding, you also declared a shelter crisis earlier this year, which gives ourselves as staff some expediting of planning processes and approvals, but does require that every community come back to the board for final approval before any construction begins. So today we're here to talk about a proposed new site at 4837 Watt Avenue. This location map locates uh, the, the site in the context of the broader community. The site, as many of you know, is very unique, um, not only because of some of the things we're going to talk about in a second, um, but it's also located, while it's in Supervisor Desmond's district, it is right at the cross of Supervisor Cerna and Supervisor Frost district. So this is a really unique location in the unincorporated county. As you are well aware, it's also in an area which has a lot of unsanctioned encampments up and along Roseville Road, in the McClellan Business Park, and elsewhere in this community. Zooming in a little bit further, this shows um, the actual parcel. Um, for some of you who have seen this site, you know that this is a former um, warehouse superstore. It is a very large site with a lot of parking, which is one of the things that's really attractive to us as we talk about this for a potential safe stay. So what we are asking for today is, again, the initial approval for uh, purchasing this site at a cost of $22.8 million. The site itself is 13 acres, including 130,000 foot square foot warehouse, and the balance nine acre, approximately nine acres of parking, which is all enclosed. Um, this site is ideal as we try to stand up safe stays and increase sheltering and rehousing capacity for many things. First, as I just said, it is located very proximate to existing camps and places where people are living unsheltered and are impacting the community. Um, it has more than sufficient space to co-locate critical services for folks who will be sheltering here and to bring in community partners to engage um, with people in helping them exit homelessness. And for the first time, it is the first site that will allow us the ability not just to provide indoor sheltering, but also to provide safe parking. We know we have a lot of people currently living in their vehicles and an unwilling or un unable to give up those vehicles to come into a traditional shelter. So while we, we certainly know um, a vehicle is not a long-term housing or sheltering option, this will give us the opportunity for people to come and safely park their cars and engage in services and, and hopefully exit out of homelessness. 
The reason we're bringing it to you today, apart from a broader conversation, which generally is what we would do, is because the seller who, who we have been talking with quite a bit is requiring the board to approve the purchase and sale agreement so they can discontinue marketing the site and we can continue down our planning path. So this is, again, the first step. We do plan to be back um, in front of you um, by November 15th which a with a little bit more information on our concept around the site plan, our concept around services, maybe some co more conversation about operational funding. I did want to say we have been working on this, as you know, for a few months, and there has already been some initial community engagement. On October 6th, there was a um, very productive conversation, I, I feel, with the McClellan Business Park. On October 13th, I understand Supervisor Desmond met with the Watt ADP bid. Um, over the course of this month and the upcoming month, there's lots of individual meetings with nearby businesses as well as some community associations. Next Tuesday, we have a community-wide meeting, and the invitations have gone out very broadly so that residents and businesses can engage. Um, and of course, pending approval today and the deeper discussion on November 15th, we will continue to have ongoing outreach and engagement with the community as we develop the plans for this project. Supervisor Desmond, do you want to weigh in? Mm -hmm. uh, just real quick, one other, uh, there was one, one, one additional meeting um, that we had at uh, McClellan Park, Supervisor Cerna and oh, I, right. it was a new business watch, so several of the, the... Last week. Oh, it was just last week, jeez. Yeah. Time is flying here. Um, but um, so we've actually had three community meetings already about this, but I'll have more comments in a moment. But Thank I just want to make sure, I wasn't I there, want to make so sure we, we put that on there too. Yeah, I, I, had the, I had the same comment, and that's why I was in the queue. Uh, I just want to make sure that um, that was noted, um, especially since it marked, I think, the first time um, outside of the smaller McClellan Business Park um, executive team that uh, both Supervisor Desmond and I had a chance to literally stand in front of a, a group of concerned uh, business owners um, to explain um, explain this in concept. Um, so yeah, I'm glad um, we both chimed in when we did. Thanks. Well, well, and thank you. And that actually concludes my comments. Jeff and I are both available for any questions should you have them. And really looking forward to um, this first step in continuing conversations around this uh, exciting project. <clears throat> Thanks. Emily. Thank you. Okay. Supervisor Frost. Uh, thank you, Emily. I just wanted to also add that I had a community meeting in North Highlands last night, and they uh, we discussed it, and they received it very well. And I have another business uh, meeting with a group of businesses tomorrow. tomorrow. So yes, I'll be joining you for that. Uh, oh, good. Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Meeting in a minute. Okay, uh, Supervisor Cerna. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to thank uh, Emily and Jeff and... Um, uh, the entire executive team uh, from Ann Edwards' office um, to uh, um, all of our um, social uh, services uh, staff and leadership. Uh, I think this is um, a long time coming. We've been uh, quietly looking at this site for some time now, and I, I really applaud Supervisor Desmond's uh, leadership, uh, knowing well that um, these types of proposals uh, aren't uh, always easy. That's probably an understatement. Um, but uh, as you mentioned, Emily, it does lie at a, in an area that's relatively close to all three supervisorial districts. And I think there's been um, ample support from all of us um, as the process has prog progressed in terms of the closing of the deal, per se. Um, and um, certainly I would expect that that kind of cooperative spirit will, will uh, continue. Um, I, you know, I also add that um, uh, I think this is an innovative approach for a lot of different reasons. Um, you mentioned the fact that this isn't just uh, an area that um, can have um, and host, uh, you know, individual units and all those details will will be worked out in the coming months should, should we approve this. Uh, but um, we, there are a number of folks, as you mentioned, that are unfortunately um, left to live in their vehicles right now or feel compelled that that's their only choice. And this, this site lends itself, I think, well to kind of both shelter typologies. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm very excited about it. Um, I'm hopeful that um, those that have been um, critical of the county for months now, um, claiming that, you know, or insinuating that we're not doing 
as much as we should or we're not doing anything at all, we're otherwise sitting on our hands while other jurisdictions uh, seem to be, you know, um, uh, working in a flurry to, to find sites now understand that, um, you know, we were doing our due diligence to make sure that um, this is a site that kind of meets our, our needs given the fact that we're moving forward with a safe stay um, uh, kind of architecture to, to how we um, uh, plan to get to yes when it mean when it means you know uh, addressing those that are unsheltered and making sure that they feel welcome and have the uh, the amenities that they oftentimes tell us they must have uh, to accept the the services and the shelter that we're offering. So I'm very excited about it, um, and I'll just add to that uh, in terms of uh, ARPA funding, even the ARPA funding um, that might be used to help finance this is reflected by um, uh, four of the five uh, supervisorial districts that in terms of the district ARPA fund. So that's just another gauge by which to um, to really conclude that this has been kind of a team effort. So uh, just kudos to everyone involved. Okay, thanks, Bill. Supervisor Desmond. Thank you. If I had known you were at the end of the presentation, I would have just kept talking instead of <laughs> chiming out and chiming back in. So I thank you, uh, uh, Supervisor Cern. I, I, couldn't agree more with everything you said. And, and first, thank you, Emily. I mean, I wish we could clone you because I think we'd be probably doing a lot more, frankly. Um, but I, 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 I join Supervisor Cern. I'm being very excited about this. I mean, I, I think this is really kind of a watershed moment for the county to be investing in, in, a, in a project of this nature, of this size. Um, and, and I think just as Supervisor Cerner was saying, you know, the, the model that we have, I think that we are um, embarking upon, certainly the, the, the sites that we approved in, in Supervisor Kennedy's district, and I know he was kind of the guinea pig for this kind of thing, and, and I'm certainly learning from a lot of the, the lumps that he took in, in the community with, with our, our outreach here, with, with of course, uh, your help, Emily. Um, this is a way to get over the trepidation, both by the, the people who are living unsheltered, out on our streets and the trepidation of the, of the community. And, and I think the model that we are um, pursuing here. So I think that I'm extremely supportive of that. And I just also want to applaud you and I, and I think my, my, my colleagues up here, because I think we are all really coalescing around the idea. And, and I'll, I'll actually paraphrase Supervisor Cerna that at one of our community meetings that we have, we have dual responsibilities on this board. One is to those who need help you know, those who were unsheltered living on our streets and open spaces or in their RVs. But we also have an obligation um, to ensure a high quality life for our, 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 our small businesses and, and residents in their neighborhoods. And, and you call that out specifically in this, in this board item, that this is going to, uh, we are endeavoring to uh, meet both of those dual obligations. Um, and, and, and I really appreciate that. And, and you know, in some of the, the community meetings we've already had, it really strikes me as we're talking to either folks in McClellan, or I was talking to the folks in 80 Watt, there is a, um, there's a high level of trust, I think, in, in the supervisors that represent this, this area, the three supervisors there. And I think we have, um, we have an obligation to ensure we live up to that level of trust by making sure that this, this site, um, before it begins operation, that operation is really informed and influenced by ongoing, continued community outreach. And I, and I think there are certainly things we can learn from and in, in, in from the lessons off, off the sites off uh, Florin Road. Um, and that we will be responsive to, to needs of the community as, as some of these uh, issues, um, issues develop. So I, I look forward to, um, I think we have a larger, the larger community event uh, on November 1st, and I believe Three of the supervisors will all be there, and it'll be a more of a public meeting, if I'm not uh, mistaken. I, I'm looking to our county council, so, since all three of us will be there. Correct. Okay. Yes, Thank it will be noticed as such. Okay. Thank you. And uh, uh, to start having that larger uh, community engagement. But uh, just appreciate all your work and, and really look forward to moving this forward with, with all deliberate speed, which I know is, is a problem at times as well. So thank you, Emily. Thank you. Okay, Supervisor Frost. I try not to repeat what everyone else said, but I agreed with all of it. And I also want to say that I know that you had uh, other opp opportunities, you and Jeff and and, um, 
and uh, many of the staff had come and talked about some of the other opportunities. And I really appreciate that you prioritized the unincorporated county and our financial interest in, and I don't quite know how you found such a perfect spot, but you not only found it, it wasn't for sale, you you went after it. Well, so. I didn't find it, John Roca did. I have to give him credit, John. John, um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I know we've met a couple times and we've been out on the property, but um, I also want to say that this is more than, you know, an opportunity to move people out of homelessness. This really literally is the the dual the dual opportunity that he's talking about, the carrot and the stick, is a tool, not only for us at the county, but for our um, public safety and our you know rangers and our so ma our navigators and our hearts and uh, it's a way that you know we actually have more um, shelter to offer so we can offer it and if they don't want it we can move them and we can hopefully um, continue to find other perfect locations so that we have the capacity to really take back control of our business districts and our residential areas and our parkways and our streets. So and I'm so excited and I'm, I'm proud to support it. And I also want to say that so far the conversations I'm having in North Highlands are very positive and they're really they wanted to start planning it last night, and I said, "No, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be working on that. We're not ready for that yet. We have to get the property first. But they're excited. So, congratulations to you and to everyone who worked on it. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, County Council. Oh, I forgot one thing. Okay. I want to personally thank Supervisor Kennedy for pitching in a million of his ARPA funds to to help us out in our district. Um, it did not go unnoticed by this member. Great. Okay. I Lisa. was just going to add, I, I'm not sure if a motion is um, forthcoming, but it sounds like it may be. Um, one thing that was uh, omitted, <laughs> <laughs> omitted from the board packet was the um, statutory exemption. Um, and so it is a statutory exemption. It was um, also called a categorical exemption in the board materials. But I wanted to acknowledge that that um, is now in your materials and will be uploaded to the agenda. Um, and it should be included in any motion that is made. Great, okay, thanks for that, Lisa. All right, um, was somebody else in queue here? Okay, if not. We, we do have a caller. Okay, yeah, I'll get to that. All right, very good, let's go to, I don't have anybody in chambers then, go to your caller, please. <clears throat> okay, uh, so could you transfer the caller, please? Mr. Antoli, did you get a speaker slip? For in person? No, I did no. not. Okay. That's what I said. Thank none. you. Hi, caller. Uh, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. And if you could mute the meeting in the background while you're talking, that would be great. I'm sorry, what did you say? If you could mute the meeting while you're talking. To yes, I will. To avoid I the echo. Kind of... Yeah. Okay. And then uh, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Uh, good afternoon, Supervisors. This is Rick Eaton speaking on behalf of Sacramento Area Congregations Together. The Sacramento Act has long advocated for the creation of more shelter spaces, so we are obviously very pleased uh, with uh, and want to lend our support to bringing this proposal forward. Uh, my original note said to thank Supervisor Desmond for his leadership on this, but it's obvious that I should be thanking more than just Supervisor Desmond, but a number of you are at the dais and, of course, the staff. Uh, so I won't belabor the point of our support other than to again say that we're very pleased to see this moving forward. We think it's a great step and we're very encouraged by the fact that there isn't considerable community oppositions to this. I think that 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 signals at least to us that the community broadly is um, is ready to embrace solutions like this. Uh, we do have a couple of concerns that we want to highlight for future consideration for you. Um, one is a little concern about equity. All three of the safe, safe communities that are in the pipeline now, as of this one, are in lower income communities. Uh, we think that's problematic, uh, that all communities should, if possible, share in uh, providing solutions for homelessness. Now, obviously, we recognize that a site of this size is 
simply not available in places like Carmichael or Fair Oaks. But we think there are opportunities perhaps to explore smaller footprints, uh, more neighborhood-based sites that would be appropriate to um, other parts of the county. Um, our second point is that even though we strongly support this measure, we're concerned that the county continues to make decisions around combating homelessness without the benefits of an overall plan. We think we need a guiding plan, just as County Executive Ann Edwards indicated in her recent op-ed to the B. Well, we think a coordinated, comprehensive plan that addresses housing, mental health, emergency shelter, homelessness prevention, all of these things will demonstrate to the public that this problem can be solved and will get better. A plan like this could be a rallying point for the community and will enable all elements of the community to work together um, to create really what all of us want, which is a region with a great quality of life that we can all be proud of and a place where everyone has a secure and dignified place to live. So again, thank you to Emily Halkin, staff, and the supervisors for bringing this forward. Mm -hmm. Good you, afternoon. Rick. Yes, thank you, Rick, for the comments. Okay, uh, do we have any other speakers? We do not have any other okay. callers. All right, Supervisor Frost. Um, I just yeah, wanted yeah. to ask Emily a quick question while you're here. In one of the questions that people had regarding the uh, automobiles on the property, the ingress and egress and the fact that we're, we have like a project manager managing how people enter and leave the property there and there's no loitering around the property. They had a question regarding, well, what if they have a, what if they're in their car in the parking lot? Can they drive, come and go? And I, I said, we'll work all that stuff out, but I'm curious. And I thought since you're here, I would yeah. just ask you. No, I appreciate, I saw that that question, your staff's comments, which I hadn't also thought of. So I, might, I think that's something we'll have to take to heart. This is the first time we will have um, allowed folks uh, safe, safe parking. But one of the things that I think was lifted up that we have seen at the two Florin sites, and we certainly intend to replicate at every safe stay, is that sort of ingress, egress management. It does become a little more complicated when people have a vehicle, especially that vehicle is operable. Um, so definitely noted that. And as we look to stand up our operator, make sure that we, we consider how that will be managed because it is a little bit different. So don't have an answer yet, but we will make sure that that's, that's, that's thoughtfully planned out and so that when vehicles are coming and going, that they're abiding by similar sort of um, good neighbor rules and regulations. And there was a shelter closer to the freeway on Watt. Do you know what I'm talking about? On um, Watt? The cities? Uh, no, the, no, the no. Oh, the there Science was, Center, yes, on uh, Auburn? Uh, you possibly, they mentioned it, and they wondered if they were going to, if this was going to become where we're going to put all the shelters. And I didn't know if that other shelter was even still there, or if it was a shelter or a permanent housing. I just wondered if anyone knew anything about it. Yeah, the if, if they're referring well. to the, what we call the science center, but I think the city calls the Auburn Respite Center, it is a respite center. It's got a 50 bed capacity. It just opened a couple weeks ago. I don't know um, the current occupancy. It's a private business. Uh, no, it, it's it's run by the city of Sacramento. They've got a oh. nonprofit partner um, operating it. Supervisor Desmond may know more about it, but my understanding is it is intended to remain open. <laughs> Sorry. Why are you laughing? Um, no, just because we both know too much about it. You so, know more than you want to know. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, we can figure all this out that later. That would be the most curious. proximate shelter that I'm aware of to this site. You did the motel conversion to affordable complex with SHRA, which is not a shelter. That's not a shelter, right? No, so they, they could have been referring to That's, that's a permanent. I think housing. that might be what the they're referring to. The court, yeah, the Mercy Housing, yeah, right. Mercy Housing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, Ann? Yes, I would like uh, Ms. Katari to just respond to the statement about the fact that we don't have a plan um, because we do, and Ms. Katari can speak to that. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mr. Eaton brought up a point about a, a, a plan, and we do have the local homeless assistance plan that the board did adopt alongside the city of Sacramento as well as SSF and our uh, COC, Continuum of Care. And I just wanted to mention where we're at in that process is there were six pillars that were adopted in that plan, including the things that he outlined. Currently, we have work groups uh, from the city, the county, and the COC who are working together to put in some uh, 
um, measurable action steps so that we can work towards that plan. Once that's finalized, which I anticipate will be probably just after the first of the year, we will share that back with the board. But we feel very good about this collaborative plan that we have that does address the multi-prong approach that um, one of which you're adopting today, but that the board has um, already endorsed and bought into. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Sean, uh, Patrick. Thank you. I'll just add to that that um, it's it's truly a countywide plan in that there's input and conversations going on with not just the city of Sacramento and steps forward and COC, but also with all of the other cities in in the county. So it, it truly is, you know, the first time that there's been a comprehensive countywide effort that takes into account all of those jurisdictions. <clears throat> Great. Thanks. Um, so I just turn. Yeah, just to beat beat the dead horse. Um, I think the fact that we got that one comment about where's the plan when there is one is just further proof that we're not telling our story well enough. Um, I hate to keep bringing it up, but um, I think that's proof positive that uh, our communication around the subject of homelessness uh, still needs to improve uh, because um, with today's action and everything else that has kind of compound compounded upon itself in the last, I just say in the last two months, uh, whether it was final budget, whether it was uh, some of the workshops that we've had, um, and certainly some of the difficult meetings we've had over the summer with uh, the first uh, safe stay community being proposed, uh, there's so much to talk about. And there's so much to make sure that, you know, folks in the community, whether they're, you know, self-labeling as a homeless advocate or just, you know, one of our con concerned constituents that um, happens to email us on a regular basis about the subject, they need to know about what we are doing. So we need to be really deliberate about it. Um, I was at a meeting with Emily, in fact, just yesterday, and, and my chief of staff and uh, Siobhan, and it, we were spending most of our breath telling folks along the Broadway quarter what it is we're doing. They had never heard of it. You know, they didn't know what we were doing. Um, and you can see their eyes get big, and, and they were almost to the point of, like, being apologetic for um, not knowing. And, I, you know, and it kind of put us in a, uh, put me at least in an awkward situation. So we really need to get our, our story out. And until we do, I'll keep bringing it up. Okay, thanks, Bill. Um, I wanted to just ask on the next steps, if I could, Emily, just real quickly. So you're going to be back. The plan is for you and Jeff to be back to this board um, in about <clears throat> three weeks um, with discussion about operational and improvements uh, to the site, which obviously are identified in the very generally in the notice of exemption uh, on the environmental document, but restrooms, sprinklers, and kitchen facilities, and then whatever else is going to be encompassed in that. Will you be bringing a budget for both uh, that and how that would be funded? And then secondly, uh, for the operational aspects, just as you did with other safe stay sites uh, as to what's anticipated for what period of time. I assume for purchasing a site, this is a different approach. I don't assume. I know it's a different approach than what <clears throat> we contemplated uh, in, in a couple of the previous discussions, at least one where it was the least site. Uh, um, so is that what, we're, what we will expect uh, beyond, obviously, the benefit of whatever occurs at the community meetings and uh, suggestions, but you're going to be bringing a, a plan for the actual improvements, the suggested improvements to the site? Yeah, and, I, and definitely would let Jeff hop in as well. What I imagine the 15th will be will be a conceptual plan. We'll, we'll, between now, between now and then, we'll get our bearings on a conceptual plan for how many units. What you know, maybe some generic layouts. Certainly, we'll we'll uh, put some um, estimates in terms of cost for both the construction and the operations, um, and, and start that conversation. I think that this is a big site that will require probably a lot of in-depth work on Jeff's part to get get the precision to get a, an exact number. But it is our intention to bring those concepts forward. Um, on your second question about the length of stay, I do imagine this site would be a more permanent fixture in our sheltering community until mm. the point we don't need it. Um, I don't know if Jeff has more he wants to add. Okay. Thanks, Emily. Jeff. Jeff Gasway, Director of General Services. We'll also be bringing the ongoing cost for the facility, um, you know, maintenance and operation, because it is going to be a county-owned facility as well as a 2% use allowance, utilities, and all those other things. So, is, so does, it, does it get into the mix then when it's a 2% use allowance? We just brought, I guess, parks into that 
into that equation or Mather into that equation just this year in budget. Right. I don't think we brought Parks in, but Mather. So that's going to affect the loaded rate for all, all county departments come next budget year or ensuing budget years. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. I think, you know, as far as coming up, well, like Emily said, we'll have some conceptual plans. We may not zero in on the exact budget um, because we aren't that far along in the planning process. So. so will we have, I guess the question I have, maybe this is for Ann too, but so will we, will we have exhausted the ARPA contribution to this site via the purchase? Because I see other dollars that are already going into this. So um, again, I don't want to get too far out ahead of it, but I just think from a standpoint of what we're going to see in two and a half weeks. So. The purchase is primarily ARPA, and actually Emily is well versed in all of this. Um, some of Thanks, the Jeff. district contributions will also um, go towards both purchase and operations, I believe, but I'm going to let Emily. Yeah, I, I believe that um, within the second allocation of ARPA, we sh will have enough remaining to do most of the improvements to the site, if not all of them, depending on where Jeff lands. The ongoing operations, we may need to also contemplate using some of our state dollars. We have a fourth round of HAP coming up, which we'll soon be talking to you about, um, actually potentially on the same day because of the timing. Um, so we are looking at coming forward with at least a plan for the first few years of operations, but you know, to Supervisor Natoli's point, depending on how long this sort of stays in our inventory, there will be ongoing costs. But we do anticipate being able to cover all of the capital costs with the ARPA. Capital costs of actually doing the improvements? Yes, the purchase as well as the improvements. Okay, because that wasn't clear in the staff report. The cover letter just it should, yeah. said the district there's contributions. A, yeah, yeah, there's a balance uh, when you take ARPA 1 and ARPA 2 and what you have committed in the homeless and housing bucket offset by the $4 million that the four of you put in. There is a balance remaining. Um, I believe it's uh, somewhere in the $20 million-ish range. And yeah. so we, I'm hoping that, uh, and I believe Jeff would agree that that's, that should be sufficient for the, the improvements. Okay, all right. That wasn't that was not clear, at least in the statement here. So, okay. So, what, sir? Thank you. Uh, one uh, last uh, piece of information that I didn't hear, um, Emily, you, you referenced, but I think it's really important to note, especially for those that might be watching, um, is the immediate adjacency of a clinic, right? Yes. Yeah, and the the parking lot immediately abuts a, a sort of commercial um, parking lot, which includes um, Ellica Health Clinic. We have not yet engaged with them because we wanted your approval first, but certainly they are a huge partner to us in providing health care and behavioral health services to folks experiencing homelessness. And that uh, that location um, is a clinic space that, that receives and treats folks. So we are certainly looking forward to engaging a conversation with them shortly and hope they'll be a partner. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Great. Good. Um, no further questions then of staff, so I'll bring it back to our board then, and uh, we have an item to, to include the notice of exemption as well, but uh, for the purchase and sale agreement, so I'll turn to my colleagues. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I will en enthusiastically uh, move approval of the, the, the staff report, including the uh, exemption. Okay. I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Um, unless there's any further questions, please vote. The unanimous vote. Thank you to all. Call the seller. More to come. <laughs> more to come. Okay, very good. No more marketing. <laughs> all right, very good. Thank you. All right, we just got a couple of uh, concluding items here today. So we have our uh, appointments uh, and nominations. Yep, so for um, item 76, are you guys ready for that? Do you have your nominations? I think you have 10 actions that you need to take today. Okay. So you're continuing to November 8th, the Adult and Aging Commission, continuing to December 6th, the Antelope Community Planning Advisory Council, Assessment Appeals Board, Building Board of, of Appeals, Cemetery Advisory Commission, Cordova Community Planning Advisory Council, Casumnas Area Community Planning Advisory Council, County Service Area 4C Delta, Delta Citizens Municipal Advisory Council, Developmental Disabilities Planning and Advisory Council, Elk Grove Casumnas Cemetery District, In-Home Supportive Services Advisory Committee, Local Child Care Planning and Development Council, Maternal Child and Adolescent Health Advisory Board, Natomas Community Planning Advisory Council, North Highlands Foothill Farms Community Planning Advisory Council, Orangeville Community Planning Advisory Council, the Rio Linda Alberta Community Planning Advisory Council, Sacramento County Behavioral Health Youth Advisory Board, Sacramento County Commission on the Status of Women and Girls, Sacramento County Treasury Oversight Committee, Sacramento, uh, excuse me, South Sacramento Area Community Planning Advisory Council, the Southeast Area 
Community Planning Advisory Council, the Veterans Advisory Commission, and the Vineyard Area Community Planning Advisory Council. And for today, uh, we have the Carmichael Recreation and Park District. Please continue to December 6th. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Carmichael Old Foothill Farms Community Planning Advisory Council. Please continue to December 6th. Thank you. Thank you. Children's Coalition. <clears throat> Recommended that we nominate to Heather Wyden and then continue the remainder to December the 6th. Thank you. County Service Area 4B, Slough House, Wilton, Kasumnas. Um, I'd like to just continue that to um, uh, November the 8th, please. We okay. have a pending interview. We, we, we've, we've interviewed one, but I want to double check on something. So November. Okay, that's, that's yeah. fine. Yes. And what would you like to do, Supervisor Frost? Because uh, the county service area 4Bs. Continue to December 6, please. Thank you. All right. Equal Employment Opportunity Advisory Committee. Recommended to continue that to December 6th. Thank you. Fair Oaks Community Planning Advisory Council. Continue to November 8th, please. No. And the Sacramento County Bicycle Advisory Committee. Okay. It's recommended to nominate uh, Garrett Jensen. Okay. Uh, then uh, Sacramento County Mental Health Board. Um, I'll start with Supervisor Serna. Please continue to December 6th. And then uh, Supervisor Frost. Please continue to December 6th. And um, that's that. Okay. And then uh, Sacramento County Youth Commission. I'll start with Supervisor Serna. Please continue to December 6th. And uh, Supervisor Kennedy. Nominate Julie Dang and continue the remainder to December 6th. Okay, and then um, Supervisor Desmond. Please continue to December 6th. And Mr. Natoli. Uh, <clears throat> we're doing some outreach, so I want to continue that to November the 15th, if we could, please. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Sacramento uh, Environmental Commission, this is your last one. It's recommended to continue to November 15th. There's a pending interview. Okay. Thank you. And that concludes your nominations. All right. With that, then, uh, that's our <clears throat> action item. So we'll go to board member comments. Uh, it's county executive comments. Oh, county executive comments. Okay. <laughs> and Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, as you all know, elections have become increasingly challenging for staff who work on elections. And I want to just take this opportunity to thank the team at Voter Registration and Elections for continuing to administer transparent, accurate, and secure elections with the highest integrity. They are hardworking and dedicated public servants who work an incredible amount of hours and are committed to doing their jobs exceptionally well. They are the quiet architects behind the collective success of well-administered elections in Sacramento County. Voter registration in elections is not suspicious. In fact, they are trustworthy, open, and transparent. They welcome elected observers to watch their process and offers guided tours by appointments on Wednesdays and Thursdays to educate the public about the complex elections in the county. So I just want to thank all of them for their very hard and dedicated work. Anything else you wanted to add? No? Okay, thanks. All right, board members. Um, Supervisor Stern. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, real quick, uh, I, I'm going to direct this to our CEO uh, in light of the fact that we don't have any DOT um, leadership here. But um, I, I want to just say again um, how frustrated our district is um, and the frustration is growing. Uh, I think it's fair to say relative to what appears to be kind of lack of cooperation um, from DOT when it comes to uh, what we're de dealing with uh, at Watt, Watt and Elder Creek. And I know, Mr. Chair, that um, this is a part of the county where you, you and I share the responsibility for representation. Um, but there have been a number of instances now, um, unfortunately, where uh, we're just not getting any movement. We're not getting anything but can't, won't, don't, you know, and no from DOT when it comes to exploring what we think are some kind of creative ways to uh, best handle the what is now a very clear public safety problem as it relates to growing and, uh, homeless encampments, uh, including RVs um, and uh, and also fire risk uh, in this part of the county. So. Um, 
I wanted to uh, put that on the record today again. Um, and if the CEO wants to respond, that'd be great. But um, again, in the absence of having um, our DOT in, in chambers right now to hear it directly from me, um, I'm really, really asking sincerely for some help because uh, what's occurred to date is not helping. It's just growing the frustration. If, if I could, I just want to give Ann a chance to respond, but I know the cleanup that was done a couple of weeks ago, within hours, it began to reappear. Uh, we spent, I don't know how much money and certainly time, and again, code enforcement, Department of Transportation, whoever else was in on the coordination, the Department of Waste Management, recycling, if they were a part of it. Um, and so, effectively, we spent money Cleared the area of the, you know, accumulation, and uh, I don't know what the outreach was. Maybe you do, Phil, to the occupants there, but uh, it was just a matter of hours that folks, in, in, and I heard that report from folks who were very appreciative that the county had acted to move. They, and bet the one company, hopefully we were able to help people find alternative locations to either be housed or whatever, and then it reappears. And again, I haven't, and haven't driven in recent days, but um, uh, that was very short-lived, so... And I would just, I guess, <clears throat> comment too, because it, it goes to, I think, some of the challenges we're having. Um, it's been reported to me, and I know Supervisor Desmond, I don't you know, want to <clears throat> step on your toes, but the Citrus Road location that we've heard about here, I did hear from certainly a, a good source that the size of the encampment there has grown. I won't say doubled. Um, and, and I can tell you that as recently as yesterday, in fact, my office was fielding the calls that in that Mayhew Road area, uh, Micron Mayhew Tech Center Drive, we had a fire two nights ago, burned some of the fences, or a fence of one of the neighbors um, working with DOT. We have property that DOT actually controls, on the, at least on the, um, the overcrossing at Mayhew on the, on the west side, and we put some boulders in there. But the activities, because the weather, the weather has begun to change, it's colder, we had campfires anyway, um, but the inability for us, and whether it's DOT, I don't know where we are with the hot team, I don't know where we are with our encampment teams, with the folks that would go out there and actually offer services, but the coordination, and again, I've got a community meeting tonight, and I'm sure I'm gonna hear about it, uh, and we're responsive, we're patient, we've uh, talked with staff at different levels, I say responsive in the sense of the county being responsive, and certainly have pleaded patience, but people's patience is wearing thin with some of the incidents that have occurred very recently, and certainly you're hearing expressed through some board members here today. It's not about the ordinance and the ability to, you know, to uh, do something that offers some alternatives, but uh, again, I think the citizenry recognizes, just like on the item we talked on two items ago, that we're, you know, working to do some things, but if we don't get a better handle on our ability to respond to some of these specific situations that are known to everybody that's here in this room, but certainly others, and to do it in a way that we tell we, people we have an encampment team, but you know, what is it that we're doing that then allows us to move forward to you know deal with some of these situations? So, again, I haven't talked to you recently about this, but I know I've got a community meeting tonight, and I got calls uh, in the last two days. Uh, uh, folks, frustration is is, is is growing, and their patience is is wearing thin in some of these cases, and and uh, even with our best efforts. And so, I don't know what else we can do in some of these cases, but we need to, I think, do everything that we can to be responsive and be compassionate to the folks that are residing in some of these camps. But the fire situation is not tolerable for residents, for you know, and campers, uh, homeless, whoever it is, uh, in, in, in these locations, and it poses a real threat, um, as it does along the parkway as well. So I don't know, uh, Supervisor Kennedy, are you you've in the queue, so. Well, while we're piling on, um, there's, there's also an encampment that I would like to elevate to the encampment team that's on county property. Uh, it's almost to District 5, it's in District 2, it's down at the East Stockton and Calvine. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm just bringing it up now because it's, it's growing fast and it's gonna get worse. So I just wanted to elevate that to the encampment teams if they can put it on the rotation. Well, no, well, I'm glad you did because that's an area where just immediately across the freeway in the city right. last year there was a very large right, and that's city. what that's what's happened, and it's displaced it. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, know, yeah. Uh, you know, so no, I would I would agree with you on that, Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, and, and I won't you know I won't I won't pile on, but just to, just to mention you know it's something I think we should 
I, I brought this up in the context of a discussion about Alt Arden recently um, about before we go out to these sites that we target for with our encampment teams is to somehow set aside a certain amount of capacity at our existing shelters and certainly bringing on more safe state communities will allow us to do even more of that but to really give us more latitude to to say look we're offering you one of these kind of in my opinion really gold standard shelter model and if you don't take it you cannot continue camping you, you know you, we can't force you into it but you cannot keep camping here. Um, I, I think that's something that we need to consider and maybe bake into some of these models so we have more flexibility to be able to do that. And if I'm not mistaken, if we if we make that offer, um, we do have more, obviously, more latitude to be able to prevent people from camping in public places. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So you've all said quite a lot, which I think um, makes it quite clear that this is a very complex and complicated and very difficult to solve issue. Um, I can assure you that everyone is working very, very hard to and try and address all of the issues that you are raising. Um, but there are a number of things. First of all, regarding the Watt and Elder Creek um, encampment, unfortunately that we had a meeting that had to be rescheduled, but we do have a meeting with many, many Everyone who's involved will be at that meeting a week from today, excuse me, a week from yesterday on the 31st at 9 a.m. So we will have a meeting where uh, transportation and homeless and, you know, everyone who needs to be there will be there so that we can talk about strategies uh, for that particular encampment. Um, we can set aside shelter beds, but they're all full, as you know, and we haven't yet started any of the safe state community, so we don't have the desirable places for people to go yet. So when we clear a camp because of safety issues, fire issues, it does not surprise me that after a number of days uh, they come back unless we do something specific to ensure that they can't. Um, and we are having those conversations about all of the camps uh, that you raise. So we're working really hard to get these safe stay sites up. Um, but I have to be clear, there are thousands of people in encampments out there, and we are you know, working on hundreds of spaces, and we will continue to work on hundreds of spaces. Um, there's a lot of people out there. May I respond? Sure. And I don't disagree with that, um, Anne, but not every encampment is the same. I think what you're hearing is that there are certain particular encampments where there's a high risk, high probability, uh, personal safety is being compromised. And it's the personal safety of the people that are camping. And I'll give you a, a, a very specific example of the, the, the reason why at least the first district's not feeling like we're being heard by DOT is, you know, we've been putting out all kinds of uh, suggestions put some K-Rail, put some you know, boulders, do something that's in your wheelhouse to assist you know, Siobhan's team. Um, I understand, I get it. These folks in DOT, they're, they're engineers, they're planners, they didn't sign up to be social workers. I understand that. Um, and they looked at this very much through an, an engineering lens. And um, I, I understand that that's what they do. But um, I guess what I'm saying is, we keep on putting out alternatives for them to act on, um, and we're not getting even great responses as to why they don't want to or don't think it's a good idea, or and with no alternatives. And so, when, and to Don's point about fire, you know that's just one kind of risk. But as the roads get wet during winter, as they do, I could very easily see at that uh, stretch of roadway. You know, a tragedy uh, in the works where someone skids off the road and there's no barrier between uh, travel lanes and people habitating where they shouldn't be. Um, and, you know, maybe, you know, I'll say it out loud, maybe it takes a tragedy. I hope it doesn't. But not every encampment is the same. And the Elder Creek Watt one, I think, is very distinctive, much like uh, Alta Arden, uh, because of that proximity of where people are living close to a very high velocity travel lane. Um, so again, hopeful that, that DOT would, would kind of uh, rethink their engagement with all five of us when it comes to those types of particular situations. You know, I, I would just note that the, the one along the Folsom corridor and the Mayhew 
uh, north south is right proximate to light rail and to heavy rail, which are both in use and uh, used you know, throughout the course of most of any given day and uh, proximity to tracks and how they get, have to get to or how they do get to uh, either stores or out to the street or whatever. I mean, they, they're, they're, you know, clearly they cross the, they cross the tracks. And so um, at any rate, I, I know, again, people are working on this, but uh, again, the five of us are the ones that, you know, feel the front and center and, uh, you know, and certainly are responsible for making decisions that we make here each and every day that we're in session. And I just, I think it's important for us to convey some of the, you know, certainly the appreciation, but also the frustrations, because that's what's coming, we're channeling some of that uh, from our constituencies and, you know, and not without obviously knowledge of what you just said, Ann, of the complexity and certainly some of the, you know, impediments, but there are also routes that, you know, can be taken, and I think we need to use the tools that are available to us in a way that's humane and compassionate, but also practical about, you know, because again, I don't know how much money we spent with the cleanup along South Watt, but I, I can't imagine that was cheap to do that, just in the, in, in the cost, let alone obviously displacement. But folks were displaced sometimes for only hours before they returned, and and uh, I think to what you know others have said. So I don't want to belabor it, but I think it you know it requires some focus and attention. And I'm glad you're going to meet on the one particular location, but there are ones I think that you know to Phil's bottom line point. Not, not everyone is the same uh, and some of these well, are going to yes and I yeah, understand yeah, completely yeah. and we have we're working on some things on citrus road right now and we'll certainly look at the calvine the, area yes, yeah, east, east yeah. Stockton yeah otherwise once that gets grown in there it's tough because then those folks are in off of the roadway in areas that are difficult to access and certainly during inclement weather are very difficult to access so. okay any other I that's that is it. Then we won't uh, return in session until uh, I just announced the board retreat out at. Uh, maybe we could just give the specifics around that because that's next time we come. We'll be November 3rd. November 3rd at the uh, Sacramento County Office of Education out at Mather. Okay, we'll convene there. Public is welcome to join us. Yes. And, and, uh, and then we'll have a tour of the community campus uh, after the uh, uh, retreat. So we invite folks. And then our next meeting here is November 8th, correct? Okay. All right. With that, uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the meet the meeting November 1st, uh, County Council, it's the three of us that we publicly noticed. Correct. So certainly District District 5 or District 2 are welcome to attend as well. I mean, I just That's want to right. make that very clear in yes. case, in case you're so inclined. <laughs> in case you have nothing in to do. In case you're so inclined. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Good. We know we're always welcome. Thank you. Very good. Okay. With that, if nothing further coming before this board, uh, thank you for the invitation, Mr. Desmond, and uh, we will stand in adjournment. Thank you.